Section One of the Sikh Religion, Volume Five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Sikh Religion, Volume Five, by Max Arthur McAuliffe. Life of Guru Gobind Singh, the tenth and last Guru, Chapter One. An account of the early years of Guru Gobind Ra has already been given in the life of Guru Teg Bahadur. Guru Gobind Ra, after his father's death, continued with even more diligence than before to prepare himself for his great mission. He procured a supply of sharp pointed arrows from Lahore and practiced archery with great industry. The Guru's principal companions and bodyguard at this time were his aunt viro's five sons sango shah jit mal gopal chand gangaram mahri chand his uncle suraj mal's two grandsons gulab ra and sham das kripal his maternal uncle by dayaram the friend of his youth and by nan chand an upright and favourite masand the descendants of the gurus the masands and the sons and grandsons of those who had served guru gobind ra's father and grandfather gathered round his standard he also entertained a number of singers who sang the guru's hymns and a number of bards who composed and sang in succession quatrains in praise of the gurus so great was the enthusiasm that the women of the city used to climb the top stories of the houses and chant the guru's praises in extempore verses a man called bikaya residing in lahore went to visit the guru bikaya seeing him handsome and well proportioned thought he would be a suitable match for his daughter jito the guru's mother was pleased at bakaya's proposal and asked her brother kripal to advise the guru to accept it the guru did so and there were great rejoicings at anandpur on the occasion of the betrothal great too were the rejoicings of bakaya's domestic circle when he returned home with the good news the twenty third of har sambat seventeen thirty four a d sixteen seventy seven was fixed for the marriage and bakaya returned to anandpur to inform the guru of the glad day and invite him to proceed with his marriage procession to lahore the guru contrary to the custom on such occasions refused to go to lahore and said he would make a lahore near anandpur for the occasion he sent written orders in every direction for assistance and his wishes were amply gratified the sikhs thronged from the punjab capital on the occasion and with them came bakaya and his family shopkeepers and merchants opened shops and warehouses and abode in anandpur until the completion of the nuptial ceremonies after the marriage bakaya remained some time with the guru and performed all possible service for him the guru according to the custom of his predecessors used to rise in the end of the night and perform his devotions he particularly delighted to listen to the asa kai war after daybreak he gave his sikhs divine instruction and then practised martial exercises in the afternoon he received his sikhs went shooting or raced horses and ended the evening by performing the divine service of the rahiras once in the hot season when bathing with his cousins and other youths of the same age in the satluj the guru divided the party into two opposing factions to play a game of splash-water the guru being endowed with superior strength reduced his cousin gulab ra to such straits that he with difficulty emerged from the water in his confusion he began to put on the guru's turban believing it was his own by sango ran to restrain him for it would be a sacrilege for any one to put on the guru's turban gulab ra accordingly laid it down in consternation the guru saw the occurrence and begged gulab ra to bind the turban on his head and it would some day obtain him honour 
when in after days the guru had to leave anandpur for the dakhan gulab ra obtained possession of the city and established himself as sikh priest there thus fulfilling the guru's prophecy the guru delighted to wear uniform and arms and practice and induce others to practice archery and musket shooting his handsome exterior was much admired both by men and women one day as he was seated in darbar some new converts to the sikh faith came to do him homage among them was a sikh who had a daughter called sundari of marriageable age he proposed to the guru to wed her and make her the slave of his feet the guru did not desire the alliance but it was pressed on him by his mother and not long afterwards the guru's nuptials were solemnized we have already seen that raja ram of assam implored guru teg bahadur's intercession for a son and a prince called ratan ra was duly born to him raja ram died when his son was only seven years old when ratan ra attained the age of twelve he felt an inclination to see the son of the guru by whose mediation he had been born he accordingly with his mother and several of his ministers proceeded to anandpur he took with him as an offering five horses with golden trappings a very small but sagacious elephant a weapon out of which five sorts of arms could be made first a pistol then by pressing a spring a sword then a lance then a dagger and finally a club a throne from which by pressing a spring puppets emerged and played chopar a drinking cup of great value and several costly and beautiful jewels and raiment the raja was received in great state he offered his presents prayed the guru to grant him the sikh faith and sincerity so that his love might be ever centred in the guru's feet the guru granted all his desires the raja exhibited the excellence and advantages of all his presents he showed how five weapons could be made out of one he unloosened the puppets from the throne and set them playing chopar he caused the elephant to wipe the guru's shoes and place them in order for him the guru at the raja's suggestion discharged an arrow the elephant went and fetched it the animal held the jug of water from which the guru's feet were washed and then wiped them with a towel at the word of command he took a chauri and waved it over the guru at night he took two lighted torches in his trunk and showed the guru and the raja their homeward ways in due time the raja bade farewell to the guru and on his departure requested him never to let the elephant out of his possession several men went to the guru for enlistment and his army rapidly increased he now set about the construction of a big drum without which he deemed his equipment would be incomplete the work was entrusted to nan chand when the masands found that it was nearly ready they said that when bim chand the king of the country heard it he would be wroth and not suffer the guru and his sikhs to abide in the locality afraid however to make a representation to the guru himself they went to his mother gujari and expressed their sentiments the guru's expenditure on works of charity and philanthropy is already great and now he is increasing his army and building a large drum when the hill chiefs hear it beaten they will regard it as a symbol of conquest and engage in battle with the sikhs he is daily adding to the number of his soldiers be pleased o lady to restrain him this speech convinced the guru's mother she sent for her brother kripal and begged him to dissuade her son from completing the drum kripal said he could not take it on himself to make any such representation to the guru she must do so herself she accordingly spoke to her son next morning in the terms used by the masands to her she added our business is with religion for which humility is required even if thou complete the drum beat it not in public the guru replied mother dear how long shall i remain in concealment i am not going to take forcible possession of the hill rajas territories if they are jealous for nothing and allow their hearts to rankle i cannot help it 
this is the guru's castle where men shall obtain their deserts on this the guru rose and went to inquire if the drum were ready if not its completion must be expedited the masands then made a direct representation great king first consider the resources of the enemy they are kings and possess armies wealth and munitions of war it is therefore not advisable to contend with them what a number of troubles befell thy grandfather in his military career wherefore thou hast need of peace our guru's business is with the sikhism of his country war is the role of kings the guru replied how shall i conceal myself from those hill men i have received the immortal god's order to disclose myself and you tell me to remain in concealment i must obey god's order not yours i have prepared the drum because my army would have no prestige without it even if bim chand raja of kalur and the other hill rajas grow angry are we who sit here women we too shall meet sword with sword if they keep the peace so shall we we shall soon see what the hillmen intend when we go hunting we shall take the drum with us and beat it aloud on arriving at the base of the mountain the guru celebrated with prayers and the distribution of sacred food the completion of the big drum which he called ranjit or victorious on the battlefield when it was beaten the men and women of the city went forth to behold it and there was great rejoicing the guru and his men in full panoply went hunting the same day when the party arrived near bilaspur the capital of kalur the guru's drummer beat the drum with much energy and ostentation it sounded like thunder to the hillmen who at once apprehended that some potentate had come to take possession of their country raja bin chan consulted his prime minister who said it is guru gobind ra the tenth guru in succession to guru nanak who hath arrived his father purchased some land at the base of the tongue mountain and built a village thereon thousands of worshippers come to him from great distances it is only recently that the raja of assam came to visit him and presented him large offerings he hath constructed a drum and come shooting here my advice is to keep on good terms with him in the first place he is worthy of worship secondly he maintaineth a large army and is greatly feared thirdly he is very brave and such men are sometimes useful as allies on hearing this raja bin chand determined to go to meet the guru and dispatched his prime minister to arrange for the interview the minister informed the guru that his master who was the head of all the hill chiefs desired to meet him and it would be well for the guru to be on good terms with him by kripal the guru's uncle at a nod from the guru replied this is the guru's castle as any one treateth him so shall he be treated if any one come here with good intentions he shall be well received but if he come as an enemy he shall be treated accordingly for men to be on good terms with one another is very expedient and commendable wherefore go and bring your raja we shall receive him with great respect the minister taking with him a robe of honour the guru's gift returned to his master and recommended him to proceed immediately to the interview the raja accordingly went with his courtiers and escort to anandpur raja bim chand was received in darbar with great honour by the guru who invited him to tell him the whole circumstances of the hill chiefs bim chand gave him the desired information and then prayed the guru to let him see the presents from the king of assam the guru at that interview showed him all the presents except the elephant next morning the guru had a costly tent erected which had been sent him from kabul by an enthusiastic sikh named duni chand and prepared to receive bim chand in it at the second interview with the guru were his relations courtiers and principal wrestlers and warriors when bim chand saw the kabuli tent he was astonished at its magnificence in reply to his inquiry he was told that it had cost two and a half lakhs of rupees and that it was the offering of a pious sikh
during this conversation the elephant beautifully decorated was led forward bim chand expressed his unbounded admiration of all that he had seen and heard on his homeward journey his mind burned with envy of the guru's state and wealth and he considered how he could take possession of all his valuables on reflection however he came to the conclusion that he would be satisfied with the elephant and he determined to have the animal whether by force or stratagem on his arrival in his capital he unfolded his design to his courtiers and asked them to suggest how possession of the elephant could be obtained after some discussion it was agreed that a message should be sent to the guru to the effect that an embassy was coming from srinagar in the present british garwal district with the object of betrothing the daughter of its raja fatah shah to bim chand's son and bim chand desired to borrow the elephant so as to make a display of wealth to his guests it was accordingly decided that the guru should be requested to lend the elephant for the purpose when the guru received this message he knew that it was simply a trick to obtain per permanent possession of the animal he thought to himself if i refuse the elephant it means war and if i send him it also means war as i must resort to force for his recovery he accordingly replied to bim chand's message the raja who presented me with the elephant requested me not to let the animal go out of my possession and it is a principle of the guru's house to comply with such requests i have another elephant and should raja bim chand require him he may take him the messenger seeing that there was no chance of obtaining the desired elephant hastened to return to bilispur the guru's message was delivered with the addition that he did not seem afraid of any of the hill chiefs raja bin chand much incensed consulted his prime minister who advised him not to provoke a quarrel with the guru bim chand angrily retorted and charged his minister with age and cowardice the guru had shown contempt for him and was he to calmly endure it upon this the minister advised his master to become a sikh receive initiation from the guru and all would be well bim chand replied i am an idolater i daily perform the tarpan and repeat the sandhya and the gayatri how can i forsake my religion and become a sikh of the guru in the first place i cannot as a hindu be on good terms with a man who hath discarded our holy faith secondly none of the hill rajas hath become a sikh and they would all laugh at me were i to change my religion they would say that i did it with the mercenary object of obtaining the elephant in the third place no men of high caste have joined the guru his followers are carriers barbers fishermen washermen sweepers and similar nondescript persons i am a great king of distinguished rajput ancestors how can i become the guru's follower and stand before him with clasped hands in supplication if he give me not the elephant by peaceable means i will take the animal by force the guru is already on bad terms with the emperor and if he fall out with me also he cannot abide here he is still a mere boy arms are new to his hands when i show him what i can do he will know who i am and renounce his pride saying this bim chand ordered his chief police officer to go to the guru and try to obtain the elephant by soft and persuasive words if these failed the guru was to be threatened with the strength of bim chand's army the police officer went on his mission and addressed the guru as directed the guru calmly replied thou givest one advice to me to lend the elephant and another to bim chand not to restore him upon this the police officer knew that the guru could divine the secrets of others and begged his forgiveness the guru then said tell the raja that if he have faith in the guru and if his intentions be honest the guru can grant him what he desireth but if he practise fraud and deceit the guru can protect his own interests 
the guru knoweth the secrets of men's hearts and thou canst not deceive him when thou talkest of the strength of the raja's army know that there is nothing wanting on the guru's side either the guru is already prepared for battle the sikhs are not women and they have had long practice in martial exercises the police officer departed and delivered this message to bim chand who decided that he would wait till the time had actually arrived for his son's marriage and then he would repeat his request for the elephant and add to it an application for the magnificent kabuli tent also End of section one section two of the sikh religion volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe life of guru gobind singh chapter two the guru continued to hunt and practice arms companies of sikhs used continually to visit him and make him offerings those who came for military service were received without reservation and taught the profession of arms in this way the guru soon collected a considerable army the masands continued their opposition and again went to complain to the guru's mother they represented to her the guru is very young and hath no worldly experience he hath stirred up strife between himself and the hill raja he hath no ally for the emperor beareth him no love he hath taken the unprecedented course of refusing on two occasions bim chand's request for the loan of the elephant these hill chiefs are not afraid to fight and die wherefore advise thy son that it is not politic to contend with them if war begin how shall sikhs come with their offerings and where shall we procure supplies for our public kitchen when the guru's mother remonstrated with him as thus advised he replied mother dear i have been sent by the immortal god he who worshippeth him shall be happy but he who acteth dishonestly and worshippeth stones shall receive well-merited retribution this is my commission from god if to-day i give raja bim chand the elephant i shall have to pay him tribute to-morrow he essayeth to terrify me but i only fear the immortal god and know none beside nan chand then joined in the conference lady hath a lion ever feared jackals hath any one ever seen the light of the firefly in bright sunshine what availeth a drop of water in comparison with the ocean the guru is a tiger brave and splendid as the sun shall he fear bim chand when the foolish hillmen who are like mosquitoes contend with the guru they shall become acquainted with our strength and suffer the mortification of a late repentance by kripal then interposed sister dear nan chand understandeth the guru's pleasure the guru ended the discussion by saying mother dear heed not the evil advice of the masands they have become cowards from surreptitiously eating the offerings of the sikhs the guru knowing nan chand to be brave and skilful in war made him his finance minister moreover nan chand's father had done service for guru teg bahadur and the family was known to be loyal to the gurus pay was due to the troops and tact and skilful management of them were necessary kripal accordingly highly approved of the guru's resolve and accepted nan chand as the guru's finance minister nan chand was invested with a robe of honour and appointed to his high position with all do formalities the guru and his troops continued to practise archery and devote themselves to the chase when the other hill rajas heard of this and of the guru's difference with bim chand they began to fan the flame of enmity thinking that they would be more secure themselves if the guru and bim chand exhausted their strength on contests with each other kripal the raja of kangra 
sent raja bim chand a message fear not i am with you the guru is raising an army thou oughtest consequently to be on thy guard against him there cannot be two kings in one state wherefore it is proper for thee to expel him with all expedition bim chand replied that peace was the best thing if it could be maintained otherwise he would welcome his friend's assistance and expel the guru raja kripal then with exquisite treachery sent the following message to the guru great king fortunate are we that thou hast come to dwell in this land i have heard that thou hast some disagreement with bim chand that fool knoweth not thy greatness assert thyself and bring him to reason by the sword i will be thine ally directly thine order reacheth me i shall be found fully prepared to this the guru merely replied this is guru nanak's house where men shall be treated as they deserve raja kripal's envoy took note of the guru's intelligence determination and material strength and on returning to his master informed him that the guru would certainly not yield to bim chand without a struggle the time for the marriage of fatah shah's daughter to bim chand's son was now approaching so bim chand decided to ask the guru again to lend him the elephant and other articles of display for the occasion he accordingly sent his brother-in-law kesari chand raja of jaswal and a brahman with orders to bring what he desired by all possible means they requested the guru to lend bim chand the throne the elephant the kabuli tent and the fivefold weapon the family priest promised that the loan should be returned with a present of four thousand rupees on this the guru said am i a shopkeeper that i should take hire for what i lend kesari chand remonstrated o guru thou livest by offerings thou art not a landowner thou hast no kingdom no fief from which thou mayest derive income and offerings of this description have doubtless often been made thee the guru on hearing this declined further parley and abruptly dismissed the envoys the masands again complained to the guru's mother the guru's action is impolitic bim chand's army will come and plunder anandpur the guru is still a boy and hath never seen real warfare though he ever babbleth of it at one time he saith we will destroy the oppressive turks again he saith i will give the whole country from lahore to peshawar as a kingdom to my sikhs advise thy son to cease uttering such irritating language his mother duly remonstrated with him my son why art thou stirring up strife send thy minister nan chand and thy uncle kripal to make peace otherwise an army of hillmen will attack us immediately whither shall we go if we are obliged to depart hence thy father purchased this land and came here to live in retirement and peace the guru replied the hillmen have now come to beg with the humility of goats but when they have received what they have asked for they will assume the bravery of tigers on this account why should we not take measures for our own safety mother dear if we now betray fear of them they will soon be ready to devour us they will only respect us when we show them the sword if thou show a stick to a barking dog he will fear to continue his barking we cannot remain subject to such people if they play the part of aggressors i will show them what the guru can do the immortal god hath sent me into the world to uproot evil and protect from tyranny the weak and oppressed on hearing this the guru's mother retired in sorrow to her apartment and the guru proceeded to don his arms and coat of mail when raja bim chand's envoys returned to their master they repeated the guru's message with marginal additions of their own bim chand became very angry and addressed the guru the following letter if thou desire to dwell in anandpur send the elephant quickly if thou agree not to this i will take an army plunder and assail thy disciples of both sexes expel them from the country and imprison thee to save thyself however from all these painful consequences thou mayest immediately depart from my state 
the guru on perusing this letter smiled and said to his friends i accept the alternative of war which he offereth me he sent bim chand a reply to this effect and ordered nan chand to make immediate preparation for defence when bim chand received the guru's letter he called his brother hill chiefs to a council of war and informed them of his negotiations with the guru he was himself he said for open hostilities raja kripal however counselled deliberation he urged thou hast now made all preparations for thy son's marriage and it is not time for war should any relation of thine be killed thy rejoicings will be changed unto mourning it is not well to die at a time of festivity or sing songs of joy at a funeral the other hill chiefs who were summoned to the council and also bim chand's prime minister were precisely of the same opinion the contemplated war was consequently adjourned raja kripal then suggested that when the bridegroom's party went to srinagar they should induce raja fatah shah to ally himself with them and take up arms against the guru meantime the guru himself was making all preparations to meet his opponents he caused it to be publicly known that he would be grateful to all who brought him arms and horses and his appeal met with a ready response raja madani parkash of nihan at this time sent an envoy to the guru with an invitation to pay him a visit he was sure the guru would be pleased to see the dun or valley par excellence which enjoyed a cool climate and afforded abundant sport ram ra the guru's relation dwelt there and found it a pleasant and agreeable residence the raja of nahan had heard that raja bim chand was at enmity with the guru but raja bim chand knew not the guru's greatness and would afterwards repent the raja of nahan also desired the guru's assistance which would be useful to him in time of need and accordingly warmly invited him to make a lengthened sojourn in his country the guru requested the envoy to wait a few days for an answer the masands were very pleased to hear of the raja of nahan's invitation and thought if the guru accepted it there would be an end of the quarrel between him and bim chand they induced the guru's mother to persuade him to visit the raja she told the guru that after some time spent in nahan he might return to anandpur after which she hoped there would be peace the guru accepted her advice and promised to start for nahan on the morrow by way of precaution he decided to take the whole of his trained army with him and ordered nanchan to make all necessary arrangements for the march on the morrow the guru caused his drum to be beaten as a signal for departure he set out accompanied by his minister nan chand his relations and five hundred udasi sikhs for the defence of anandpur he left suraj mal's two grandsons gulab ra and sham das with a suitable guard the guru's first march was to kiratpur where he visited the shrine of his grandfather guru har gobind after a few days further journey he encamped at the foot of the nahan mountain the raja duly went to greet and welcome his distinguished guest he took him to his palace begged him to enjoy himself with the chase and meanwhile design and superintend the building of a fort for the protection of the state on one of the raja's and the guru's hunting excursions the subject was again mooted the raja explained that raja fatah shah of srinagar the capital of garhwal had often quarrelled with him over the ground on which they were then standing he would therefore be very pleased when a fortress was constructed on the spot for protection against all enemies the guru erected a tent and in company with the raja held a darbar it was unanimously agreed that a fort was necessary for the protection of the country the raja accordingly requested the guru to allow his army to assist in its construction and he would send his own workmen and labourers for its speedy completion the guru caused sacred food to be prepared and praying to the creator distributed it he then laid the foundation stone of the fort 
such was the zeal and energy of the workmen that it was completed in twelve days the guru gave it the name of ponta he abode there and continued to increase his army and enlist all muhammadans as well as hindus who presented themselves for service all recruits as well as disciplined soldiers rendered willing aid in the construction of the building End of section two. Section three of Sikh Religion, Volume five, by Max Arthur McAuliffe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Life of Guru Gobind Singh, Chapter three ram rai of dera dun heard of the guru's visit and of the construction of payanta which was only about thirty miles distant from his residence he apprehended that the guru had come to punish him for his previous misdeeds and he communicated his suspicions to his masands gurdas who had accompanied ram rai to dili when sent there by guru har rai and who had remained with him ever since urged that guru gobind rai was not so vindictive and base as to take revenge if however he manifested any signs of aggression gurdas's brother tara who was a warrior and skilful archer would be able to oppose him and protect the city of dera dun ram rai replied that no one could contend with the guru in archery even bim chand hid himself in his castle through fear of the guru's arrows should the guru decide to take action against them whither should they go for refuge gurdas rejoined that if ram rai fled before there was even a semblance of an attack there would be several tales circulated to his discredit the guru subsequently hearing of his anxiety and wishing to remove it sent nan chand and daya ram to reassure him ram rai on receiving the guru's message was delighted invested the envoys with dresses of honour and decided to remain on friendly terms with the martial son of guru teg bahadur budu shah a Sayyid who lived in sandara went with his disciples to pay a visit to the guru and make him offerings budu shah represented himself as a great sinner said that he should certainly have to render an account of his transgression hereafter and why should he not be pardoned now by the guru's mediation the guru replied thou shalt not have to render an account hereafter guru nanak hath procured thy pardon budu shah remained for some time with the guru who conceived a great affection for him and vouchsafed him religious instruction suitable to his circumstances raja fatah shah of srinagar in consultation with his ministers arrived at the conclusion that it would be politic to be on good terms with the guru and accordingly decided to visit him since he had approached so near his territory when the guru was apprised of his intention he prepared a magnificent entertainment for his reception rich carpets were spread and minstrels engaged to contribute to the raja's amusement and enhance his enjoyment of the feast during the raja's visit the guru sent his uncle kripal to him to suggest that it would be well if he and the raja of nahan also were on good terms the raja at once replied that he would act in all such matters as the guru desired the guru then sent for the raja of nahan he came and promised to forget his former enmity to the raja of srinagar the guru brought the two rajas together in open court caused them to embrace and promise eternal friendship before the assembly was dissolved a hillman arrived with tidings of a fierce tiger which was destroying cattle in the neighbourhood the messenger pressed the guru to free the country from the pest the guru on the morrow took the two rajas together with nan chand and others to where the tiger was reported to have his lair the guru asked the hillman who had brought the intelligence to lead the way he guided the guru and his party into a very dense forest the tiger which had been resting awoke on hearing the tramp of the huntsman's feet and sat on his haunches looking at his pursuers with tranquil curiosity the guru forbade a bullet or arrow to be discharged and called on any one who deemed himself brave to engage the tiger with sword and shield 
no one came forward in response to the challenge raja fatah shah addressed the guru great king this tiger is very strong and hath been for a long time in this forest he hath destroyed several men and cattle if any one had been able to cope with him would he still be alive but as he is strong and thou too art mighty why not engage him thyself who but thee hath prowess to contend with sword and shield hearing this the guru alighted from his horse and drew himself together for the attack the raja of nahan interposed o true guru why confront such a tiger we will shoot him with our matchlocks the guru replied see how i will deal with this tiger i shall have no difficulty in killing him saying this he took sword and shield advanced and challenged the tiger the tiger rose with a roar and sprang at the guru the guru received him on his shield and striking him on the flank with his sword cut him in twain the rajas and the hunting party were naturally astonished and delighted at the guru's strength and bravery and the result of the encounter the guru took the opportunity to instruct his friends the tiger hath died like a hero and obtained deliverance it is cowards who suffer transmigration the brave enjoy celestial happiness if a man die in battle it should be with his face to the foe next morning the two rajas leaving the guru in paunta departed to their several capitals on budu shah's return to his home in sad ara five hundred pathans in uniform presented themselves before him one morning they stated that they had been soldiers of the emperor aurangzeb but for some trivial offence had been disbanded no one would now receive them through fear of the emperor it occurred to budu shah that the guru who had no fear of anybody would be likely to accept their services in his army he accordingly took them to the guru who was delighted to enlist them the guru fixed a salary of five rupees per day for each officer and one rupee a day for each trooper the officers names were hyat khan kala khan nayabat khan and bikan khan men of whom we shall hear much hereafter an envoy about this time arrived from ram rai when he was allowed to approach the guru on the morning after his arrival he saw the guru's troops some fencing some practising archery and others performing miscellaneous military exercises the envoy told the guru that ram rai desired to meet him but could not go to paunta and did not desire the guru to come to dara dun they could meet at some intermediate spot ram rai had then a large following and did not desire that his disciples should think he went as an inferior to the guru but at the same time he never hoped that the guru would proceed to visit him hence his unusual request the guru consented to meet him on the margin of the jamna on sunday the second day of the following month the interview accordingly took place when ram rai's companions saw him touch the guru's feet they said see ram rai does obeisance to his rival and they made many remarks derogatory to the rank arrogated to himself by their spiritual guide the guru and ram rai conversed on various matters particularly on the guru's relations with raja bim chand at the end of the colloquy ram rai said i am fortunate to have obtained a sight of thee i have now but a brief time to live my masands are very proud when i am gone protect my family and property thou art the son of our race and hast for many reasons assumed birth the holy guru nanak made the name of the one god the sole raft to ferry mortals over the world's ocean and by means of it men have obtained deliverance but when in time the wind of evil passions blew the raft striking on the rock of pride was foundered and many souls were lost my father guru har rai used to say that some one would be born from our family who would restore and refit the vessel for the safe conveyance of souls accordingly thou hast come into the world for this special purpose when the guru after hearing this looked round he saw all ram rai's men standing with their backs towards him and their master the guru then observed 
ram rai sikhs who turn their backs on us are fools they are not pleased with the sight even of their own guru so he will not render them assistance hereafter the guru by his occult power knew gurdas's boast that his brother tara would be a match for him and protect ram rai's city against any aggression he might meditate the guru accordingly said to gurdas tell thy brother to discharge an arrow in my presence thou saidst that thy brother could shoot like the guru and that no guru could be so powerful as he gurdas on thus being taken to task begged the guru's pardon and was duly forgiven the guru then returned to paunta where he abode for a time composing poetry in its pleasant environment and salubrious climate the offer of the suraj parkash gives the method of the guru's composition he used to rise early bathe walk along the bank of the river jamna sufficiently far to obtain complete privacy and ensure himself against interruption he would then sit down and compose poetry for three hours he first translated from sanskrit the history of krishan avatar the translation is generally in quatrains adorned with similes and metaphors the guru delighted to describe the sports of krishan the circular dances performed by him and the milkmaids and his special devotion to radhika his queen it was further to the south on the margin of the same river that krishan disported himself and performed those great feats which have secured him deification among the hindus the guru in his ras mandal or description of the circular dance of krishan made an acrostic out of the thirty-five letters of the garamukhi alphabet the letters do not begin but end the verses at intervals in his literary labour he used to watch the river rolling over its shingly bed and admire its sparkling foam and blue wavelets some time after the guru's visit ram rai fell into a trance and in that state was cremated by the masands in defiance of the prayers and entreaties of his wife punjab kaur the masands then proceeded to take possession of his property and of the offerings intended for him and each began to proclaim himself guru punjab kaur through the agency of gurdas who had remained faithful to her sent a letter to guru gobind rai to inform him of the circumstances and to pray for his advice and assistance she then invited all the masands to a feast on a certain day which she had fixed on for the appointment of a successor to her husband and promised to the deserving dresses of honour on the occasion when the masands arrived they each presented a claim to spiritual authority one man would say i want to be appointed guru of a certain country another would say i want to be appointed guru of another country when all the masands had arrived punjab kaur sent to inform the guru the guru at once ordered his troops to prepare for an expedition on the morrow he proceeded with them to dera leaving sufficient men to guard paunta when the masands saw the guru their faces grew pale and they asked one another why he had come the guru and ram rai they said were in opposition to each other but perhaps the guru had come to condole with the widow on her husband's death in any case the masands made certain that the guru would only stay for a day or two as punjab kaur would be unable to provide supplies for him and his army for any length of time next day punjab kaur requested the guru to punish the masands some of them suspected what was in store for them but fate was too powerful to allow of their absconding the guru recalled to memory all their crimes and misdemeanours they used to go to the houses of sikhs to take intoxicants and frequent the society of courtesans they used to boast that the guru was of their own making and if they did not serve him no one would even look at him they practised oppression in every form they embezzled offerings made to the guru and committed many other enormities the guru accordingly meted out condign punishment to the guilty among them and rewarded those who had remained faithful to punjab kaur he then returned to paunta end of section three
section four of the sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter four the guru set about extending panta and beautifying it with gardens and pleasure grounds one day as he was sitting in his garden he received an invitation from raja fatah shah of srinagar to his daughter's marriage with the son of raja bim chand of bilaspur the guru declined the invitation on the ground that bim chand was at enmity with him and a disturbance might result were the two to meet the guru however promised to send his finance minister with some troops to represent him he accordingly gave orders to diwan nan chand to hold himself in readiness and at the same time to provide a necklace of the value of one lakh and a quarter of rupees as a marriage present for raja fatah shah's daughter nan chand on his departure said to the guru i go in obedience to thine order but if raja bim chand force a quarrel on me it may be difficult for me to return the guru replied as the immortal god will take thee thither so will he restore thee to me have no anxiety on that account nan chand set out according to order with five hundred horse for srinagar the raja sent officers some distance to receive him and offered him suitable quarters within the city nan chand urged diplomatic reasons for not accepting the accommodation provided but his real object was to encamp outside the city so that he and his troops might be free to escape if treacherously attacked accordingly a spot on the road to panta was at his request assigned him for his camp raja bim chand raja kasari chand raja gopal raja hari chand and the rajas of kangra mandi and sukit proceeded in great state to srinagar on their way they halted on the margin of the jamna not far from panta there raja bin chand heard that the guru with his forces was encamped at the ferry of rajgat four miles distant and had made preparations to obstruct his progress bim chand accordingly considered what was to be done under the circumstances he knew the guru to be very brave and he also knew the enmity he bore him if raja bim chand went straight on he would have to contend with the guru's troops and if he went by a circuitous route to another ferry he could not arrive in time for the wedding in this difficulty raja bim chand consulted his brother rajas and recalled to their memory all the circumstances connected with his negotiations with the guru he had deferred making war on account of his son's approaching marriage but the very circumstance that he had apprehended now occurred for the guru was on the way to obstruct his progress and hinder his crossing the jamna at rajgat various counsels were given which were all rejected at last bim chand decided to send his prime minister to the guru to represent that his son's marriage was about to be celebrated and it was no time for a clash of arms which would turn joy into sorrow the prime minister received instructions to present all this in the form of a respectful request to the guru if it failed he was then to inform him of the names of the rajas who were with the marriage procession it was thus hoped that even if the guru rejected the respectful request he would hesitate to attack so many powerful chiefs when the hill raja's envoy reached the guru he said o oh, true guru raja bim chand with the hill raja's hath come with his son's marriage procession and they request thy permission to pass they ordered me to entreat thee with clasped hands to consider this as the marriage of thine own son the guru replied o oh, envoy there is no reliance to be placed on these false hill raja's while uttering sweet words they harbour enmity in their hearts therefore tell them from me that they may come this way if they are brave but if they are cowards they may take another route in which case i will not molest them 
raja bimchan threatened to come and attack me at anandpur i will myself proceed thither when i have vanquished him when the guru's determination was communicated to raja bimchand and the other hill chiefs there ensued a long discussion as to the best course of action it was at last decided that the bridegroom should be sent with a few high officials to request the guru to allow him safe conduct for the purpose of his marriage and that the rest of the marriage procession should go to srinagar by a circuitous route bim chand vowed that after the celebration of the marriage he would take revenge on the guru for his conduct and bring raja fatah shah to dislodge him from his position when raja bim chand's son with his escort reached the guru he said o true guru thy name is cherisher of those who seek thy protection and i do so now had my father thought that thou wert likely to molest me he would never have sent me hither as i am his son so i am now thine i am altogether at thy mercy the guru compassionated the youth and at once allowed him to proceed to srinagar for the due performance of his marriage rites when the bridegroom and his small party informed raja fatah shah of what had occurred he felt sore grieved at the impediment placed by the guru in the way of his daughter's marriage before the hill chiefs had yet arrived diwan nan chan desired to offer the guru's wedding present and then take his early departure raja fatah shah replied you may offer me the guru's present when all the rajas are assembled when raja bim chand and the other hill chiefs arrived nan chand was anxious to present the guru's wedding gift and leave srinagar as early as possible the herald in attendance proclaimed guru gobind ray who is seated on guru nanak's throne hath presented jewellery to the value of a lakh and a quarter of rupees as dowry to fatah shah's daughter raja bim chand on hearing this became enraged and said witness all ye people my kerm is friendly to the guru and taketh the marriage present from him though he is an enemy of mine i must therefore refuse to accept fatah shah's daughter for my son the raja of kangra said to the speaker it is not well to act in haste send thy minister to raja fatah shah and ask him if he will take the initiative in a war with the guru if so he is one of us and we will conclude the alliance with him if however he refuse to attack the guru then we will not accept his daughter on this raja kasari chand and raja bim chand's minister went to raja fatah shah told him all the circumstances and said that if he did not go to war with the guru he should be considered an enemy not only of raja bim chand but of all the hill chiefs raja fatah shah was much perplexed on receiving this message and saw that trouble awaited him on every side he replied it is a great sin to fight with a man who obviously manifesteth his friendship the guru is my greatest friend how shall i engage in a conflict with him without reason raja bim chand is at enmity with the guru without any just cause if one man make a request and another cannot comply what ground of enmity is that come with me and i will make peace between the guru and raja bim chand when raja bim chand was informed of this he caused the drum of departure to be beaten when his horses were saddled and all preparation made he sent his minister with an ultimatum to fatah shah raja bim chand now breaks off his son's marriage with thy daughter on this account thou shalt suffer much obloquy the guru is here to-day and gone to-morrow thou hast no kinship to break with him so why break with thine affianced relations fatah shah was weakly overcome by this representation and promised to act as raja bim chand desired raja bim chand who was already on horseback alighted on hearing fatah shah's change of determination and went to him fatah shah then renewed his promise to act according to bim chand's wishes and join him in making war on the guru 
meanwhile nand chand managed to secure his property including the guru's unaccepted wedding present and prepared for his homeward journey on hearing this raja bhim chand sent five hundred horse to intercept him and seize whatever he had in his possession raja bhim chand promised the leader of the detachment to send more troops to his assistance as soon as possible when nand chand's troops found their way obstructed they began to reflect that they were few while the hillmen were many and they meditated flight or coalition with the enemy on this a brave sikh spoke out what are you soldiers meditating on your departure for srinagar the true guru promised that as the immortal god would conduct you to your destination so would he restore you to your homes in safety put faith in the guru's words this short speech inspired the sikhs with courage and shouting sat sri akal sat sri akal true is the immortal god true is the immortal god prepared for the conflict nand chand also addressed cheering words to his men he assured them that the army in front of them was weak and his men might fearlessly advance they obeyed and when within gunshot discharged a volley at the hillmen which threw their ranks into disorder nand chand then shouted to the hill troops why waste your lives in vain the army which was to reinforce you hath not arrived fly on hearing this the hillmen dispersed in every direction their reinforcing army which was approaching heard the sound of the sikhs muskets and feared to advance moreover raja bhim chand's troops would never fight unless commanded by himself the result was that nand chand and his troops safely returned to paunta and offered their obeisance and congratulations to the guru nand chand gave him an account of what had occurred since his departure for srinagar and advised him to hold himself in readiness for the hill rajas with fatah shah would certainly repeat their aggression upon this the guru ordered ammunition to be served out to his army it now became a question whether the guru would wait for the enemy near paunta or advance to intercept their progress the guru's uncle said that the enemy would come by bangani between the jamna and the giri and it would be best to select bangani which was six miles distant for the field of battle the guru approved of this plan of operations during nand chand's stay in srinagar a merchant arrived there with one hundred horses which he had purchased in cashmere for the guru nand chand had a difficulty in saving them from bhim chand's rapacity and succeeded in taking them to paunta he now informed the guru that the horses were present and at his disposal the gift was a very opportune one and the guru expressed his highest satisfaction with the merchant he distributed the horses among selected sikhs there was nothing now heard but warlike preparations and conversations the sikhs who in the words of the sikh chronicler watched for the enemy as a tiger for his prey enjoyed in anticipation the approaching battle and vaunted that they would expel all the hill rajas and take possession of their territories raja bhim chand reproached his troops for failing to arrest the departure of nand chand's detachment and asked them if they had occupied their time in feasting on honey or doing their duty he said however that he would forget the past if they promised amendment in the future he then sent word to fatah shah to go and do battle with the guru according to his promise fatah shah in order to please him served out ammunition and beat the drum of war his soldiers buckled on their swords and slung their guns over their shoulders fatah shah propitiated the goddess of his state and putting himself at the head of his troops advanced to the combat as already stated the guru's army except the five hundred pathans 
recently taken into his service on the recommendation of budu shah exulted in the prospect of battle the pathans took counsel with one another and bakan khan one of their officers said the guru's main dependence is on us the rest of his army is a miscellaneous rabble who have never seen war and will run away when they hear the first shot fired then the brunt of the battle will fall on us and we shall be responsible for defeat why waste our lives in vain let us go to the guru and ask permission to return to our homes kala khan another of the pathan officers stoutly resisted the proposal you are untrue to your salt are you not ashamed to think of running away when your employer is involved in serious warfare nobody will trust you in the future and when you die you shall be condemned to the abode of sorrow of which our holy prophet tells you are a disgrace to the pathan race bikan khan rejoined o kala khan remain thou loyal to the guru if any of us have business at home why should he not go there why should he die an untimely death stay thou with the guru and earn such advancement as he may confer on thee on hearing this kala khan detached himself from the pathans and adhered to his allegiance to the guru nijabat khan and hayat khan sided with the majority under bakan khan and proceeded to the guru to ask on behalf of themselves and their followers leave to depart to their homes one man had a child born to him another was to be betrothed a third was to be married the mother of a fourth was dead etc etc and all would suffer irrevocable disgrace were they not to return to their homes at once they accordingly requested the guru to settle their accounts and pay the balance of their salaries due to them the guru replied this is not a time to ask for leave the enemy is upon us and yet you desire to forsake me if any one of you wish to marry let him first marry battle and then proceed to his home and celebrate marriage with his betrothed in that case i will largely reward you the pathans again represented it is incumbent on us to go to our homes in case of births deaths and marriages otherwise we could never show our faces again to our relations we must therefore depart to this the guru replied be loyal to your sovereign leave death and life in the hands of god desert not your posts abandon not your duty and you shall be happy in this world and the next if you die in battle you shall obtain glory to which not even monarchs can aspire shame not your sires and your race he who forsaketh his master in battle shall be dishonoured here and condemned hereafter the vultures knowing him to be disloyal will not touch but spurn his flesh he shall not go to heaven hereafter nor obtain glory here abundant disgrace shall light upon his head be assured of this that human birth shall be profitable to him who loseth his life with his face to the foe for all the drops of blood that fall from his body so many years shall he enjoy the company of his god the guru offered double pay which the pathans refused then triple then quadruple all the guru's overtures were rejected the pathans replied money is a thing to be distributed among relations but if relations fall out of what use is money kripal then addressed them o fools you are afraid to fight and are only inventing excuses having eaten the guru's salt you are untrue to it and are reflecting dishonour on the pathan race a curse on your pay and on yourselves kripal then quoted the text from bai gur das's wars against ingratitude finding all remonstrance useless kripal recommended the guru to dismiss the wretches from his service the guru again addressed the mutinous men you appear like tigers but you have only the spirit of jackals the pathans cast down their eyes and said in reply o great king say what thou pleasest we will serve thee no longer we are not thy prisoners why tauntest thou us the guru replied leave my presence the immortal god will assist me 
when the pathans having received their salary from the guru went to their tents to make preparations for their departure kala khan again advised them to serve the guru for one year more at the end of that time they should be wealthy men bhikan khan replied the guru is evidently afraid of the enemy if we want money let us go and fight on the side of the hillmen and obtain their permission to plunder the guru the hillmen have not the same information regarding his treasure as we have accordingly we shall be at the rear during the battle and at the front during the plunder we will then go straight to our homes taking with us all we can seize this advice of bakan khan was applauded by the pathans they accordingly sent five of their men to negotiate with raja fatah shah and tell him they would all serve him without pay if they were allowed to plunder the guru moreover their leaving the guru would ruin him as they were the only fighting men he had in fact on their departure there would be none to fight on his side and fatah shah would gain a bloodless victory fatah shah was highly pleased and at once gave the pathans written permission to appropriate the guru's property when the document was shown to the body of the pathans they set about saddling their horses to join fatah shah's standard kala khan again remonstrated and threatened the mutineers but in vain some further overtures of the guru were also rejected the upshot was that the guru's soldiers who were only waiting for his order expelled the mutinous pathans from his camp kala khan remained with the troop of one hundred men of whom he had been originally in command the guru lost no time in informing budu shah of the misconduct of the mutinous pathan soldiers whom he had introduced and recommended to him budu shah felt their behaviour a personal disgrace to himself he sought to remove it and also gain spiritual advantage by assisting the guru he accordingly placed himself his brother his four sons and seven hundred disciples at the guru's disposal end of section four section five of seek religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain the life of guru gobind singh chapter five when the pathans joined raja fatah shah he asked them what the guru whose pay they had been receiving and whose salt they had been eating must think of them after their desertion bhikan khan replied great king the guru is greatly afraid of thee he only declared war on thee through reliance on us he offered us shields full of rupees but we refused and came to thee he hath only eight men who know how to fight these are his five cousins his uncle kripal diwan nan chand and bai daya ram the others who are with him are the dregs of the populace and know not even how to handle a sword we pathans shall be too many for them so it will not be necessary for thy troops to engage at all the guru hath treasure exceeding that of an emperor on this fatah shah remarked that providence was kind to him in having already granted him victory he repeated his promise to the pathans that they might go and plunder the guru and if he himself possibly could he would generously reward them out of his own resources also the guru's scouts who had been sent to bangani reported that the enemy were marching to the attack he must therefore proceed at once to intercept them otherwise they would enter panta on the morrow the guru sent orders to a body of udasis to put on their turbans take their arms and prepare for defence the udasis too did not wish to lose their lives they said that there were other countries where they might beg for their living and that the guru's kitchen from which they used to eat was not the only one in the world which remained to them 
it was not for the purpose of fighting they had left their homes and become pilgrims they accordingly resolved to abscond during the night one by one so that their departure might be unobserved next morning the guru was informed that the udasis had all fled except their mahant kripal who remained in a state of abstraction the guru smiled and said the root at any rate is left and since there is the root the tree shall bear blossom and fruit if the mahant had gone the udasis would have been totally extirpated and excommunicated from sikhism the guru then ordered the mahant to be sent for and thus addressed him o mahant whither have thy udasis fled hearken to me thy disciples eat our sacred food but when they see a green field elsewhere they go to graze on it like cattle they have all absconded in the present hour of need the mahant calmly replied all disciples of the gurus are made by thee and thou thyself canst pardon them while the guru was conversing with the mahant two sikhs arrived to report that the army of the hillmen had arrived near bangani the guru gave orders to his five cousins to take troops and stop the entrance of the enemy into the town then making all arrangements for the defence of ponta during his absence he sent for his arms and armour and offered the following prayer to the almighty eternal god thou art our shield the dagger knife the sword we wield to us protector there is given the timeless deathless lord of heaven to us all steals unvanquished might to us all times resistless flight but chiefly thou protector brave all steel wilt thine own servants save then while repeating his orders he buckled on his sword slung his quiver over his shoulder took his bow in his hand mounted his steed and shouting sat shri a call in his loudest voice proceeded to confront his enemies it is recorded that the hoofs of the guru's horse in their quick movement raised clouds of dust which obscured the sun and that the cheers of his men resemble thunder in the stormy and rainy month of sawan when the guru arrived at bangani bhai daya ram pointed out the positions of the armies arrayed against him behold there is fatah shah's army and to the right of it are the faithless pathans who have deserted us behind them all stands fatah shah himself in the van is seen hari chand the raja of handur a brave and accomplished archer meanwhile a contingent was seen to approach discharging firearms and committing great havoc among the hillmen diwan nan chand was puzzled and applied to the guru for information a soldier arrived in breathless haste and said that budu shah had arrived to wipe out the guru's taunts for having introduced the pathans to him the guru was of course overjoyed to receive budu shah with his reinforcement and at once gave the order to charge sango shah one of the guru's cousins who discharged bullets like hail and committed fearful destruction among the enemy is specially mentioned on this occasion for his conspicuous gallantry raja fatah shah soon learnt that the pathans had misled him as to the character and strength of the guru's army raja hari chand then suggested that the pathans under bakan khan being in the guru's secret and aware of his plan of operations should be sent to the front this was accordingly done they charged the guru's army and used their muskets with great effect the guru sent nand chand and daya ram with their troops to check their onset nand chand and daya ram advanced with the rapidity of arrows shot from the guru's bowstring they and their men discharged missiles like winged serpents against the enemy the pathans too fought well the battle was hotly contested and many brave men were untimely slain on both sides the struggle was continued by both armies with the eagerness of wrestlers striving for victory sango shah continued his brave career and killed many of the enemy he was well supported by his brother 
mari chand who showered bullets with deadly precision on the pathans but was at last surrounded as his missiles were exhausted sango seeing his brother's perilous position put his horse at full speed to rescue him and so deftly applied his arrows that the pathans soon surrendered their expected prey and fled budu shah his relations and his disciples fought with great bravery and devotion and succeeded in slaying numbers of the enemy the ground resembled a red carpet his men shouted like thunder and drove the enemy before them as a hurricane drives chaff raja gopal of guler now arrived with his troops to reinforce fatah shah he called out to the fugitives why run away i have come to your assistance on this the hillmen took courage and renewed the combat they directed their attack principally against budu shah's troops seeing this budu shah's sons fought with the greatest bravery felled the enemy as a woodcutter fells forest trees and warded off all return strokes so that they piled up corpses on corpses raja gopal seeing the destruction of his allies addressed his men my brethren now is the time for action maintain the honour of the hill rajas the result of this brief exhortation was that the enemy surrounded budu shah's son in this critical position he fought with great desperation his bravery attracted the attention of the guru himself who sent his uncle kripal with troops to rescue him kripal's men showered arrows and bullets on the enemy and succeeded in extricating the youth he and kripal then joined in a terrific charge on the hillmen raja gopal seeing this discharged an arrow at budu shah's son which struck him on the chest and brought him to the ground this led to a close engagement of the combatants on both sides for the possession of the body every form of weapon was plied and the carnage became terrific such was the gallantry of kripal and the spirit he infused into his followers that the enemy fled leaving the corpse of budu shah's son to be borne away from the field by his father's disciples for honourable interment raja gopal on seeing the confusion produced in his ranks by the brave kripal directed his horse at full speed against him as gopal advanced he discharged an arrow at him which lodged in his horse's saddle on this kripal shouted o oh, gopal thou hast had the first shot it is for me to shoot now on hearing this gopal turned his horse round kripal at once discharged an arrow which penetrated his horse's temple and the animal fell heavily on the ground gopal unhorsed ran away with the rapidity of a thief who finds day dawning on him in the exercise of his calling and took refuge at the rear of his troops he there provided himself with another steed which he mounted for the battle the rajas of chandel and handur now appeared on the scene and desired to come to close quarters with the guru himself they and their troops were however kept at bay by the bravery of the guru's five cousins supported by the faithful sikhs raja fatah shah now called out to bikan khan and his pathans and asked them why they were concealing themselves and saving their skins like dastards bikan khan had represented that the guru's army was worthless so fatah shah now called on him to put that worthless army to flight he and his men might then return to their homes with such plunder as they could obtain from their victory bikan khan thus roused from his lethargy joined in the fight hayat khan too advanced and killed several of the guru's troopers kripal the mahant of the udasis now advanced on horseback and asked the guru's permission to engage hayat khan the guru replied o oh, holy saint thou canst kill him with thy words pray that i may be victorious kripal the guru's uncle overhearing this conversation and seeing that the mahant was filled with martial enthusiasm prayed the guru to let him engage hayat khan 
the guru inquired with what weapon the mahant was going to contend with his adversary the mahant replied with this club the guru smiled and said go and engage thine enemy it was a spectacle to see the mahant with his matted hair twisted round his head his body only clothed with a thin plaster of ashes and his belly projecting far in front of his saddle proceeding to engage a practised warrior armed with the latest weapons of destruction when the mahant approached and challenged hayat khan the latter saw that he had no warlike weapon and consequently retreated from him scorning to attack a defenceless man the onlookers were amused and said how can that faker contend with a pathan the mahant however continued to challenge hayat khan as when a snake is escaping into its hole it will come forth if its tail be trodden on and attack the aggressor so hayat khan who had been retiring before the mahant now advanced against him goaded by his taunts he aimed a blow of his sword at the mahant which the latter received on his club when lo hayat khan's sword fell to pieces the mahant then addressed him now hold thy ground and defend thyself from me the mahant rose on his stirrups and wielding his club with both hands struck hayat khan with such force on the head that his skull broke and his brains issued forth and stained the battlefield the mahant continued to display his skill and bravery to the pathans but was at last surrounded by them and placed in a very hazardous position when jit mal one of the guru's cousins saw this he rained such a shower of arrows on the pathans that they retreated and left the mahant unmolested he then made his way to the guru and received his approbation ram singh a mechanic from banaras had made a cannon for the guru from which balls were discharged with great effect during this battle people on seeing the impression made on the enemy concluded that the guru was destined to be victorious bakan khan and nijabat khan taunted their men with being unable to cope with a rabble of villagers who did not even know how to handle a martial weapon the result was that the pathans made another desperate effort to brighten their gloomy prospects and for a time caused the guru's army to waver one sahib chand a captain of a troop asked the guru's permission to oppose the onset of the enemy the guru ordered him to act on his own responsibility sahib chand and his men so deftly and rapidly plied their arrows that the pathans found it necessary to take shelter behind trees bakan khan seeing this addressed his men you are attaching a stigma to the pathan race the hillmen are laughing at you and saying that a faker having killed hyat khan hath put all the pathans to flight saying this bakan khan set an example of bravery to his soldiers and discharged showers of arrows at the guru's troops sahib chand on the guru's side continued to fight with great determination and caused great havoc among the enemy seeing this hari chand the raja of handur became enraged and strove with equal valour against him his archery was so unerring that the guru's army again wavered sahib chand then occupied himself in warding off hari chand's arrows and inspiriting his men they were not however to be encouraged but were on the point of retreat when the guru heard a great tumult near him he at once ordered nan chand and daya ram to stay the attack of the enemy these brave heroes discharged such showers of arrows as effectually checked the onward progress of the pathans nan chan taking his sword in his hand and putting his horse to full speed rode into the thick of his enemies and chopped off their heads like pumpkins severed from their stalks in his left hand he held a lance with which as occasion served he impaled his antagonists the pathans however retreated not but with their religious battle cry ya ali ya ali firmly held their ground and fell upon nan chand he by his bravery and skill in arms sent every one who approached him to the next world by the way of the sword
a pathan ran his horse forward and received nan chan's sword on his musket the sword fell to pieces and then nan chan drew forth his two-edged dagger daya ram went to his assistance at that critical moment and a hand-to-hand -a -hand engagement with the moslems ensued in which they were worsted and put to flight raja hari chand still held his ground and was challenged by daya ram hari chand avoided not the conflict but continued to discharge arrows and bullets and inflict great damage on the guru's army his horse was very swift and tractable and he could turn him rapidly round so as to save himself from a hostile attack while at the same time he could discharge fatal missiles at his opponents sayid budu shah was found to have lost during the last charge a second son in the battle there came a confectioner named lal chand to the spot on which the guru stood directing the battle he said i feel greatly tempted to join in the fray but i have never learned how to handle warlike weapons the guru replied if thou desire to fight take and mount a horse the confectioner did so then the guru gave him a sword and shield he inquired how they were to be held the guru told him to take the sword in his right hand and the shield in his left the guru's soldiers laughed at the confectioner's ignorance and said well done our guru and great king wants to kill hawks with sparrows the confectioner ran his horse into the pathan army bakan khan on seeing him said to his friend mir khan see here comes an aurora he hath been all day weighing flour and salt and now the guru hath given him a sword and shield take his arms and his horse and then slay him upon this mir khan pounced on him like a hawk on a sparrow when mir khan drew his sword the confectioner warded it off with his shield then meditating on the guru he aimed a return blow at mir khan which separated his head from his body the hillmen taunted the pathans with not being able to contend with petty hucksters and asked them if they were not ashamed of their cowardice provoked by these taunts nijabat khan and bakan khan urged their men to make a general charge and not die like jackals raja hari chand joined them in their onslaught the guru's brave sikhs however firmly held their ground in the action that ensued jit mal and hari chand engaged in single combat jit mal discharged an arrow at hari chand but the latter by an adroit movement of his horse escaped it jit mal became angry at having missed his mark and discharged another arrow at his opponent hari chand followed his example the arrows lodged in their horses foreheads and both horses fell the combatants thus unhorsed continued to fight until they were both wounded after a short breathing time both again put forward their strength when their swords simultaneously took effect hari chan fell fainting to the earth and jit mal dropped down dead with his face to the foe his comrades blessed the father who had begotten him and the mother who had borne him when the hillmen found that their bravest warrior had fallen into a swoon they assembled to consider what should be done on seeing the enemy huddled together the guru ordered ram singh to direct his cannon towards them ram singh obeyed with the result that several of the enemy were killed on this the rajas of dadwal and jaswal became enraged and actively joined in the battle fatah shah however saw that the day was lost and took to flight the raja of chandel was astonished at the conduct of fatah shah and continued to do valiant battle on behalf of the hill chiefs at the time when jit mal and hari chand were engaged in single combat sango shah the guru's cousin and nijabat khan the pathan leader were similarly employed and both fell by mutual slaughter the guru on seeing the courage and fate of the hero who had performed for him such gallant deeds changed his name from sango to shah sangram lord of battle the guru enraged at his loss mounted his charger and rode into the thick of the combat he so plied his arrows that sounds of woe arose on all sides from the pathan ranks the guru on seeing the renegade bakan khan discharged an arrow at him it missed him but killed his horse upon which he took to flight 
nand chand and daya ram now saw an opportunity in the demoralized state of the pathans to make a final desperate charge and complete their discomfiture the result was great slaughter of the treacherous mohammedans when the hillmen saw the total defeat of the pathans they too began to run away from the field of battle raja hari chand who swooned on being wounded by jitmal had by this time recovered and appeared on the scene with the heroic resolution to secure victory for his side he addressed his troops hillmen once so brave why die like cowards i have come to your assistance take courage saying this the rajah stayed the fleeing hosts meanwhile showers of arrows continued to speed from the guru's army rajah hari chand shot many brave men with his own arrows the guru on seeing this confronted him and afterwards thus described the combat that ensued hari chand in his rage drew forth his arrows he struck my steed with one and then discharged another at me but god preserved me and it only grazed my ear in its flight his third arrow penetrated the buckle of my waist-belt and reached my body but wounded me not it is only god who protected me knowing me his servant when i felt the touch of the arrow my anger was kindled i took up my bow and began to discharge arrows in abundance upon this my adversaries began to flee i took aim and killed the young chief hari chand when he perished my heroes trampled their enemies under foot the chief of korori was seized by death upon this the hillmen fled in consternation and i through the favour of the eternal god gained the victory having thus held the battlefield we raised aloud the song of triumph i showered wealth on my warriors and they all rejoiced raja fatah shah saw there was only safety in flight and hastened to retire to his capital praises of the guru's valour and skill in warfare were sung throughout the country end of section five section six of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain it's the life of guru gobind singh chapter six after the battle the guru went to where lay the bodies of sango shah jit mal and his other brave fallen sikhs he ordered the slain on both sides to be disposed of the bodies of the sikhs were cremated of the hindus thrown into the adjacent river and of the mussulmans buried with all solemnity bards assembled and chanted their praises sayyid budu shah presented himself and his two surviving sons to the guru the guru said i hail thee as a true priest of god thy human life is profitable unto thee deem not that thy sons are dead nay they shall live for ever only those die who despise god's name and turn cowards on the field of battle budu shah replied true king i mourn not for my sons who are slain because in the first place they have gone to enjoy seats in paradise and secondly because they have lost their lives in defence of thee such a boon is not obtained even by the greatest austerities the guru considered how he should requite budu shah for his supreme devotion to his cause he decided that as worldly possessions were fleeting the gift of god's name was the highest reward of all and so that inestimable boon he duly conferred on him but he made him other gifts also the guru at the time was combing his long hair and a servant stood by holding his turban when the guru had performed his toilet he laid his comb with loose hair in it upon the turban and presented them to budu shah to preserve in remembrance of him he also gave him a small knife which sikhs usually carry and finally a sum of five thousand rupees to distribute among his disciples the guru's turban his comb hair and knife are preserved as relics in the sikh state of nabha they were acquired from budu shah's descendants by raja barpur singh 
the guru remembered his cousins sango shah and jit mal and proclaimed them brave and puissant warriors who had taken their seats in heaven he bade their brothers not mourn for them the brothers replied for whom should we mourn sango shah and jit mal have fought and obtained the dignity of salvation war means either to kill or be killed and there is no need to mourn the consequences the guru rewarded all those who had risked their lives for him and contributed to his signal and decisive victory when the guru's fame extended after his recent success and prowess in arms he was visited by many accomplished persons poets singers and musicians flocked to his court and all who visited him he endeavoured to suitably reward now that the war was over the sikh soldiers formed various projects to occupy their time for the future they would go and seize raja fatah shah and make him bow at the guru's feet and they would conquer and obtain the freedom of the country between panta and anandpur so as to remove the obstacles interposed in marching hither and thither this last enterprise as being the one that affected them most closely they specially urged on the guru's consideration the guru remonstrated and restrained them he bade them bide their opportunity their empire should yet extend far and wide he knew however that his troops would not sit down idle flushed as they were with their recent victory accordingly he gave them an order to return to anandpur an order with which they were delighted they all set forth accordingly taking their wounded and their baggage the guru marched by way of sadhara and laharpur he encamped at the latter place and was there met by the envoy of the raja of nahan who desired to come to meet him the guru sent his army to anandpur and remained himself with only a few followers to meet the raja the guru was fain to divert himself with the chase after his recent warfare and ample opportunities were afforded him in that part of the country during his stay in laharpur budu shah often visited him and held religious conversations with him though the raja of nahan very much desired to entertain the guru yet he apprehended the wrath of the other hill chiefs if he were known to be still on amicable terms with the high priest of the sikhs who had inflicted on them such a signal defeat the raja used to send a messenger daily to say that he was coming but somehow he was accidentally prevented he would however come on the morrow the raja carried on this method of procrastination from day to day at last he asked the advice of his ministers whether it was proper for him to meet the guru or not they advised him that it was not seeing that the guru was at enmity with all the hill chiefs were he now to meet the guru the chiefs would resent it and probably make war on him on this the raja sent a messenger to say he was very busy and could not go himself to meet the guru but he would send his chief minister to do him the honours of the state the guru did not conceal his knowledge of the raja's motives and sent him a message that he would now continue his journey to anandpur and the raja need not give himself any further concern on the subject of an interview the guru stayed altogether thirteen days at laharpur the principal inhabitants were rangars thieves by instinct and profession who stole two of his camels when the rangars refused to give up the booty the guru sent for a fakir who lived near and told him to go under pretence of begging to the house of a certain rangar and see whether the camels were there the fakir went saw the camels and duly reported his discovery the guru sent for the rangar in possession and told him to act as an honest man and give up the camels otherwise he would oust him from house and home on this the rangar parted with the stolen property the guru called the rangar's village counterfeit and the fakir's village genuine and said the fakir's village should ever gain and the rangars ever lose 
the prophecy of the guru has been fulfilled a temple called toka was subsequently constructed in laharpur in honour of the guru's visit as the guru proceeded to anandpur he was met by the rani of raipur who waited for him on his route after making her obeisance she asked him to take rest at her capital the guru gladly accepted her invitation she showed him the greatest hospitality and sent her son to him with an offering of a bag of rupees at a subsequent interview she entreated the guru to pray that her son's line might permanently endure the guru said that her son ought to allow his hair to grow and perfect himself in the practice of arms the rani replied that the turks were in power and she was afraid to allow her son to dress differently from them the guru exhorted her not to be afraid the rule of the turks should only last for a brief period when my sect groweth more numerous and obtaineth possession of the empire of the turks it shall then adopt long hair as a distinction and when the line of the turks is extirpated thine shall remain in undiminished dignity it shall then unite with the khalsa and obtain all happiness upon this the guru took his sword and shield and presented them to the rani's son he said take them and treat them with respect so that when the time of trouble ariseth thy wishes may be fulfilled and thy life and property preserved the rani was delighted with the guru's presence and words and thus addressed him great king great are thy gifts who can deprive us of them it is thy unswerving duty to hold thyself bound by the bonds of love for the human race and thou art moreover merciful and compassionate the rani seeing that the guru had made the gift with his own sacred hands was filled with delight and taking the sword and shield put them respectfully on her head and then touched her son's head with them she bound a coverlet on a couch and placed the weapons reverently on it after this the guru continued his journey to anandpur on the way the guru halted at karatpur where gulab ray and sham das the grandsons of guru har gobind came to visit him he there visited the shrines of his ancestors when it became known that the guru was returning to anandpur the inhabitants of that city came forth to receive him and there were unusual rejoicings on his safe and glorious return not long afterwards complaints began to be made against the guru's troops to raja bim chand whenever the guru's men did not accompany him to the chase they used to go hunting in detached groups by themselves the guru at that time set about the construction of a fort and made a strong and lofty battlement around it raja bim chand was greatly irritated by the numerous complaints he continually received against the sikhs he took counsel with his minister what shall we do we are not strong enough to contend with the guru but how long are we to endure this annoyance the minister replied o raja i see no solution of the difficulty except reconciliation with the guru all the other principal state officers who were consulted gave similar replies bim chand then decided that he would send an envoy to ascertain if the guru had any intention of making an abiding peace with him the envoy who was selected from the most polished officials of the state duly delivered his master's message praying for peace and forgetfulness of the past the guru replied i have not fallen out with raja bim chand but he hath fallen out with me see what deceit he exercised in his efforts to obtain my elephant when his marriage procession went to srinagar he endeavoured to kill my minister and his troops it was only by god's special favour they escaped even then thy raja left nothing undone against us for he incited fatah shah who had been my friend to make war on us here again god protected us and we obtained the victory o envoy our army hath taken possession of no fort or village of yours my troopers are grievously in want of grass for their horses and goats flesh for themselves 
these can only be obtained from your villages if we do not obtain them on payment we must starve but we do not desire to accept anything else from you the envoy smiled and said consider Raja bim chand's country as thine own he is very anxious to meet thee and if thou permit me i will conduct him here the guru replied in guru nanak's house men meet their deserts if any one with lowly mind enter therein he shall be happy but if any one lifting his head too high enter it his life shall pay the forfeit then plainly tell thy raja that if he entertain friendly intent he may come to me and he shall be received with due consideration the raja was very pleased on receiving this message and at once made elaborate preparations for his visit to the guru when bim chand was introduced into the guru's presence he said o oh, true guru thy name is cherisher of those who seek thy protection i pray thee to pardon and forget any foolish words i might have uttered or any foolish acts i might have done the guru replied o oh, raja i have not been thine aggressor the aggression hath been all on thy side if thou act fairly towards the guru he will act fairly towards thee bim chand promised to act for the future according to the guru's wishes upon this the guru gave him a magnificent robe of honour and dismissed him highly delighted with the interview the guru's wife sundari now presented him with a son named ajit singh on the fourth day of the bright half of magh sambat seventeen forty three a d sixteen eighty seven end of chapter six section seven of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter seven during the absence of the emperor aurangzeb in the south of india whither he had gone to make war on tana shah king of golconda there arose great administrative irregularities at that time mian khan was viceroy of jammu he sent his commander-in-chief alif khan to levy tribute on kripal raja of kangra gasari chand raja of jaswal prithi chand raja of dadwal sukh dev raja of jasrat and others alif khan first addressed himself to raja kripal either pay me suitable tribute or contend with me in arms kripal made him certain presents and then told him that raja bim chand of bilaspur was the greatest of all the allied hill chiefs were he first to pay tribute all the rest would follow his example and then there would be no necessity for warfare if however bim chand were to refuse and elect the alternative of war kripal would still support alif khan raja dayal the chief of bijarwal probably persuaded by raja kripal also promised to meet alif khan's demands alif khan adopted raja kripal's suggestion and proceeded towards bilaspur raja bim chand's capital halting at nadan he sent an envoy to bim chand with the same demand as he had previously made kripal bim chand replied that he would rather defend himself than pay tribute having dispatched this message he called his principal officials to a council of war his prime minister thus advised him if thou desire victory it shall be assured on condition that thou obtain the guru's assistance this advice pleased bim chand and he accordingly sent the prime minister to the guru to request his active support the guru pondered on the proposal and accepted it for the following reasons the friendship between himself and raja bim chand was duly ratified and it would be a shame to him if by his refusal to render assistance his friend were defeated 
secondly bim chand's prime minister had put himself under the guru's protection as a suppliant and the guru felt that he could not refuse his prayer he accordingly sent raja bim chand the following message i shall be with thee early on the morrow pay no tribute to the turks if thou pay it to-day there will be another demand on thee to-morrow but if thou fight and cause the turks to retreat then shall no one molest thee raja bim chand on receiving this promise made certain of his victory raja kesari chand raja prithi chand and raja sukh dev took their forces to join his and all proceeded to nadan to give battle to alif khan raja kripal and raja dayal's troops these were encamped on an eminence and had therefore superiority of position bim chand ineffectually essayed to take them by surprise but the arrows and bullets which his troops discharged only struck rocks and trees and inflicted no loss on the enemy bim chand much disheartened invoked with all fervour hanuman the monkey god who had assisted ram chandar in his expedition against ceylon and called on his allies to join him in another charge this was met by raja kripal and raja dayal's forces who slew all the men that succeeded in scaling the eminence bim chand had now almost lost all hope when the minister reminded him that the guru's troops had not yet entered the field the guru receiving bim chand's summons mounted his steed and at once proceeded to his assistance bim chand after greeting the guru requested him who was senior as well by virtue of his spiritual rank as by the bravery of his troops to storm the enemy's position the guru and his troops discharged fatal arrows rushed the stockades and created dismay in the ranks of the enemy alif khan raja kripal and raja dayal now thought it time to leave their fastnesses and come forth to confront bim chand and the guru their main attack was directed against bim chand whom they caused to retreat prithi chand endeavoured to restrain bim chand's retreating forces and single-handed with drawn sword set himself to oppose alif khan and dayal's onset so completely did he succeed that alif khan and his allies troops turned to flee raja dayal was enraged at seeing his troops retreating and began to ply his arrows with such fatal effect on his opponents that bim chand's troops again wavered upon this bim chand again addressed himself to the guru o guru seest thou not that this brave man is destroying our army if i am defeated thou shalt have the odium thereof the guru at once turned his steed round and challenged raja dayal if thou mean to strike then deal the first blow say not hereafter that the guru hath struck thee unawares this enraged dayal who at once made a desperate effort to kill the guru the guru seeing this took steady aim with his musket and lodged a bullet in dayal's breast dayal fell like a tree blown down by the wind nuraja kripal saw his brave ally fallen he knew that his cause was lost he however put himself in the van and made a desperate effort to retrieve the disaster the guru now in full martial temper incessantly discharged arrows which took deadly effect on the enemy the survivors again fled to their fastnesses upon this alif khan and kripal held a council of war they both accepted the fact that they had been defeated owing to the assistance given bim chand by the guru and they resolved to escape at night in this they succeeded when the allied army next morning found the ground unoccupied they were profuse in their praises and acknowledgments to the guru the guru in order to take rest and enjoy retirement and contemplation remained for eight days after the battle on the pleasant and picturesque banks of the river bias 
raja kripal proposed a reconciliation with raja bimchand which after some negotiations was duly effected the guru on hearing this was greatly pleased he decided on a speedy return to anandpur and caused his drum to be beaten as the signal for his departure his party arrived at alsan on their way the inhabitants having heard of raja bim chand's secret ill-will to the guru refused to sell his troops supplies on this the guru owing to the necessity of travel was compelled to order that supplies be forcibly taken after payment at current rates when the guru approached anandpur he caused his drum to be beaten the inhabitants on hearing the once familiar sound joyously came forth to receive him the guru's wife jito presented him with a son on the seventh day of the month of chet sambat seventeen forty seven the boy was called zorawar singh or the powerful lion to commemorate the battle of nadan when it became known that the sikhs had taken supplies forcibly at alsun some of the hill chiefs feared that the guru would some day seize their territories also others were of a contrary opinion and remained steadfast in their friendship for him some of the inhabitants of anandpur who wavered in their loyalty left the city lest they might suffer in any attack made on it by the guru's enemies in this movement however they were far from successful branded with infamy they could obtain no place of rest elsewhere and were glad to return and sue for the guru's pardon one dilawar khan who had attained power in the punjab during the insurrections which arose while aurangzeb was employed in the dakhan became jealous of the guru's fame and success and sent his son with a force of one thousand men to exact tribute from him if he refused then anandpur was to be sacked when this was accomplished dilawar's son was to take tribute in a similar manner from all the hill rajas the son hastened to obey the paternal command when he reached the bank of the satluj one of the guru's scouts hastened to give information of the approach of a hostile force the guru was roused from his sleep at night to receive this intelligence and make hasty preparations for defence the guru immediately ordered the drum to be beaten as the signal for his troops to take arms his men fell into line almost immediately and marched to the satluj on their arrival they startled the enemy by peals of artillery and thus gave an exaggerated idea of their numbers dilawar khan's son seeing that his men were suffering from the cold and unable to hold their weapons yielded to the representations of his officers to beat a retreat on their return march they plundered the town of barwa after that they marched to balan where they halted for two days and lived on the plunder of the village they thence returned to dilawar khan the son through shame durst not reply to his father when he censured him for his cowardice and the failure of his expedition dilawar khan had a slave called Hussein, who boasted that if his master gave him an army he would plunder the guru's city anandpur exact tribute from raja bim chand and return home either with tribute or the heads of the recusant hill chiefs to effect these various objects dilawar khan gave him command of two thousand men with whom he promptly marched to anandpur the guru kept his troops in readiness to oppose the muhammadans meanwhile the latter were plundering the towns and villages through which they marched they also attacked and were victorious over the rajah of dadwal seeing this and also the strength of hussein's army the faithless raja bim chand broke his treaty with the guru and threw in his lot with his enemies bim chand following the example of raja kripal of kangra paid tribute to hussein and in company with other traitorous chiefs proceeded with him to sack and destroy anandpur 
on hearing this the guru's mother diwan nan chand the guru's three surviving cousins and the masands all waited on the guru his mother said the brave Hussein, with a large army will soon be upon us and thou hast not yet prepared for battle my son depute some masand to go and make peace with him the guru replied mother dear be not in haste i am only doing the work which the immortal god assigned me the same immortal god will not allow him whom thou counsellest me to fear to approach me he shall perish before he reacheth anandpur when Hussein was on his way to anandpur raja gopal of guler sent an envoy to say that he desired to meet him Hussein replied that he would be glad to see gopal if he gave him a subsidy as raja bim chand and kripal had done raja gopal went with raja ram singh to meet him gopal took some money with him and went and sat in council with bim chand and the other hill chiefs who were in Hussein's camp Hussein was not pleased with gopal's contribution and told him to go home and bring as much again gopal set out for the purpose on his homeward way he changed his mind and decided that it would be more profitable to fight with Hussein than give him more money he accordingly sent a messenger to inform him of his determination when Hussein received this message he changed his objective from anandpur to guler to do battle with gopal he vowed that he would first destroy gopal's city and then march on anandpur in pursuance of his vow Hussein proceeded to guler and invested it the citizens were soon reduced to great straits and the army asked permission to force their way out and contend with the mohammedans in the open field raja gopal replied have patience i will at once send an envoy to make peace with Hussein." Hussein's terms were the payment of ten thousand rupees otherwise he would put gopal and his troops to death and destroy their fortress gopal unable to accept the terms sent an envoy to the guru to pray him to negotiate the desired peace with Hussein. the guru accordingly sent his agent sangatia with an escort of seven troopers and orders to conclude such a peace between the combatants as would be advantageous to gopal sangatia first took counsel with bim chand and kripal bim chand said o sikh we have been waiting for thee we advise thee to send for raja gopal at once and effect a reconciliation between him and Hussein. in pursuance of this object sangatia who knew that bim chand and kripal were on Hussein's side took an oath from them that if he could succeed in bringing gopal to them for the purpose of arranging peace they would not molest him sangatia then went to gopal and stated all the circumstances he promised gopal that the guru would conduct him to bim chand and kripal who were with Hussein, and again take him back in safety to his fort sangatia added that if Hussein did not agree to peace but accepted the fate of battle gopal should by the guru's favour be victorious when gopal reached the allied chiefs bim chand told him that if he paid the tribute demanded all would be well gopal still refused to pay the money and said Hussein might do as he pleased upon this kripal plotted with bim chand to arrest him and make him over to Hussein gopal who heard their intention contrived to elude them and having retired to the protection of his army sent a message of defiance to his enemies on one side were ranged Hussein, raja bim chand of bilaspur and raja kripal of kangra on the other were raja gopal of guler and raja ram singh a powerful chief who was in alliance with him the fight began with indescribable vehemence the guru's envoy sangatia and his seven sikhs were slain Hussein, having fought with great bravery perished on the battlefield raja kripal of kangra was slain himat and kimat two of Hussein's officers were also slain on seeing this bim chand fled with his army gopal then went with large offerings to the guru and thanked him for his support and his prayers for the victory 
some masands escaped to the neighbouring hills and proclaimed themselves gurus in this they had a twofold object the emperor aurangzeb sent his son muazim afterwards known as bahadur shah into the punjab to collect tribute and the masands feared that they should have to part with their wealth both to the emperor and the guru it does not appear that the emperor's son remained long in the punjab or committed any depredations there he was succeeded by general mirza beg who peremptorily demanded tribute from the hill chiefs they represented that the masands who had settled in their territories were in possession of great wealth of which they had plundered the guru and his sikhs and which they might be called upon to disgorge mirza beg proceeded against them stripped them of all they possessed and subjected them to exquisite tortures any that escaped from him were afterwards punished by four other equally relentless officers who succeeded him a third son jujhar singh was now born to the guru on sunday the first day of the second half of the month of magh sambat seventeen fifty three a d sixteen ninety seven this was his wife jito's second son among those who went to the guru to congratulate him on the birth of his son were many bards sanyasis udasis and bairagis who had often listened to the guru's conversation at that time too came a bard called kuwar son of a famous poet called kisho das of bandel khand aurangzeb had tried to convert kuwar forcibly to islam upon which he fled for protection to the guru he presented a very humble metrical petition which the guru was pleased to accept the guru took him into his service on a liberal salary and in a similar way welcomed all bards who came to him for employment the practice of arms was never lost sight of at the guru's court even his eldest son ajit singh though now only ten years of age was duly instructed in the use of offensive and defensive weapons the guru used to take zorawar singh in his lap while he watched ajit singh fencing jujar singh too used to be brought by his nurse to witness the performance and imbibe from infancy a love for martial exercises the guru used often to inform his children of what the country had suffered from the turks so it behooved them to learn how to protect themselves and their sikhs jito in due time gave birth to a third son fatah singh who was born on wednesday the eleventh day of phagan sambat seventeen fifty five a d sixteen ninety nine this was the guru's fourth son in all End of chapter seven section eight of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain the life of guru gobind singh chapter eight one day the sikhs asked a pandit who used to read epic poems to the guru are the deeds attributed to bim arjan and others real or exaggerated the pandit thus addressed actuated by greed decided to mislead his questioners and replied bim arjan and the rest were really as powerful as they are described to have been this was result of their sacrifices and burnt offerings in honour of durga which made her visible to them the sikhs then prayed the pandit to show them how they could behold the goddess and vanquish their enemies the pandit on hearing this inwardly rejoiced that the sikhs had at last fallen into his power and what he deemed more important that he had found an opportunity of making a competence for himself he replied although no god or goddess becometh visible in this Kyle age yet such a manifestation may be possible by a due expenditure of money and by the performance of certain acts of devotion 
were the goddess durga to appear she would fulfil all your desires but a great feast must first be celebrated and a trial made as to who are the most holy brahmans so that they may perform sacrifice and burnt offerings with the object of ensuring the appearance of the goddess the sikhs informed the guru of this conversation he said to the pandit your statement that the goddess becometh not manifest in the kal age is not supported by proof if she appeared in the past ages why should she not also in this and if she appear not in this age then it is unlikely that she appeared in any former age at the same time i require not her blessings or curses i am son of the immortal who is the king of gods and men who controlleth millions of worlds who is omnipotent who cherisheth me and i have no need to adore gods or goddesses the pandit again represented that if the sikhs made durga manifest they should be successful in all their battles as durga herself had been in all her contests with the demons who had made war on the benign deities the guru being thus importuned determined to demonstrate the hypocrisy of the brahmans he invited them all to a great feast every form of viands including meat was provided for the guests when they were assembled he made it known that he would give five gold muhars to each brahmin who ate meat while to each of those who ate food cooked with clarified butter he would give five rupees to eat meat is really forbidden to all brahmins yet several of them did so induced by the promised reward according to one account fourteen and according to another twenty-one brahmins refused the meat offered them the guru went to the brahmans who had eaten it and rebuked them saying you are setting a bad example to your people you are not brahmans but ghouls it is to deceive men you wear the tilaks on your foreheads and pretend you are high priests of religion but in reality you are merely chandals the lowest class of pariahs the guru however gave them the promised reward on that occasion the guru quoted the following words of kabir kabir where there is divine knowledge there is virtue and where there is falsehood there is sin where there is covetousness there is death where there is forgiveness there is god himself the guru also quoted the following slok of guru amar das as far as possible rely not on the covetous at the last moment they will plant thee where nobody will lend thee a hand the brahmans who abstained from meat pressed the pandit's suggestion on the guru if thou by worship and austerities can behold durga who is the living burning light of this age she will grant thee any boon thou mayest desire the guru inquired can you render durga manifest what you propose is not according to my religion the brahmans replied that there was a brahmin called kesho at banaras who had power to render the goddess manifest but he would demand large remuneration the guru again asked how a man filled with greed such as they represented kesho to be could possess such spiritual power as to cause durga to appear the brahmans unable to answer this question took their departure the guru utilized the assemblage at the hindu festival of the holy to organize on the following day a mimic warfare which he called mahala for the exercise of his troops the object of the guru has in recent times been obtained by the camps of exercise yearly established by the indian government kesho who was exceedingly avaricious heard that the guru was very open-handed and accordingly went to him he said he was on his way to behold the goddess of jawalamukhi but had halted to see the guru whose greatness was universally recognized he told the guru that he had power to render the goddess manifest but the ceremonies and burnt offerings which would have to be performed as a preliminary would be very expensive 
kesho was supported by the other brahmans who again pressed the guru to have the necessary ceremonies and burnt offerings performed the guru in order to demonstrate kesho's insincerity outwardly accepted his offer the brahman on ascertaining the guru's wealth was highly pleased and promised all assistance he made out a list of materials for a ham or burnt offering which would cost a large sum of money the guru provided what was required and asked where the ham was to be performed the brahman replied that it must be performed in a lonely spot the guru pointed to the beautiful hill of naina devi as a place where all ceremonies could be performed privately and without interruption the brahman was much pleased praised the guru's judgment and liberality and said that the goddess would certainly appear at the place indicated the guru then ordered the ground to be cleared after which the brahman proceeded to perform the ceremonies necessary for the goddess's manifestation one day the guru went out shooting and killed several forest birds on his return kesho told him the goddess would never appear to any one who took life the guru replied that animals were continually sacrificed to the brahman's goddess at jawalamukhi he then ordered his servant to let go the birds when the strings with which they had been fastened to the guru's saddle were undone it is said the birds flew away kesho was astonished and expressed himself happy at having been brought in contact with such a holy man as the guru the guru had many strange presents made him one day a gardener presented himself he had come all the way from patna with a young mango tree as an offering the gardener narrated how he had planted a garden and vowed in the hope of success to give the first tree it produced to the guru he now brought the tree and asked the guru where he would have it planted the guru said he would shoot an arrow and where it fell the tree might be planted the guru's arrow fell far distant and there the young tree was duly planted after nine months worship and invocation of the goddess the pandit told the guru that she would soon appear there would be many indications of such a result a disastrous earthquake would occur there would be unusual lightnings and several other formidable portents would appear in the heavens the guru pressed the brahman to fix a date for the goddess's appearance the brahman fixed the first day of the naratar a festival in honour of durga held in the month of asu and chet for the phenomenon the first day of chet passed and she did not appear the brahman then said she would appear on the fifth of the naratar the fifth day passed and she did not appear the brahman then said that some holy person must be offered as a sacrifice to her and she would afterwards undoubtedly disclose herself the guru replied who so worthy to be offered as a sacrifice as thou thou sayest there are none so holy as brahmans the pandit on hearing this began to suspect that the guru meant to sacrifice him to the goddess and if this occurred what a sad recompense it would be for all his labours he then said if thou give me permission i will go and fetch a human sacrifice the guru replied no the sacrifice is here on this the pandit's courage oozed forth from the partitions of his brain he immediately left the guru's presence on the pretext of performing an office of nature and never paused in his flight until he had arrived at a safe retreat after kesho had thus absconded the guru ordered that the materials which had been collected for the ceremony should be thrown into the ham pit upon this a great flame shot up towards the heavens when this was seen from afar all the spectators felt certain that the guru himself had caused durga to appear the guru drew his sword and set out for anandpur when the people asked if the goddess had appeared to him he raised his sword aloft inasmuch as to say that by god's assistance his sword would perform the deeds which the brahmans attributed to durga the people then erroneously believed that the goddess had given him the sword 
the baisakhi festival was now approaching the guru gave a great feast to which he invited all who were assembled in anandpur but omitted the brahman kesho he however sent for him when all the guests had partaken of the feast kesho angrily refused the invitation and said he would not eat the leavings of a low caste rabble diwan nan chand on behalf of the guru recalled to kesho's memory the fact that he had like a coward deserted him fine service thou didst perform for him and thine anger and disappointment are the result kesho on further reflection went to the guru but at the same time refused to eat the remains of the feast the guru composed the following on this occasion whatever god wrote in thy destiny thou hast obtained o brahman banish thy regret it is not my fault that it escaped my memory think not of anger i shall send thee clothes and bedding to-day be thoroughly assured of this kesho replied all katris are made by the brahmans the guru look on my sikhs here with a glance of favour here the guru began to laud his sikhs and acknowledge the powerful assistance he had received from them my victories in battle have been through their favour through their favour i have already made gifts through their favour all my troubles have been removed through their favour again my house is replenished through their favours i have acquired knowledge through their kindness all my enemies have been killed through their favour i am exalted otherwise there are millions of ordinary men like myself to serve them pleaseth my heart no other service is dear to my soul to bestow gifts on them is well to make gifts to others is not profitable for my sikhs to bestow upon them will bear fruit in the next world and will bring honour even in this to bestow on others is altogether useless all the wealth of my house with my soul and body is for them the brahman became angry and his heart began to fry and burn like dry grass he wept at the custom which had been established for the future some writers are of opinion that the guru during the time the chroniclers state he was occupied in worshipping durga was in reality translating sanskrit works in the seclusion and tranquillity of the mountain glades these events occurred in sambat seventeen fifty five a d sixteen ninety eight and it was on the fourteenth day of june of that year the guru according to his own statement completed his translation of the ram avatar from sanskrit into hindi he adds that it was completed at the base of the lofty naina devi on the margin of the satluj waters End of chapter eight section nine of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter nine we have now arrived at a very critical stage of our biography of the guru and it is necessary to set forth with clearness and certainty what the guru really thought of idolatry or the worship of inanimate objects on this subject the best evidence obtainable is the guru's own acknowledged compositions in the akal ustat he writes as follows some worshipping stones put them on their heads some suspend lingams from their necks some see god in the south some bow their heads to the west some fools worship idols others busy themselves with worshipping the dead the whole world entangled in false ceremonies hath not found god's secret again in the same composition the guru addressing an idolater wrote as follows o great beast thou recognizest not him whose glory filleth the three worlds instead of the supreme god thou worshippest things the touch of which shall cause thee to lose heaven by way of doing good acts thou committest sin at which even the greatest sins are abashed fall at the feet of the supreme being o fool he is not in a stone 
in the vichitar natak are found the following among other similar verses i am not a worshipper of stones nor am i satisfied with any religious garb in the thirty-three sawayas the guru expresses himself as follows some fasten an idol firmly to their breasts some say that shiv is god some say that god is in the temple of the hindus others believe that he is in the mosque of the mussulmans some say that ram is god some say krishan some in their hearts accept the incarnations as god but i have forgotten all vain religion and know in my heart that the creator is the only god why worship a stone god is not in a stone worship him as god by the worship of whom all thy sins shall be erased and by taking whose name thou shalt be freed from all thy mental and bodily entanglements make the meditation of god ever thy rule of action no advantage can be obtained by the practice of false religion again the guru writes as follows in his celebrated letter to the emperor aurangzeb i am the destroyer of the turbulent hillmen since they are idolaters and i am a breaker of idols in further evidence of the guru's sentiments on the subject of idolatry we have a composition either written or sanctioned by himself which is found in his collected works on which to base our conclusion there was a king called samat san married to a lady called samarmati they had four sons and an only daughter called rankamb kala the children were put under the tuition of a brahman one day the princess went earlier than usual to the brahman's house and found him worshipping and prostrating himself before a salagram and a lingam she smiled on seeing her tutor thus engaged and asked him the reason of his extraordinary conduct the brahman this salagram o lady is a god whom great kings adore what dost thou who art ignorant know about it thou deemest this salagram which is god to be a stone the princess o great fool thou recognizest not him whose glory filleth the three worlds thou worshippest this stone at whose touch man's future bliss is forfeited thou committest sin to attain thine own object such sin as other sins would be aghast at o beast fall at the feet of the great god he is not a stone he liveth in the water in the dry land in all things and in all monarchs he is in the sun in the moon in the sky wherever thou lookest thou mayest fix thy gaze on him he is in fire in wind and beneath the earth in what place is he not he is contained in everything were all the continents to become paper and the seven seas ink were all the vegetables to be cut down and employed as pens were saraswati the goddess of eloquence to dictate and all beings to write for sixty ages they could not in any way describe god yet o fool thou supposest him to be a stone o man thou findest not god's secret thou deceivest the world in every way and fillest thy coffers with wealth as the reward of thy deception thou art thyself called by the world a clever and wise pundit but thou worshippest a stone and therefore thou appearest to me to have abdicated thy reason while uttering sheave sheave with thy mouth thy heart is filled with greed thou practisest excessive hypocrisy before the world and art not ashamed to beg from door to door thou remainest for nearly two hours holding thy nose as if thou wert practising jog thou standest on one leg invoking sheev if any one pass by and give thee one paisa thou pickest it up with thy teeth and forgettest thy gods thou givest instruction to others but meditatest not on god thyself 
thou ever preachest to people to despise money yet for that very money thou beggest at the doors of high and low and art not ashamed to debase thyself before even the meanest of thy fellow-creatures thou sayest that thou art holy but thou art very unholy thou callest thyself contented but thou art very discontented and only leavest one door to go and beg at another thou makest a clay idol of sheave and having worshipped it throwest it into the river when thou returnest home thou settest up another in its place thou fallest at its feet and rubbest thy forehead on the ground for an hour think what it hath to give thee thou worshippest the symbol of procreation and fallest before it believing it to be sheave thou callest a stone god but it will not avail thee since the stone belongeth to the lowest order of creation say what shall it give thee even if propitiated and pleased with thee even if it at any time make thee like itself thou shalt be no better than a stone great simpleton be assured that when thy life hath departed it will be too late for thee to know anything of god thou hast passed thy childhood without prayer but even in thy manhood thou hast not repeated god's name thou hast induced others to give charity but never lifted thy hand to assist another thou hast bent thy head to stones but never to god o oh, fool entangled in thy domestic affairs thy life thou hast passed in procrastination having read one or two purans o brahman thou art swollen with conceit thou hast not read the puran through which all the sins of this life may be erased it is for the sake of show thou practisest penance day and night thy mind is absorbed in lucre fools accept thy statements but not i why practisest thou so much hypocrisy for what object adorest thou a stone thou hast forfeited thy happiness here and hereafter thou givest false instruction and gladly acceptest all payment which thou claimest it is enough that thou hast given evil instruction to my brothers instruct not me the brahman hear me o princess thou hast not considered shiv's greatness ever worship the gods brahma vishnu and shiv thou knowest not their greatness and that is why thou talkest in that way know that they are the oldest of all the gods and do thou recognize them as the lords of the world i am o princess a fasting brahman and love all both high and low i communicate instruction to all and induce even great misers to practise charity the princess thou communicatest spells in order to make disciples thou then takest money as offerings from them in whatever way thou canst but thou teachest them not the truth and marrest their happiness in this world and the next here o brahman thou plunderest in whatever way thou canst those to whom thou givest thine initiatory spell the fools receive no divine knowledge from thee but are fleeced for their pains thou tellest them that thy spell shall be advantageous to them and that she will grant them a boon when the spells turn out unsuccessful thou pretendest that they have omitted some necessary ceremony and that is why they have not been successful thou next tellest them to give alms to brahmans and perform the spell by which they might behold the god thou takest a fine from them when they ought to take it from thee for misleading them and in return for their money thou givest them the same spell over again thou leadest them astray all along the line and at last thou tellest them that they have omitted certain words or that something interrupted the ceremonies to account for the non-appearance of the god and his failure to grant the desired blessing on this thou counsellest them to again give thee alms o oh, brahman that is the sort of spell thou teachest those whose houses thou designest to plunder and when thy victims become poor thou goest to spy out others were thine incantations and spells efficacious thou wouldst sit 
as a monarch at home and not go about begging the brahman filled with anger and heaping curses on the princess said how canst thou know mine affairs thou talkest as if thou hadst taken bound the princess hear o brahman it is thou who knowest not what thou sayest thou addressest me in an insolent manner my senses are not stolen away by bang whither have thine own senses gone without it thou callest thyself wise and that thou never takest bong even by mistake but when thou goest a-begging thou insultest as if under the influence of bong him whose house thou visitest why beg from door to door for the money thou pretendest to despise thou goest to rajas and takest morsels from them thou sayest thou hast abandoned all worldly things and preachest to everybody to do the same why stretchest thou forth thy hand to grasp what thou pretendest to renounce to one man thou preachest to renounce wealth to another thou sayest that he is under the influence of malignant stars and therefore he ought to pay thee for deliverance therefrom it is in the hope of cheating people thou wanderest from door to door thou recitest the vades the shastars and the symmetries so that a double paisa may fall to thee from some one thou praisest him who givest thee anything and revilest him who refuseth in this way thou hopest to obtain alms from all people but thou reflectest not that praise and blame are every one's lot while alive but affect not the dead thou canst not confer salvation on those who give thee alms nor canst thou kill the son or father of him who giveth thee none i only accept him as a brahman who deemeth the givers and the refusers praise and blame as the same o brahman the man from whom thou extortest money or whom thou pleasest with thy varied flatteries shall at last go to hell in thy company brahmans though they say they have abandoned the world are lovers of wealth and in quest of it go to die either in benares or kuman some through greed for money twist their matted hair round their heads others put on a wooden necklace and go forth shamelessly to the forest others again taking tweezers pluck out all the hair of their heads the brahmans practise hypocrisy in order to plunder the world and they thus lose their happiness both here and hereafter they make a clay lingam and worship it but it hath no power for good or evil why do men who know that the lingam hath no light in it light a lamp before it and why do very foolish and obstinate persons thinking it god fall down before it thoughtless one think of god and quickly cast away thy mind's indecision they who have studied for a long time in benares go at last to die in bhutan having acquired a little learning thou leavest thy home and wanderest from country to country thy father and mother thou hast left somewhere thy wife thy son and thy son's wife cannot find thee no one hath passed beyond the goal of covetousness it hath beguiled all people thou shavest the heads of some on others thou imposest fines and on others again thou puttest wooden necklaces to one thou teachest spoken to another written and to a third other forms of incantations yet thou conferrest no abiding spiritual knowledge some thou showest how to argue on learned subjects but to all thou settest an example of covetousness in thine efforts to obtain wealth to the best of thine ability thou showest no mercy and never propitiatest god o fool but worshippest clay it is on this account thou art doomed to wander begging think thoughtless one on him who made men conscious why deemest thou him unconscious why call a stone god why sellest thou thy precious soul under its value thou knowest nothing great simpleton and yet thou callest thyself a superior pandit diest thou not of shame o great boaster in thy pride thou forfeitest thine honour 
thou callest thyself a prophet and pretendest to know the future but yet thou knowest not even the past thou thinkest thyself very handsome and able and claimest to be continent and physically strong thou sayest that sheev is certainly in the stone but o oh, great fool thou knowest nothing o oh, clever man consider in what part of the stone parbati's lord is say what spiritual perfection thou attainest by bowing thy head to clay he whom the world cannot please will not be pleased by thy offerings of rice thou burnest incense blowest shells and rainest a shower of flowers thou growest weary in thine endeavours but findest not god in a stone to those who accept not thine incantations and spells thou recitest songs and verses in broad daylight thou stealest wealth from men's houses thieves pickpockets and robbers seeing thy cleverness are ashamed of their ignorance thou payest no heed to the magistrate or the judge thou livest by cheating thy disciples rich people are like flowers clever men like thee are the bumblebees which unmindful of their homes continue to buzz over them every one is at last in death's power and yet men have departed without resigning the craving for wealth there are no bounds to this desire it is the only thing in this world that surviveth you shave the heads of some you send others to places of pilgrimages and at the same time ask for all they possess those thou seest wealthy thou entanglest in the narrow door and leviest a tax at so much per head on them thou then lettest them pass it is thirst for money not love of god that actuateth brahmans the brahman here o my daughter thou understandest not thou thinkest that he whom we call shiv is a stone all people bow their heads to brahmans and apply to their foreheads the water in which they have washed their feet the whole world worshippeth them while thou o foolish girl slanderest them this salagram is the primal and ancient brahm and is prized even by monarchs the princess here o foolish brahman thou knowest nothing thou recognizest a stone as the primal light of the world thou thinkest it holdeth the supreme being thou hast taken leave of thy senses deceive me not but take what thou desirest to take tell me not that a stone is god while telling fools so thou plunderest them to thy heart's content thou sendest men to rivers of pilgrimage to drown them in superstition thou makest unnumbered efforts to strip them of their wealth and not allow them to take a paisa home thou pretendest to find a number of inauspicious circumstances connected with a rich man so that he may give thee feasts to bribe thee to intercede for him when thou knowest that a man has spent all his wealth thou never lookest at him brahmans hover over money like ravens and quarrel like kites over a fish or dogs over a bone in public thou expoundest the veds but in thy heart is worship of money thou findest not god thy money soon departeth and vain is all thy service thou paradest thy learning but knowest not how to unite men with god thou callest thyself wise and me a fool what if thou o idiot eat not bong even still thou art not in thy senses everybody can see this for himself brave men taking bong fight and draw elephants teeth and grasping the scimitar and lance fearlessly smite their enemies say o oh, tyrant what couldst thou do even wert thou to take bong thou wouldst even then if engaged in combat fall on thy face like a corpse through fright hear o brahman give instructions to fools save me from thy lies and preach thy falsehood to others why passest thou leather for metallic coin thou shalt go to terrible hell and be born again as a pariah hung up by the heels thou shalt be tortured in the house of death when thou and all thy relations are suffering what answer wilt thou make 
say what books wilt thou then read and wilt thou then worship the lingam wilt thou find shiv and krishan there where god will send thee bound where thou hast no son mother father or brother will ram come to thine assistance ever bow thy head to the great god whom the fourteen worlds fear whom all recognize as the creator and destroyer who hath no form or outline whose dwelling appearance and name are unknown by what name shall i speak of him since he cannot be spoken of he hath no father mother or brother no son or grandson unlike ram chandar or krishan he hath no male or female nurse he needeth no army to give him dignity what he saith is true and what he desireth he doeth some he regenerateth and others he consigneth to perdition he buildeth fashioneth createth and again destroyeth it is the great god i recognize as my guru i am his disciple and he is my priest i am a girl made by him o brahman i worship the great god a stone is not to my mind i call a stone a stone on this account people are displeased with me i call what is false false a matter which is disagreeable to all i tell the truth and pay no regard to any one as for thee o brahman art thou not ashamed of thy conduct fix thy thoughts even for a brief period on god the brahman god will consider him a sinner who saith that this stone is other than god and will cast into hell any one who useth profane language regarding it it is the primal and ancient god the princess i only worship the one great god i regard not shiv nor do i worship either brahma or vishnu i fear not your gods know that whoever invoketh them is already dead but death will not approach him who meditateth on the deathless one he who meditateth on the deathless one and even once invoketh his name shall obtain wealth and perfection in every act he who meditateth on the immortal god shall never suffer but enjoy great happiness in the world when death tortureth thee o brahman what book wilt thou then read will it be the bhagavad or the gita wilt thou hold on to ram or clutch at krishan for protection the gods whom thou deemest supreme have all been destroyed by death's mace none not even brahma vishnu or indar may escape it the gods were born as the demons were and both are subject to transmigration the hindus and the turks are the same and death is potent over them all sometimes the demons killed the gods and sometimes the gods the demons the being who destroyed both gods and demons is he who cherisheth me and whom i have taken as my guru i bow to him whose sovereignty is recognized in the fourteen worlds who destroyed indar vishnu the sun the moon kuvar varun and sheshnag the brahman shiv removeth all the sins of him who worshippeth this stone he who forsaketh this god and worshippeth another shall fall into hell he who giveth money to a brahman shall obtain tenfold in the next world he who giveth to other than a brahman shall derive no advantage therefrom the poet upon this the princess took the lingam in her hand struck the brahman with it and smashed all his teeth she then took away all the brahman's property the princess say now o brahman whither hath gone thy sheave he whom thou hast ever served hath broken thy teeth the idol which thou hast spent thy life in invoking hath at last entered thy mouth the poet all the property the princess took from the brahman she distributed among other brahmans and then said to her antagonist never mind thou shalt receive tenfold in the next world the princess thou sayest to others bestow your wealth or spend it thou who art so miserly that thou puttest not turmeric into the dal thou eatest thou art very deceitful and goest about for the purpose of deceit 
thou publicly plunderest people in the market-place thou spendest not a kauri and art ever begging calling girls thy daughters thou deflourest them thy mother was greed thy father avarice and thou art the incarnation of meanness while practising greed thou boastest of thy prodigality so that people may think thee a monarch thou art utterly worthless if any one knew the incantations thou pretendest to know he would not have to beg from door to door by repeating even once such an incantation as thou boastest of thou mightest fill thy house with wealth ram and krishan of whom thou speakest and those whom thou worshippest as shiv and brahma were all destroyed by death in due time god will again give them birth how many ram chandars and krishans how many brahmas shivs and vishnus the sun and moon what are these poor wretches simply water carriers at god's door they were created in due time and death shall destroy them all the vishnu who was cursed by jalandhar's wife and became a stone thou callest a great god art thou not ashamed of thyself the brahman i will go to the raja thy father and have thee imprisoned the princess i will tell him a different story and have both thy hands cut off then shall i be really the king's daughter the brahman i will promise to do what thou tellest me provided thou dismiss thy wrath the princess worship not stones fall at the feet of the great god the poet then the brahman fell at the feet of the great god and threw his idols into the river by nand lal who was a famous sikh of guru gobind rai and wrote several works in the persian language on the sikh religion thus delivered himself in his jabikas thousands of brahmas praise guru nanak for his glory exceedeth that of them all thousands of shivs and indars place themselves at his feet for his throne is more exalted than theirs thousands of vishnus many rams and krishans thousands of durgas and garaks sacrifice themselves at his feet by nand lal further on writes that as guru nanak so were all the gurus his successors including guru gobind rai it is therefore inferred that so far from guru gobind rai worshipping or doing homage to the goddess durga she was an insignificant entity who did homage to him End of section nine section ten of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter ten what is called the granth of the tenth guru is only partially his composition the greater portion of it was written by bards in his employ the two works entitled chandi charitar and the bhagauti ki war found in it are abridged translations by different hands of the durga sapt shati or seven hundred sloks on the subject of durga an episode in the markandaya Puran on the contests of the goddess durga with the demons who had made war on the gods chandi charitar one the poet in the guru's employ who translated this states that he did it for amusement but adds the man who heareth or readeth this for any object shall assuredly obtain it this line is an abstract of the eleventh and twelfth sloks of the ninety-second canto of the original the translator then darkly refers to a special object of his own i have translated the book called the durga sapt shadi the equal of which there is none o chandi grant the object with which the poet has translated the translator's object however is not stated whether he imbibed some of the principles of sikhism or not from the guru cannot be ascertained but it is clear that he was largely tinctured with hinduism chandi charitar too at the end of this translation is found the couplet 
the saints who continually meditate on thee o chandi shall at last obtain salvation and find god as their reward this is not in the original sanskrit but the general sense may be inferred by a believer in chandi from her own self-glorification in the ninety-second canto the first chandi charitar begins as follows ek oam kar shri waguru ji ki fata ath chandi charitar ukt bilas now the tale bilas of the deeds of chandi will be told ukt the second chandi charitar begins in the same way but without the words ukt bilas the bhagauti ki war begins as follows ek om kar sri waguru ji ki fata sri bhagauti ji sahai war sri bhagauti ji ki pat shahi das there is one god victory to the holy waguru we implore the favour of the holy bhagauti sword the pian of the holy bhagauti of the tenth guru it thus appears that the bhagauti ki war was written by the tenth guru himself the hindus maintain that in the tenth guru's writings the word bhagauti means durga in the two chandi charitars the word bhagauti does not occur at all and even in the bhagauti ki war it is only found three times once in the title of the composition a second time in the first line and a third time elsewhere in the latter instance lay bhagauti durg shah it is clear that the word bhagauti means a sword the goddess durga took up the sword this is also attested by gurdas in the sixth pauri of his twenty-fifth war he refers to the manner in which the signification of words is often altered and writes nam bhagauti lo garaya man hath fashioned what is called the sword bhagauti from iron in further proof that bhagauti does not mean durga in the sikh scriptures the following line in the ad granth is cited bhagauti mudra man mohaya maya the translation of which is men wear god's marks while their minds are fascinated with mammon the following are the first two paris of the war shri bhagauti ji ki having first remembered the sword meditate on guru nanak then on guru angad amar das and ram das may they assist me remember arjan har gobind and the holy hari rai meditate on the holy hari krishan a sight of whom dispelled all sorrows remember teg bahadur and the nine treasures shall come hastening to your homes ye holy gurus everywhere assist us god having first fashioned the sword created the whole world he created brahma vishnu and shiv and made them the sport of his omnipotence he made the seas and mountains of the earth and supported the firmament without pillars he made the demons and the demigods and excited dissension among them having created durga o god thou didst destroy the demons from thee alone ram received his power and slew rawan with his arrows from thee alone krishan received his power seized khans by the hair and dashed him on the ground very great munis and gods mortified their bodies for many ages but none of them found thy limit the last line of the bhagauti ki war is he who sang this was not born again that is he obtained deliverance this line gives the meaning of the twenty-second slok of the ninety-second canto of the markandaya puran the train of thought by which the guru made god and the sword one was as follows in the shastar namala is read i first mentioned the word shatru an enemy and then the word daman subduer know that the words compounded mean the lord of the world be assured of this the meaning is god subdues enemies so does the sword therefore the sword is god and god is the sword at that time it was the custom to recite on the eve of battle the praises and warlike deeds of the brave so that the hearts even of cowards might be inspired with eagerness for the fray 
on that account the tenth guru maintained fifty-two bards to translate the mahabharat the ramayan and the gallant achievements of ram krishan chandi and others it does not follow from this that the guru worshipped those whose acts were thus celebrated this was only done for the purpose of inciting to bravery dispelling cowardice and filling the hearts of his troops with valour to defend their faith this the guru himself declares in his translation of the tenth canto of the bhagavat in which are recounted the chivalrous exploits of krishan he says i have rendered in the vulgar dialect the tenth chapter of the bhagavat with no other object than to inspire ardour for religious warfare secondly the guru himself specially translated the praises of chandi so that they might be chanted for warlike purposes and that even cowards on hearing her story might obtain courage and the hearts of the brave beat with fourfold enthusiasm such being the achievements of a woman what ought not a brave man to accomplish the guru maintained that if a man became a coward and turned away from the battlefield he would not only become ashamed of himself but also forfeit his advantages here and hereafter in the third place the guru desired that his sikhs on becoming acquainted with the hindu sacred writings might be able to form their own estimate of them and their inferiority to the compositions of the gurus among the fifty-two bards employed by the guru there must have been several who had suffered for their religion under the persecutions of aurangzeb and for their opinions the guru cannot be held responsible End of section ten. Section 11 of Sikh Religion, Volume 5, by Max Arthur McAuliffe. Guru Gobind Singh, Chapter 11. The Guru directed all the Masans to appear with their Sikh constituents before him at Anandpur at the Basaki festival held about the middle of the month of April they collected large sums of money as a preparation for their journey half they kept for their own use and half they placed before the guru the guru then addressed them o oh, brother masands you have been the servants of the guru's house since the time of guru ram das you used formerly to collect large sums of money why have you brought so little this year for the support of the faith the masands replied o true guru the rich sikhs are all dead and we must take what we can obtain from the survivors the guru rejoined say not that my sikhs are poor i am going to make them all kings if you desire your welfare disgorge the offerings you have received from them the masands became angry and began to say among themselves the guru is of our own making did we not contribute the money necessary for his maintenance no one would call him a guru the masands left the guru's court and went to complain to bai chetu the eldest member of their body who had survived since the days of guru ram das they represented to him that no guru had previously found fault with them but now guru gobind rai had threatened them with serious consequences jetu promised to speak to the guru on their behalf but at the same time reminded them that he was at the youthful age when men utter praise and blame without due discrimination chetu kept his promise and spoke to the guru on behalf of the masands true king the masands are all thy servants i beg thee to treat them with respect so that the sikhs may follow thy example the next time they come they will bring a larger amount of money for the supply of thy public kitchen the guru replied ask their brother sikhs here what language the masands have been using regarding me they have stolen the guru's money and deposited it in their own homes they are very proud they admit not the guru's power they have called my sikhs poor whereas i am daily advancing them and bestowing on them the sovereignty of the country and finally the masands are telling me falsehoods chetu begged the guru to pardon them the guru then said that chetu had countenanced them in 
embezzling the offerings and that he too deserved punishment like his fellows at this chetu began to storm and pretend innocence the guru was now thoroughly satisfied that the masands had arrived at a pass where they did not believe in any guru and that their insolence must be checked he therefore decided that as the human guruship must end with himself so must his sikhs be freed from the tyranny of the masands chetu went to the guru's mother and threatened that if the guru disowned the masands the sikhs would go in a body to dhir mal and the guru would be left without any means of support when the guru heard this he said be not anxious o mother my public kitchen belongeth to the immortal god and he will supply it with provisions it happened that at that time a man arrived at anandpur from chetu's district he had given chetu a set of bracelets made of rhinoceros hide as a present for the guru's mother when chetu was questioned he said he had duly given her the bracelets but it was satisfactorily proved that he had not and that he had been prevailed on by his wife to bestow them on her chetu was duly punished for his dishonesty the guru continued to receive many complaints against the masands one of them in particular billeted himself on a poor sikh and claimed sweets instead of the crushed pulse and unleavened bread which formed the staple food of his host the masand took the bread threw it into his host's face and dashed the crushed pulse on the ground he then began to abuse the sikh and would not cease until the poor man had sold his wife's petticoat to provide him with sweets when the guru was informed of this he set about punishing the masand he ordered that henceforth the sikhs should themselves present their offerings and that the employment of the masands for the purpose should cease one day a company of mimes went to perform before the guru he ordered them to imitate the masands one of them accordingly dressed as a masand two as a masand's servants and a fourth as a masand's courtesan riding behind him on horseback as he went to collect offerings for the guru the mimes portrayed to life the villainies and oppression practised by the masands the guru upon this finally resolved to free his sikhs from their tyranny he ordered that all the masands should be arraigned for their misdemeanours he listened in every case to their defences and explanations punished those whom he found guilty and pardoned those who succeeded in establishing their innocence among the latter was a masand called feru of whom mention has been made in the life of guru harai feru lived in the country then called naka between the rivers ravi and bias the guru ordered that he should be brought before him the guru remembered an expression used by guru harai to feru my purse is at thy disposal spend what thou pleasest from it guru gobind rai added the purse is thine and its disposal is also thine Faru replied great king thine is the purse and thine also its disposal whether i am bad or good i am thine the guru knowing him to be without guile acquitted him and with his own hands invested him with a robe of honour some other masands too were acquitted as the result of Faru's pleadings on their behalf once a company of udasis brought the guru a copy of the granth sahib written with great elegance for his attestation and signature at that time no granth was accepted as correct unless countersigned by the guru but petitioners had first to approach his minister dewan nan chand and submit the work to him for approval the latter observing the beautiful penmanship of the volume formed the dishonest intention of appropriating it he told the udasis to come in a month's time and he would meanwhile find some means of obtaining the guru's signature 
when they returned after the expiration of that period he told them he had not yet had an opportunity of speaking to the guru on the subject and suggested their waiting for another ten days by similar subterfuges he kept the udasis going backwards and forwards in suspense for six months at the end of that time he asked them to take the price of the granth sahib from him and prepare another for the guru's approval the udasis refused whereupon he had them forcibly expelled from anandpur one day when the guru went hunting the udasis found an opportunity of complaining to him of nan chand's conduct the guru at once ordered that their granth should be restored to them nan chand sent a message to the guru that he was ready to return the book but at the same time told the udasis to leave the place at once if they valued their safety if they made any further complaint to the guru they should be imprisoned and put to death the udasis were however not so easily deterred they bided their time to approach the guru on another occasion they complained that nan chand had disobeyed his order forcibly expelled them from the city and threatened them with death in the event of their return and making a further complaint against him the guru sent a severe message to nan chand evil days have come for thee as i treated the masands so shall i treat thee if thou desire thine own welfare restore their granth sahib to the udasas when the guru's message was communicated to nan chand he said go away i will not return the granth sahib see my friends how the guru seeketh to frighten me were i to shake the dust off the skirt of my coat i could make many gurus like him the sikhs replied very well let the guru come to thee and thou shalt see he will draw no distinction between thee and thy brother masands nan chand shrinking from the consequences of his temerity fled with the granth sahib to kartarpur when the guru heard that he had fled through fear of death he replied death will reach him there too when nan chand reached kartarpur he sent a message to dhir mal hundreds of thousands of sikhs adhere to thy cause they will all worship thee and make thee the guru of the world it is in my power to-day to raise thee to that eminence nan chand was however seriously distrusted at kartarpur it was suspected that he had come from the guru to practise some treachery either to kill dhir mal or take possession of the town dhir mal consulted his masands as to what was best to be done they advised that nan chand should be put to death according to the following stratagem as he came to pay a visit a musketeer should be hidden within the house to fire at him this was agreed on when nan chan entered dhir mal's anteroom he received a bullet in the thigh as he staggered the doors were closed to prevent his escape and he then received several fatal bullets from the roof which had been opened for the purpose one day the guru saw two horsemen pass his place and then make a diversion towards the satluj they were gurdas and his brother tara great-grandsons of bai bahilo and masands of ram rai who had come to seek the guru's protection but whose courage failed them at the last moment the guru caused them to be brought before him in reply to his messenger's questions they had said that they were bearers when they appeared before the guru he detected their disguise and asked why they had falsely represented themselves as bearers they told their history the guru on his visit on a former occasion to dera believing them to be trustworthy allowed them to remain there with punjab kaur ram rai's widow for her protection the other masands had poisoned punjab kaur's mind against them and they now fled to the guru for protection on arriving at anandpur they had heard of the guru's treatment of other masands and through fear turned aside to avoid him the guru complimented them as the descendants of bai bahilo on their finally confessing the truth to him and mentioned the respect in which bai bahilo had been held by the preceding gurus 
after their repentance the guru entertained them for some years and then allowed them to depart to their homes the guru always held the belief that it would be proper and advantageous to his sikhs to wear long hair and otherwise not alter man's god-given body and he often broached the subject to them on one occasion they replied that if they wore long hair they would be subjected to the banter and annoyance of both hindus and mohammedans the guru then suggested that they should wear arms and be at all times ready to defend themselves this advice was adopted in ancient times the guru said it was the universal custom to wear one's natural hair and he instanced the cases of ram chandar krishan christ and mohammed why should hair grow if god had meant it to be cut off a child's hair groweth in the womb the guru therefore hoped that his followers would never be guilty of the sin of shaving or cutting off their hair and those who obeyed his injunctions he promised to consider true members of his faith it is recorded that at this time the sikhs lived in great social love and harmony they regarded themselves as brothers they used to feed one another shampoo one another when tired bathe one another wash one another's clothes and one sikh always met another with a smile on his face and love in his heart a company of sikhs came to visit the guru and made the following representation we have found it very difficult to approach thee on account of the violence of the mohammedans some of our company have been killed by them on the way others have been wounded and have returned to their homes to whom can we look for assistance but to thee the guru on hearing this remained silent and reflected that the tyranny of the turks had certainly become intolerable and that all religion was being banished from the land the guru invited all his sikhs to attend the great baisakhi fair at anandpur without shaving or cutting their hair on finding them assembled he ordered that carpets should be spread on a raised mound which he indicated and that an adjacent spot should be screened off with kanats or tent walls when this was done the guru ordered a confidential sikh to go at midnight tie five goats in the enclosure and let no one know what he had done the goats were duly tied and separate orders were given to the guru's orderlies not to go within the tent walls next morning the guru rose a watch before day performed his devotions and put on arms and uniform he then proclaimed that there should be a great open-air gathering when all were seated he drew his sword and asked if there was any one of his beloved sikhs ready to lay down his life for him no reply was given all grew pale on hearing such a proposal the guru asked a second time but with the same result a third time he spoke in a louder voice if there be any true sikh of mine let him give me his head as an offering and proof of his faith daya ram a sikh of lahore rose and said o true king my head is at thy service the guru took his arm led him within the enclosure and gave him a seat he then cut off a goat's head with one stroke of the sword went forth and showed the dripping weapon to the multitude the guru again asked is there any other true sikh who will bestow his head on me the crowd felt now quite convinced that the guru was in earnest and that he had killed daya ram so no one replied at the third time of asking dharm das of dili answered o oh, great king take my head the guru assuming an angry mien took dharm das within the enclosure seated him near daya ram and killed another goat the guru then looking very fierce came forth and said is there any other sikh who will offer me his head i am in great need of sikhs heads on this some remarked that the guru had lost his reason 
others went to the guru's mother to complain and said that he had undergone a complete change and was no longer responsible for his actions they instanced his sacrificing two sikhs with apparently no object his mother was advised to depose him and confer the guruship on his eldest son she sent a messenger for him but he was too intent on his own purpose at the time to receive messengers of any description he called out for a third sikh ready to offer him his life whereupon muhakam chand of daraka offered himself as a sacrifice upon this the guru handed him into the enclosure and killed a third goat he then came forth showing his dripping sword as before when the guru called out for a fourth sikh for sacrifice the sikhs began to think that he was going to kill them all some ran away and many hung down their heads sahib chand a resident of bidar clasped his hands in an attitude of supplication and said he placed his head at the guru's disposal the guru took him behind the tent walls and killed a fourth goat when he came forth as before he asked for a fifth sikh who was prepared to lay down his life for him on this there was a general flight of the remaining sikhs and only those who were very staunch in their faith ventured to stay himat of jagarnath answered the guru's last call and said he might take his life also the guru then took him inside the enclosure and killed the remaining goat the guru was now ready to sacrifice his own life for the five sikhs who showed such devotion to him he clad them in splendid raiment so that they shone like the sun and thus addressed them my brethren you are in my form and i am in yours he who thinketh there is any difference between us erreth exceedingly then seating the five sikhs near him he proclaimed to the whole assembly in the time of guru nanak there was found one devout sikh namely guru angad in my time there are found five sikhs totally devoted to the guru these shall lay anew the foundation of sikhism and the true religion shall become current and famous through the world these people became astonished at the guru's expedient and fell at the feet of the five devoted sikhs saying hail to the sikh religion you brethren have established it on a permanent basis had we offered our heads like you we too should be blessed the guru again addressed his sikhs since the time of baba nanak charan pahal hath been customary men drank the water in which the gurus had washed their feet a custom which led to great humility but the khalsa can now only be maintained as a nation by bravery and skill in arms therefore i now institute the custom of baptism by water stirred with a dagger and change my followers from sikhs to singhs or lions they who accept the nectar of the pahul shall be changed before your very eyes from jackals into lions and shall obtain empire in this world and bliss hereafter according to the persian historian gulam muhai ul din the news writer of the period sent the emperor a copy of the guru's address to his sikhs on that occasion it is dated the first of baisak sambat seventeen fifty six a d sixteen ninety nine and is as follows let all embrace one creed and obliterate differences of religion let the four hindu castes who have different rules for their guidance abandon them all adopt the one form of adoration and become brothers let no one deem himself superior to another let none pay heed to the ganges or other places of pilgrimage which are spoken of with reverence in the shastars or adore incarnations such as ram krishan brahma and durga but believe in guru nanak and the other sikh gurus let men of the four castes receive my baptism eat out of one dish and feel no disgust or contempt for one another the news writer when forwarding this proclamation to his master submitted his own report when the guru had thus addressed the crowd several 
brahmans and khatris stood up and said that they accepted the religion of guru nanak and of the other gurus others on the contrary said that they would never accept any religion which was opposed to the teaching of the veds and the shastars and that they would not renounce at the bidding of a boy the ancient faith which had descended to them from their ancestors thus though several refused to accept the guru's religion about twenty thousand men stood up and promised to obey him as they had the fullest faith in his divine mission the guru caused his five faithful sikhs to stand up he put pure water into an iron vessel and stirred it with a khanda or two-edged sword he then repeated over it the sacred verses which he had appointed for the ceremony namely the japji the japji guru amar das's anand and certain sarwayas or quatrains of his own composition the guru in order to show his sikhs the potency of the baptismal nectar which he had prepared put some of it aside for birds to drink upon this two sparrows came and filled their beaks with it then flying away they began to fight the chronicler states like two rajas struggling for supremacy and died by mutual slaughter the inference was that all animals which drank the guru's baptismal water should become powerful and warlike bhai ram kaur a descendant of bhai buddha went and told the guru's wife mata jito that he was inaugurating a new form of baptism he also gave her an account of the incident of the sparrows mata jito taking some indian sweetmeats called patasha went out of curiosity to the guru he said she had come at an opportune moment and asked her to throw the sweets into the holy water he had begun he said to beget the khalsa as his sons and without a woman no son could be produced now that the sweets were poured into the nectar the sikhs would be at peace with one another otherwise they would be at continual variance the five sikhs fully dressed and accoutred stood up before the guru he told them to repeat wa guru and the preamble of the japji he then gave them five palmfuls of the amrit to drink he sprinkled it five times on their hair and their eyes and caused them all to repeat wa guru ji ka khalsa wa guru ji ki fata on this he gave them all the appellation of sings or lions he then explained to them what they might and what they might not do they must always wear the following articles whose names begin with a k namely kes long hair kanga a comb kripan a sword kak short drawers kara a steel bracelet they were enjoined to practise arms and not show their backs to the foe in battle they were ever to help the poor and protect those who sought their protection they must not look with lust on another's wife or commit fornication but adhere to their wedded spouses they were to consider their previous castes erased and deem themselves all brothers of one family sikhs were freely to intermarry among one another but must have no social or matrimonial relations with smokers with persons who kill their daughters with the descendants or followers of prithi chand dhir mal ram rai or masands who had fallen away from the tenets and principles of guru nanak they must not worship idols cemeteries or cremation grounds they must only believe in the immortal god they must rise at dawn bathe read the prescribed hymns of the gurus meditate on the creator abstain from the flesh of an animal whose throat had been jagged with a knife in the mohammedan fashion and be loyal to their masters when the guru had thus administered baptism to his five tried sikhs he stood up before them with clasped hands and begged them to administer baptism to himself in precisely the same way as he had administered it to them they were astonished at such a proposal and represented their own unworthiness and the greatness of the guru whom they deemed god's vicar upon earth they asked why he made such a request and why he stood in a suppliant posture before them he replied i am the son of the immortal god it is by his order i have been born and have established this form of baptism 
they who accept it shall henceforth be known as the khalsa the khalsa is the guru and the guru is the khalsa there is no difference between you and me as guru nanak seated guru angad on the throne so have i made you also a guru wherefore administer the baptismal nectar to me without any hesitation accordingly the five sikhs baptized the guru with the same ceremonies and injunctions he himself had employed he thus invested his sect with the dignity of gurudom the guru called the five sikhs who had baptized him his panch payare or five beloved and himself gobind singh instead of gobind rai the name by which he had been previously known upon this many others prepared to receive baptism the first five to do so after the beloved of the guru were ram singh deva singh tahil singh ishar singh and fatah singh these were named the panch mukta or the five who had obtained deliverance after them many thousands were baptized a supplementary ordinance was now issued that if any one cut his hair smoked tobacco associated with a mohammedan woman or ate the flesh of an animal whose throat had been jagged with a knife he must be rebaptized pay a fine and promise not to offend any more otherwise he must be held to be excommunicated from the khalsa the place where the guru administered his first baptism is now known as kesgar the sikh chronicler by santok singh has composed the following on this memorable event god's khalsa which arose is very holy when its followers meet they say waguru ji ki fatah the khalsa hath abolished regard for pyres spiritual rulers and miracle workers of other sects whether hindu or mussulman the world on seeing a third religion was astonished enemies apprehended that it would deprive them of sovereignty the guru inaugurated a new custom for the establishment of the faith the effacement of sin and the repetition of god's name End of chapter eleven section twelve of sikh religion volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe life of guru gobind singh chapter twelve we now come to further objections made by the hindus to the khalsa they said it is impossible to observe the rules of the khalsa how can the four castes dine together were we to accept the guru's words there would be no trace of caste left in the world the guru hath confounded the four castes he hath stirred water with a dagger and called it nectar no matter who cometh to him he associateth with him without distinction of caste and without regard for the duty prescribed for his stage of life he hath renounced the veds and the popular beliefs and only believeth in acid huj of whom we have never before heard and who is not known even to pandits the learned men among the hindus preach of ram krishan and the other incarnations recorded in the purans and adhere to the ancient religions brethren this khalsa is a new-fangled institution for which we have no scriptural authority it is the guru who hath introduced this absurdity and informed the world that there is only one caste he hath broken the sacrificial thread of brahmans and khatris and by causing them to eat together hath brought discredit on ancient customs sanctioned and hallowed by religion he hath ordered us not to give our daughters in marriage to any one who cutteth his hair so smitten is he with affection for his khalsa that he hath rejected not only the hindu but the muhammadan religion he hath prohibited tobacco 
pilgrimages and periodical oblations to the manis of ancestors the guru wrote to his sikhs wherever they resided to come and accept baptism and become members of the khalsa he warned those who failed to do so that they should afterwards regret it when they met with affliction they would be glad to seek the protection of the khalsa but this could only be obtained by their acceptance of baptism and by their repentance and submission the holy khalsa would then remove their entanglements and accept them as brothers in the faith on this great occasion the hill chiefs including raja ajmar chand the successor of the late bim chand went to visit the guru ajmar chand said it is thou who hast instituted the khalsa religion by thy power and greatness all the turks shall be destroyed the guru replied if thou be baptized and become a sikh thy glory shall increase tenfold ajmer chand inquired what the marks of the guru's sikhs were that is how they could be recognized the guru replied my sikhs shall be in their natural form that is without the loss of their hair or foreskin in opposition to ordinances of the hindus and the muhammadans in reply to ajmer chand's further inquiries the guru informed him of the acts allowed and disallowed his sikhs ajmer chand replied great king we must worship our idols and shave on the occasions of deaths in our houses this is ordained by our religion the guru replied if hair were not pleasing to god why should he have caused it to grow in giving the baptismal nectar i change you from jackals to tigers my sings shall destroy all oppressive pathans and mughals and rule in the world ajmer chand said that is impossible each turk can eat a whole goat how can we who only eat rice cope with such strong men the guru replied my sings too are permitted to eat flesh and one of them shall be able to hold his ground against one hundred thousand turks i will kill hawks with sparrows o oh, raja have no anxiety i shall make men of all four castes my sings lions and destroy the mughals if thou too embrace my faith and become a singh thy realm shall abide the guru's teaching had the magical effect of changing a pariah or outcast through an interminable line of heredity into a brave and staunch soldier as the history of the sikh mazabi regiments conclusively proves this metamorphosis has been accomplished in defiance of the hide-bound prejudices and conservatism of the old hindu religious systems prior to the time of the sikh gurus no general ever conceived the idea of raising an army from men who were believed to be unclean and polluted from their birth but the watchword and war cry of the sikhs wa guru ji ka khalsa wa guru ji ki fata and the stimulating precepts of the tenth guru altered what had hitherto been deemed the dregs of humanity into warriors whose prowess and loyalty never failed their leaders the guru continued to address the assembled rajas how has your religious political and social status deteriorated you have abandoned the worship of the true god and addressed your devotions to gods goddesses rivers trees etc through ignorance you know not how to govern your territories through indolence and vice you disregard the interests of your subjects you place over them officials who not only hate you but are besides your mortal enemies 
in your quarrels regarding caste and lineage you have not adhered to the ancient divisions of hinduism into four sections but you have made hundreds of subsections and subordinate minor castes you despise and loathe one another through your narrow prejudices and you act contrary to the wishes of the great almighty father your morals have become so perverted that through fear and with a desire to please your mussulman rulers you give them your daughters to gratify their lust self-respect hath found no place in your thoughts and you have forgotten the history of your sires i am intensely concerned for your fallen state are you not ashamed to call yourselves rajputs when the mussulman sees your wives and daughters before your very eyes your temples have been demolished and mosques built on their sites and many of your faith have been forcibly converted to islam if you still possess a trace of bravery and of the ancient spirit of your race then listen to my advice embrace the khalsa religion and gird up your loins to elevate the fallen condition of your country upon this the rajas took their departure without accepting the guru's proposal to substitute his khalsa for existing indian religious systems a sikh called ude singh appeared before the guru without any offering he said he had one but was unable to lift it he had killed a tiger but was not strong enough to bring its body to the guru the guru sent for the tiger skinned it and clothed a potter's donkey with the skin the donkey thus arrayed being let loose frightened all animals and rejoiced in his unmolested freedom several complaints and requests to kill him were made to the guru one day the guru and some sikhs went to shoot him on hearing the noise made by the guru's party the donkey fled for protection to his old master the potter seeing the animal's behaviour and movements those of a donkey and not of a tiger and moreover hearing him bray approached him took off the tiger's skin gave him a sound drubbing and employed him as before to carry burdens the sikhs on hearing this asked the guru what he meant by such a stratagem the guru replied as long as you were bound by caste and lineage you were like donkeys and subject to low persons i have now freed you from these entanglements and given you all worldly blessings i have clothed you in the garb of tigers and made you superior to all men enjoy happiness in this world and the guru will take care of you in the next and grant you the glorious dignity of salvation when the donkey wore a tiger's skin he was formidable but when he fell into the potter's power he was beaten and a load put on his back in the same way as long as you preserve your tiger's exterior your enemies shall fear you and you shall be victorious but if you part with it and return to caste observances you shall revert to your asinine condition and become subject to strangers moreover i have made you really tigers and not merely given you their garb and it is for you not to resume your caste habiliments as i have raised you from a lowly to a lofty position by imparting to you spiritual knowledge so if you revert to evil ways and hindu superstitions from which i have delivered you your last condition shall be worse than your first for then there will be no hope of your amendment some sikhs went to the guru and told him that the rangars and kujars of the village of na had been plundering their property but that those who were armed had successfully defended themselves the guru took this as a text to preach to his people the advantage of wearing arms they who practised their use should develop their martial instincts enhance their prestige and defend their property while those who remained in the slough of ancient apathy should lose all they possessed 
but in addition to arms men should also come to him to be baptized and should for the purpose appear before him with their hair uncut with drawers daggers and complete armour and retain all these objects of defence as long as they had life a man named nand lal now visited the guru he was son of a vaishnav khatri and disciple of a bairagi at the age of twelve years the bairagi desired to put on his neck a wooden necklace one of the outward symbols of his sect nand lal refused and asked to be invested with the necklace of god's name which he might repeat to obtain future happiness the bairagi dismissed him and subsequently explained his action to nand lal's father he had not the particular necklace which nand lal had asked for and so he set him free to select another spiritual guide nand lal was an accomplished persian scholar there is a tradition preserved among his descendants that when the king of persia sent a dispatch to aurangzeb his chief courtiers were invited to draft a reply nand lal's draft was deemed the most suitable and it was accordingly selected for dispatch to turan aurangzeb sent for nand lal and after an interview remarked to his courtiers that it was a pity such a learned man should remain a hindu nand lal on being apprised of the emperor's desire to convert him to islam and ever thinking of the spiritual guide suitable for him decided to flee from court and take refuge with the guru he communicated his intention to a friend of his a high mohammedan official they resolved to go together to anandpur and place themselves under the guru's spiritual guidance nand lal presented the guru a persian work called bandagi nama in praise of god a title which the guru changed to zindagi nama or bestower of eternal life the following are extracts from the work both worlds here and hereafter are filled with god's light the sun and moon are merely servants who hold his torches if my friend thou associate with the holy thou shalt obtain abiding wealth evil is that society from which evil resulteth and which will at last bring sorrow in its train as far as may be remain servants and claim not to be master a servant ought not to search for aught but service hence my dear friend thou oughtest to distinguish between thyself and god even if thou art united with him utter not one word which doth not express thy subjection to him when mansur said i am god they put his head on the gibbet this heart of mine o man is god's temple what shall i say this is god's ordinance since thou knowest that god abideth in every heart it is thy duty to treat every one with respect though thy lord sitteth and converseth with thee yet through thy stupidity thou runnest in every direction to find him the omnipotent is manifested by his omnipotence sweetness trickleth from the words of the holy the water of life drippeth from every hair of their bodies the saints are the same without and within both worlds are subject to their orders they who search for god are ever civil courtesy pointeth out the way that leadeth to god the discourteous are beyond god's kindness in the following extract from nand lal's dewan goya a clear distinction is drawn between god and man although the wave and the ocean both consist of water yet there is a great difference between them i am one wave of thee who art an endless sea thou art as distinct from me as heaven is from earth in of section twelve section thirteen of 
seek religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen life of guru gobind singh about this time the guru thinking that his kitchen was not well served paid a visit to it in disguise and asked for something to eat he received various refusals from the cooks one of them said that prayer must first be offered another we must first give the guru his dinner when the guru had received several similar excuses and nothing to eat though he urged that he was hungry he went to nand lal to beg his dinner nand lal at once brought forth flour vegetables salt and clarified butter and handed them to the supposed mendicant who took them and departed next day the guru in open court told how he had paid a visit in disguise to his kitchen and how he had been treated the cooks were very much ashamed and craved forgiveness he then gave orders that every wandering sikh who came to his door should at once receive food whether raw or cooked without excuse or delay the guru continued there is nothing equal to the bestowal of food blessed is the man who giveth to the really hungry let no one fix a time for the exercise of this virtue it is not necessary to consider whether it is night or day evening or morning whether the moon is dark or full or if there is a particular anniversary nor is it necessary to consider what the social position of the applicant may be avoid all delay in such a matter charity is of all gifts the greatest for it saveth life the guru had an opportunity of making further trial of the masands some sikhs of patna manjar and other parts of bengal came to see him these were accompanied by chaya and maya sons of balaki the masand of dhaka one of the sikhs presented a piece of dhaka muslin to the guru as an offering his courtiers began to admire it and said they had never before seen such a beautiful fabric on inquiry it was discovered that the same sikh had previously made a similar present through the masands to the guru's mother but it had never reached her chaya and maya were scourged as a punishment the guru heard that the rangars and gujars of a town called bajrur beyond the satluj had plundered some sikhs the guru took occasion during one of his hunting excursions to proceed thither with a small force the town was invested and exemplary punishment meted out to its inhabitants so that no one might afterwards be tempted to annoy the guru's followers a story is told which illustrates the sikh view of sacred music a sikh complained that the musicians on one occasion began to chant before he had quite finished reciting the sukhmani the guru said that reciting the guru's hymns bore the same comparison to chanting them to musical accompaniments as coarse pulse to sweet sacred food the gyanas supply another comparison and say that recitation is to chanting with music as well water which only benefits the owner of a few fields to rain-water which sheds blessings on all there is an anecdote told of a sikh who in the guru's presence mispronounced a word in the granth sahib and so gave a wrong meaning to the line in which it occurred the guru took the mistake as a text to preach the advantages of correct reading of the sikh sacred hymns o oh, sikhs listen to what i have to tell you on this subject read the guru's hymns correctly there is the greatest advantage in such reading for it will ensure bliss here and hereafter if a hymn be written incorrectly correct it and then read it as one may mend and use a household article which hath been broken the man who thus correcteth not the guru's hymns hath no love for them 
it will be remembered that guru teg bahadur when in prison in dihli prophesied the advent of the english one day the conversation between guru gobind singh and his disciples turned on this subject his disciples asked him what the condition of the sikhs would be when the english arrived the guru replied the english shall come with a great army the sikhs too shall be very powerful and their army shall engage that of the english sometimes victory shall incline to my sikhs sometimes to the english as long as the religion of the sikhs remaineth distinct so long shall the glory of those who profess it increase but when the sikhs become entangled in the love of mammon think of nothing but their own children their wives and their homes when those who administer justice oppress the poor and take bribes when those who sit on carpets sell their daughters and sisters when sikhs abandon the guru's hymns and in lieu of them follow the shastars and adopt the religion of the brahmans when sikh rajas forsake their gurus and fall under the influence of the priests of other religions when they scruple not to consort with courtesans and allow their states to be governed by evil influences then shall the english rule and their glory increase the sikhs asked the guru what should become of the great empire of the turks the guru replied aurangzeb relying on makan oracles is destroying the hindu religion and in his insane career will stop at nothing short of a miracle he is even preparing to contend with me he respecteth not the religion of the gurus but we shall gain the victory and the glory of the turks shall fade away such of them as survive shall become common labourers and suffer indignities from their masters at the end of the sambat year eighteen hundred a d seventeen forty three the sikhs shall take possession of many countries three years after that sikhs shall spring out of every bush and there shall subsequently be terrible warfare between the sikhs and the mohammedans a powerful monarch shall come from kandar and destroy countless sikhs their heads shall be piled in heaps he shall continue his progress of destruction to mathura in hindustan and alarm many lands none shall be able to withstand him as prophesied by guru arjan he shall raise the temple of amritsar to the ground but the sikhs shall plunder his camp on his retreat from india in the sambat year nineteen hundred a d eighteen forty three the turks who survive shall lose their empire a christian army shall come from calcutta the sikhs who are at variance with one another will join them there shall be great destruction of life and men and women shall be expelled from their homes the sikhs who abandon their arms and join the brahmans against the english shall have great sufferings the real sikhs shall hold their ground and survive a sikh called khan singh was once plastering a wall and let a drop of mud fall on the guru the guru ordered that he should receive one slight stroke as punishment the sikhs exceeded their orders and several of them beat the man severely the guru on discovering this wished to make reparation and the reparation was to provide the sufferer with a wife the guru asked his sikhs if any of them would give his daughter in marriage to the plasterer all remained silent the guru said you found it easy to obey my order to strike this man why not obey my present order i find you are sikhs only for your own advantage it happened that at that time a sikh called ajab singh from kandar was present with his virgin daughter at darbar he said o true king my daughter is at thy disposal the guru complimented him and said o sikh thou hast to-day proved that thou art a true member of the khalsa 
the plasterer represented that he would not marry on account of the endless troubles attending wedded life the girl on hearing this said to him by the guru's order i am already thine if thou accept me not i will not wed another but remain here to do service at the guru's feet the guru then interposed and urged the plasterer to wed the girl he accordingly did so by sikh marriage rites known as anand the guru promised that he should have five distinguished sons as the result of his marriage a prophecy which was duly fulfilled the guru now became frequently silent a matter which caused his mother great anxiety seeing him one day alone she approached him and after the usual blessing said blessed am i that such a son hath been born from my womb but i am now anxious regarding thee people say that thou art completely altered explain why thy spirits are depressed and thou art no longer cheerful as before the guru replied mother dear i will tell thee my secret i have been considering how i may confer empire on the khalsa the guru prescribed convivial rules as a preliminary to his great enterprise wherever he had a kitchen it should be considered god's own and the sikhs should eat therefrom should any of them object on the ground of caste prejudice he should be deemed beyond the pale of sikhism before the distribution of sacred food a prayer should first be uttered after meals the first stanza of the fifth ashtapadi of the sukhmani should be recited as a thanksgiving when a man had satisfied himself at the guru's kitchen he should take no food away with him when a sikh invited another to dine with him he should accept his hospitality and not find fault with his viands whenever a sikh was hungry he should be fed and treated with respect after this the guru prescribed some general rules for the guidance of his sikhs at the beginning of every work or enterprise they should recite suitable prayers they should always assist one another they should practise riding and the exercise of arms if the sikhs remembered the guru's instruction he promised to make all the inhabitants of india subject to them he who cast a covetous eye on his neighbour's property should go to hell he who assisted a sikh to complete any worthy or noble undertaking or study should obtain spiritual reward being questioned on the subject of marriage relations the guru uttered the following when i received understanding my father guru teg bahadur gave me this instruction o son as long as there is life in thy body make this thy sacred duty ever to love thine own wife more and more approach not another woman's couch either by mistake or even in a dream know that the love of another's wife is as a sharp dagger believe me death entereth the body by making love to another's wife they who think it great cleverness to enjoy another's wife shall in the end die the death of dogs once when there was scarcity in the land the guru's mother without consulting him ordered that food should be cooked only once a day and even then be sparingly distributed upon this the sikhs complained to the guru he said some evil persons have induced my mother to issue orders contrary to my wishes but o khalsa the guru's kitchen shall be ever open the turks shall flay those who have given evil advice to my mother the guru's mother on hearing this became much distressed and with tears in her eyes implored her son's pardon the guru pardoned her but added if thou close the guru's kitchen my curse shall avail but if thou keep it ever open my curse shall be retracted from that day forth twofold nay fourfold supplies poured into the guru's kitchen End of chapter thirteen section fourteen of sikh religion 
volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter fourteen a handsome young goldsmith one day presented himself before the guru and began to fan him he said that his father had taken the charan pahal in vogue at the time of the preceding gurus and he himself had received baptism according to the new rite the youth's mother accompanied him and the guru invited them both to stay with him the guru to make trial of the goldsmith's skill gave him ten gold muhars to convert into ornaments when the work was subsequently submitted for the guru's inspection he was pleased and ordered his treasurer to keep the young artisan supplied with gold and store all the ornaments he made from it in his treasury the guru asked the goldsmith if he had any faults he replied o great king i am the slave of thy feet i only seek the society of the saints upon this the guru replied he who hath great talents must ever possess some fault what is thine the man possessing talent who hath no fault must be in god's own image the young man however would not admit any imperfection after this he was allowed to take as much gold as he pleased to work upon it was never weighed to him and he was never asked how much he had taken one day the guru told his treasurer to weigh for the future without the goldsmith's knowledge all the gold dispensed to him upon this the treasurer weighed him out twenty tolas of gold when the goldsmith presented the ornaments made therefrom they were found to weigh only seventeen tolas upon this the guru ordered all the ornaments the youth had made since his arrival to be produced and weighed the treasurer found them to be far short of the amount of gold taken from the treasury on this the guru remonstrated with the young goldsmith thou impliedst that thou hadst no fault what greater fault can there be than to misappropriate what is entrusted thee didst thou not receive thy wages from the guru's house and was that not sufficient remuneration for thee thou art as evil as the masands whom i have been punishing i am pleased with those who though they may wear coarse garbs eat what they lawfully earn it is said that on this censure the youth reformed his ways the guru being asked by a devout sikh what he should do to cross over the world's ocean that is to be saved and obtain deliverance from rebirth gave the following recipe my brother repeat the name waguru eat what thou hast diligently earned as baba nanak hath said he who bestoweth a little out of his earnings recogniseth the right way bear no one enmity know that god is with thee at all times and remember death recognize the world as unreal and god alone as real a sikh went to the guru and told him that he had abandoned the world as it contained only trouble and anxiety he added that he had come in quest of rest and requested the guru to point out the way to him the guru congratulated him on having diverted his attention from the wickedness of men and inquired if he could read the sikh replied in the negative the guru then said it is necessary that thou shouldst read little or much so as to acquire understanding and improve thy mind thou shalt thus learn the difference between good and evil and what thou oughtest and what thou oughtest not to do there are besides many other advantages in reading thou mayest thereby obtain everything beginning with the knowledge of god the heart of him who is uninstructed remaineth in blind ignorance he who readeth 
gurumukhi is the best and obtaineth good understanding there is great merit in reading the japji and the other hymns of morning and evening divine service for they erase the sins of many births he who orally or mentally fixeth his attention on the name who worketh with his hands who gladdeneth the hearts of holy sikhs who ever performeth noble deeds and preserveth his mind humble is very dear to me and it behooves me to minister unto him the sikh expressed his earnest desire to learn if he could only find a tutor the guru appointed his own granthi or reader to instruct him when the sikh read as far as the line in the anand joy my mother that i have found the true guru he brought his tuition to an end and never afterwards pursued his studies the guru after some months asked his granthi how the pupil was progressing the granthi replied that he had not seen him since he had read that particular line of the anand upon this the guru sent for him and asked him why he had ceased to attend his tutor he replied that he had read enough and had attained happiness on meeting the guru the guru smiled and said even with this little learning thou hast obtained a knowledge of god and shalt eventually find deliverance the guru once asked his sikhs to tell him who was emperor of india in kabir's time one sikh said who mayan a second alexander the great a third madame paul in short none of them could tell the emperor's name the guru made this a text from which to preach the advantages of knowledge as well as holiness and the good repute obtained from them in both worlds every one even down to ignorant women knoweth the name of kabir though he was only a weaver that is because he repeated god's name and practised true devotion sikandar lodi was then emperor but none of you even knoweth his name and there is no trace of him left in the world while kabir's fame is blazoned in every country and his memory is universally honoured wherefore members of the khalsa remember the true name serve the saints be humble lay your love and devotion at the feet of the immortal god and you too shall be honoured here and hereafter as the guru's power daily increased the hill chiefs thought it expedient to send a resident to his court who would inform them of his movements and proceedings a man called paramanand was accordingly selected for that delicate mission when he came to the guru he told him that his object was to be in a position to behold him continually and thus gain spiritual advantages he added that he desired to send the rajas occasionally accounts of the guru's good health and welfare and to preserve the amicable relations which already subsisted some sikhs asked the guru how kara parsad or sacred food should be prepared he replied wash and clean the cooking place then procure equal portions of refined sugar fine flour and clarified butter boil the sugar in water and render it liquid put the clarified butter and flour into another vessel and boil them until they assume a reddish colour then mix the liquefied sugar with the clarified butter and flour and boil all together when this is done a granthi must repeat certain prescribed prayers the mixture then becomes sacred food kara parsad and is fit for use the cook must be a sikh who has bathed in the morning and who can repeat at least the japji from memory a sikh married couple came to the guru in order to complain against their son they said they were satisfied with the wealth god had given them their only trouble arose 
from their son's contumacy he was ever in attendance on religious men and paid no regard to what he ate or what he wore if the subject of marriage so natural to a young man were mentioned to him he was ready to die as if poisoned when pressed on the subject he said that the guru had forbidden his marriage when they represented to him that the guru himself was a, a married man the youth would only say he can do what he pleaseth himself he hath forbidden me the guru sent for the youth and asked when he had forbidden him he replied o guru in the anand which thou wrotest as guru amar das for the instruction of the sikhs there is the following passage o dear man do thou ever remember the true one this family which thou seest shall not depart with thee it shall not depart with thee why fix thy thoughts on it never do what thou shalt have to repent of at last listen thou to the instruction of the true guru it is that which shall go with thee saith nanak o dear man ever remember the true one this instruction said the youth is imprinted on my mind the guru was so pleased on hearing this that he embraced him and said to his parents men are continually warned but none taketh heed blessed is he who hath forsaken mammon it is his good fortune that he hath awakened to contempt of the world this son of yours shall save forth your families and you shall have another son besides to gladden your hearts the guru detained the youth and dismissed his parents he was pleased that the spontaneous love of god had sprung up in the young man's heart and he instructed him in the duties both of a husband and a hermit after a comparison of both he embraced domestic life once in the sultry weather as the guru was perspiring his servants took his bed from the ground floor to the top of his house from there he heard an altercation between two sikhs regarding a debt of seven rupees mala singh had lent this sum to lahara singh but the latter would not return it when at the suggestion of mala singh's wife the harassing was further done he composed this couplet o seat eat the wealth of a seek without anxiety thou hast come to annoy me at which i am very angry and added a seek shall receive whatever is written in his destiny mala singh replied thou embezzlest my money and then lecturest me thou forgettest what hath been said they whose acts are deceitful shall be punished in god's court death shall smite them they shall greatly weep and regret when they enter hell lahara singh capped this with another no one shall ask for an account as long as god pardoneth the guru overhearing this interchange of verses cried out they who live and spend money by deceiving others shall be bound in god's court ponder on all your acts so as to preserve your honesty the guru then quoted for the disputants the lines of baba nanak against dishonesty after hearing the guru lahara singh began to speak civilly to mala singh and promised to give him his money on the morrow lahara singh kept his promise and then went to the guru to solicit his pardon the guru upon this repeated for the first time his muktanama or means of salvation the following are its principal injunctions o sikhs borrow not but if you are compelled to borrow faithfully restore the debt speak not falsely and associate not with the untruthful associating with holy men practise truth love truth and clasp it to your hearts live by honest labour and deceive no one 
let not a sikh be covetous repeat the japji and the japji before eating look not on a naked woman let not your thoughts turn towards that sex cohabit not with another's wife deem another's property as filth keep your bodies clean have dealings with every one but consider yourselves distinct your faith and daily duties are different from theirs bathe every morning before repast if your bodies endure not cold water then heat it ever abstain from tobacco remember the one immortal god repeat the rahiras in the evening and the sohila at bedtime receive the baptism and teaching of the guru and act according to the granth sahib cling to the boat in which thou hast embarked wander not in search of another religion repeat the guru's hymns day and night marry only into the house of a sikh preserve thy wife and thy children from evil company covet not money offered for religious purposes habitually attend a sikh temple and eat a little sacred food therefrom he who distributeth sacred food should do so in equal quantities whether the recipients be high or low old or young eat not food offered to gods or goddesses despise not any sikh and never address him without the appellation sing eat regardless of caste with all sikhs who have been baptized and deem them your brethren abandon at once the company of brahmans and mullahs who cheat men out of their wealth of ritualists who lead sikhs astray and of those who give women in marriage with concealed physical defects and thus deceive the hopes of offspring let not a sikh have intercourse with a strange woman unless married to her according to the sikh rites let him contribute a tenth part of his earnings for religious purposes let him bow down at the conclusion of prayer when a sikh dieth let sacred food be prepared after his cremation let the sohila be read and prayer offered for his soul and for the consolation of his relations then sacred food may be distributed let not the family of the deceased indulge in much mourning or bevies of women join in lamentation on such occasions let the guru's hymns be read and sung and let all listen to them worship not an idol and drink not the water in which it hath been bathed the rules of caste and of the stages of hindu life are erroneous let my sikhs take care not to practise them o sikhs listen to me and adopt not the ceremonies of the hindus for the supposed advantages of the manis of ancestors my face is turned towards him who calleth out to a sikh wa guru ji ki fatah my right shoulder towards him who returneth the salutation with love my left shoulder towards him who returneth it as a matter of custom and my back towards him who returneth it not at all to him who abideth by these rules i will grant a position to which no one hath yet been able to attain and which was beyond the conception of shankar acharya datatra ramanuj gorak and muhammad as when rain falleth on the earth the fields yield excellent and pleasant fruit so he who listeneth to the guru and attendeth to all these injunctions shall assuredly receive the reward thereof whoever accepteth the guru's words and these rules which he hath given shall have his sins pardoned he shall be saved from transmigration through the eighty-four locks of animals and after death shall enter the guru's abode if any very worldly man devoted to pleasure tell you to the contrary listen not to him but ever follow the guru's instruction End of chapter 14
section fifteen of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter fifteen a sikh went to the guru to complain that his wife having been enchanted by a muhammadan desired to embrace islam he prayed the guru to perform incantations whereby his wife might adhere to her faith and conjugal duties the guru replied charms incantations and spells are useless the guru's hymns alone are of any avail no jinn fairy or demon shall approach her who daily reciteth or heareth the japji it is the duty of all sikhs to give their wives religious instruction thy wife on receiving it shall return to her religion and allegiance to thee one day the musicians were singing the story of gopi chand in presence of the guru the story being affecting the audience were moved to tears one man said that the musicians ought to be fined because they had in the guru's presence sung the epic of gopi chand instead of the hymns of the gurus and it was written in the anand that all compositions except the gurus were inadmissible the guru replied only those compositions are forbidden which lead men astray from god when simple men sing verses which lead to a reconciliation with him it is not thy duty to spurn them it cannot harm thee to listen to a story which containeth a moral the guru thought it prudent to be ever prepared for war and he continued to enlist all who offered themselves for service he provided them with horses and arms and often represented to them that the power of the turks had now grown beyond all endurance one day as the guru was on a hunting excursion in the dun balia chand and alim chand two hill chiefs seeing him with only a small retinue resolved to surprise and capture him a fight ensued but the sikhs were too few in number to cope with their assailants and were obliged to retreat a sikh trooper came upon the guru who had lost his way in the melee and thus addressed him as a forest hath no beauty without a tiger so a sikh army hath no ornament without its guru if thou assist us not in our present difficulty it will be a matter of eternal reproach to thee the guru then discharged five arrows at the enemy which took fatal effect upon this the sikhs though few in number were encouraged to return to the combat blood was spilled on both sides like red powder at the hindu festival of the holy balia chand on seeing the destruction of his men rushed forward but found himself opposed by ude singh one of the bravest soldiers of the guru's army alim chand also advanced to support the hill army but was confronted by alim singh both sides fought desperately and men fell like trees cut down by the woodman's axe alim chand aimed a blow of his sword at alim singh who received it on his shield and then with his return blow struck off alim chand's right arm alim chand however contrived to escape leaving balia in sole command of the hill troops balia chand did not long enjoy that honour as he was soon shot dead by ude singh the hill troops finding that one of their chiefs had fled with the loss of his arm and that the other was dead took to flight leaving the honours of victory to the guru and his sikhs after the battle the guru undismayed continued his hunting excursion 
after this defeat the hill chiefs thought it highly dangerous to allow the sikhs to increase in power and number they remarked that the sikhs were to-day in thousands but in a short time they would be in millions therefore immediate measures ought to be taken for their repression an indian fig-tree when small can be easily destroyed but if allowed to grow it becomes a forest and cannot be eradicated the hill chiefs therefore thought it desirable to complain to the dili government against the sikhs the emperor aurangzeb was still engaged in warfare in the south of india in his absence the subadar or viceroy of dili heard their representations the hill chiefs having traced the guru's history from the time he had left patna and settled with a humble following in anandpur thus continued knowing that he was a successor of the holy guru nanak we made no objection to his residence among us when he obtained power and we essayed to restrain him he went to nahan and there formed an alliance with its raja he then came into collision with raja fatah shah of srinagar which ultimately led to the battle of bangani where there was great destruction of human life after his return to anandpur the guru established a new sect distinct from the hindus and mohammedans to which he hath given the name of khalsa he hath united the four castes into one and made many followers he invited us to join him and promised if we consented that we should obtain empire in this world and salvation in the next he suggested to us that if we rose in rebellion against the emperor he would assist us with all his forces because the emperor had killed his father and he desired to avenge his death as we did not think it proper to oppose the emperor the guru is displeased with us and now giveth us every form of annoyance we cannot restrain him and have accordingly come to crave the protection of this just government against him if the government consider us its subjects we pray for its assistance to expel the guru from anandpur should you delay to punish and restrain him his next expedition will be against the capital of your empire this representation was duly submitted by the subadar to the emperor a kazi called salardin came to visit the guru reminded him of the sikh and mohammedan belief in destiny and upbraided him with having reversed the judgment of heaven they on whose foreheads unfavourable destiny was written he said have been blessed and have received from thee all bounties and good gifts in return for their services and their fidelity the guru replied destiny is as the reverse letters on a seal i bless those who bow to the guru the letters of their destiny then present their ordinary appearance this shows that the sikhs need not implicitly believe in the controlling power of destiny in october when the cold season was approaching his troops represented to the guru that they required warm clothing he requested them to be patient a sikh he said was bringing him a bag of money to relieve all their necessities a rich merchant who had been originally a follower of saki sarwar soon arrived with an offering of two thousand rupees and related his story while i was a follower of saki sarwar i invested a large sum of money in merchandise but failed to dispose of it to advantage notwithstanding a large offering of sweets to my patron saint that and other mercantile ventures of mine having failed i set about finding a religious guide who possessed influence with the supreme powers 
i then heard that the tenth guru occupied the seat of the holy guru nanak and i vowed that in the event of commercial success i would give him a tithe of my profits i have accordingly brought this bag of rupees and i promise that i will no longer be a follower of any muhammadan but a sikh of the guru the guru duly baptized him and accepted his offering the guru was thus enabled to provide warm clothing for his troops and their devotion to him and their belief in his prophetic and divine power increased in consequence one day when the guru felt thirsty he asked a sikh to fetch him water before the sikh had time to do so a young boy who had come to see the guru volunteered to perform the service the guru noticing that the boy's hands were soft and clean asked him if he had any occupation he replied in the negative that was the first time he had ever offered to fetch water for any one when he brought it the guru refused to drink saying it was impure the boy remonstrated and insisted on its purity the guru replied hear me o sikhs it is an important article of the guru's faith that performing service for saints contributeth to man's salvation the hands are purified by serving them the feet are purified by going to behold the guru without serving holy men man's body is as unclean as the limbs of a corpse from which all shrink and which all fear to touch the guru quoted the following from gur das's wars curses on the head which boweth not to the guru and which toucheth not the guru's feet curses on the eyes which instead of beholding the guru look at another's wife curses on the ears which hear not and pay no attention to the guru's instruction curses on the tongue which repeateth other spell than the word of the guru curses on the hands and feet which serve not the guru all other work is fruitless his disciples are dear to the priest happiness is obtained by seeking the shelter of the guru after this the boy placed himself under the guru's instruction and, and learned to know god in due time the orders of the supreme government were received on the representation of the hill rajah's envoy to the viceroy of dihli an army would be sent to assist them against the guru if they paid its expenses but not otherwise they accordingly sent the necessary funds and further represented that they had no hope except in the emperor's assistance the viceroy sent for generals din beg and paianda khan both commanding divisions of five thousand men and ordered them to take their troops to resist the guru's encroachments on the rights of the hill chiefs when the imperial troops arrived at ropar they were joined by the hill chiefs at the head of their contingents they decided to expel the guru if he offered resistance but if he undertook to be a loyal subject for the future they were prepared to allow him to abide in anandpur a sikh hearing of the force proceeding against the guru hastened from kiratpur to anandpur to give him information the guru's men were soon under arms he appointed the five whom he had first baptized as generals of his army the sikh chronicler states that when the engagement began the turks were roasted by the continuous and deadly fire of the sikhs the guru went into the midst of his troops and gave them every form of encouragement they never retreated but staunchly confronted the enemy general painda khan seeing the determined resistance of the sikhs shouted to his men that they were engaged in religious warfare and called on them to fight to the death against the infidels upon this his troops discharged clouds of arrows which obscured the sky painda khan himself formed the design of engaging in single combat with the guru and thus deciding the battle the guru on hearing his challenge advanced on horseback and said o pathan i am guru gobind singh the enemy of thy life 
on hearing this painda khan's eyes became bloodshot and he vowed to fight to the death against the priest of the sikhs he invited the guru to strike the first blow so that he might not afterwards have cause for regret the guru refused the role of aggressor and said he had vowed never to strike except in self-defence painda khan whirled his horse round and round to find an opportunity of attacking the guru and breaking his guard at last both warriors and their horses stood still and both sides began to speculate on their chances of victory painda khan discharged an arrow which whizzed past the guru's ear the guru ironically complimented him on his archery and invited him to shoot again so that he might have no cause for remorse painda khan discharged another arrow which also missed its mark upon this he was on the point of retreating through shame and vexation when the guru addressed him o oh, jackal wait a little whither goest thou it is now my turn the whole of painda khan's body except his ears was encased in armour the guru knowing this discharged an arrow at his ear with such unerring aim that he fell off his horse prone on the ground and rose no more this however did not end the battle din beg now assumed sole command and urged on his troops maddened by painda khan's death they fought with great desperation but were unable to make any impression on the solid ranks of the sikhs on the contrary the sikh forces caused great destruction among them ajmer chand seeing this prepared for flight the other hill chiefs followed his example by this time din beg was severely wounded and began to ask himself why he should try to keep the field any longer since all those whom he had come to assist had ingloriously fled he accordingly beat a retreat and was pursued by the sikhs as far as ropar the guru sent an officer to recall his troops as he did not think it became sikhs to take the trouble to pursue cowardly and fugitive enemies the sikhs returned with horses arms and a vast quantity of other booty taken from the mohammedans the sikh chronicler states that the enemy's heads remained on the field like so many pumpkins and that kites ravens and jackals hovered round them impatient for a feast the guru continued to keep his troops in readiness for defence whenever attacked he sent for armourers to make muskets swords and arrows and filled his magazine with gunpowder and lead he issued a proclamation that all sikhs who came to see him should bring offensive and defensive weapons as offerings numbers hearing of his bravery and piety flocked to his standard he baptized all comers and thus infused into them the spirit of the khalsa the hill chiefs again took alarm and said to themselves that the guru who had defeated painda khan and din beg though commanding an army of ten thousand men would be soon emboldened to oust them altogether from their territories they must therefore either kill him or expel him from anandpur and with this object they again thought it necessary to seek the assistance of the dhili government Raja Ajmer chand was deputed as envoy and it was resolved to provide him with costly presents for the emperor raja bup chand now raja of handur braver than his fellows opposed the dispatch of an envoy he said that nothing could be gained by again seeking the assistance of the emperor they ought to be able to defend themselves if all the hill chiefs concerned were to contribute reasonable contingents they could muster a large army which would be more than sufficient to annihilate the guru and his sikhs he however proposed as the most simple and feasible measure to invest the guru's capital anandpur and starve its occupants into submission should any hill chief not join in this enterprise the others were to hold no intercourse with him but treat him as an enemy the rangars and kujars 
who were their subjects and were at ancient enmity with the sikhs would now be valuable allies against the guru the raja of handur concluded his address o ajmer chan a reed is a frail support but a handful of reeds bound together is not easily broken if we all join together the sikhs will be powerless to offer us resistance raja ajmer chand was gained over by the proposal and both he and raja bup chand sent envoys to all the hill chiefs upon this the rajas of jammu nurpur mandi bhutan kulu kianthal guler chamba srinagar dalwal and others came with their contingents when they met in council raja ajmer chand thus addressed them hear me o rajas the sikhs are not merely my enemies they are the common enemies of all no one is able to withstand them they cannot even be bribed by money into submission we know not what their guru's designs may be he baptizeth sikhs and they beget sikhs as wicked as themselves we know not what the guru whispereth into their ears that night and day they think of nothing but harrying and slaying give me your counsel as to what you deem best to be done the rajas were unanimous in promising that they would agree to any proposal made by raja ajmer chand if the guru they said were put to death they might all reign in peace accordingly ammunition was served out to the allied army overnight and before daybreak all were on their march to anandpur on arriving near the city the rajas drew up the following letter and dispatched it to the guru the land of anandpur is ours we allowed thy father to dwell on it and he ever paid us rent but thou payest us not a single kauri nay thou hast originated a new religion and laid our country waste we have endured this up to the present but can now endure it no longer wherefore we have come to blockade thy town and destroy thee and thy sikhs this is the time for thee to pay arrears of rent for the occupation of our land we call on thee to do so and undertake to pay it regularly every year for the future if thou art not disposed to accept these terms then prepare for thy departure from anandpur or take the consequences to this the guru sent reply o ajmer chand thou and thine allied rajas desire to take money from me but my father purchased and paid for the land and now the only further payment you deserve is with the sword if you can deprive me of anandpur you shall have it with bullets added thereto seek my protection and you shall be happy in both worlds seek the protection of the khalsa too and abandon pride part not with your senses and come to terms with us this is the guru's house in which men shall be treated as they deserve it is like a mirror as men make themselves so they appear in it if you proceed to hostilities with the sikhs they will not allow you to drink even a drop of water now is the time for a settlement i shall act as a mediator between the khalsa and you you may then rule your states without apprehension End of chapter fifteen the life of guru gobind singh section sixteen of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter sixteen it was now abundantly clear to the rajas that the guru would neither make peace nor surrender next morning they beat the drums of war and as they had anticipated large numbers of rangars and gujars under one jagatula flocked to their standard the allied armies then proceeded with banners flying to anandpur in the van rode kesari chand the haughty chief of jaswan bearing himself it was said like a mighty elephant 
the guru prepared for defence and briefly addressed his men o khalsa i am ever your companion and succourer if you die fighting you shall enjoy all the happiness reserved for martyrs and if you survive and gain the victory empire shall be yours the sikhs were further encouraged by the arrival of five hundred men of the manja under duni chand grandson of bhai salo a distinguished sikh who lived in the time of the fourth and fifth gurus reinforcements from other quarters also arrived at this conjuncture the names of the weapons served out by the guru to the sikhs are given with minute detail bows and arrows tege cutlasses katars small daggers jamdars two-edged dirks sarohis flexible swords songs pikes lances bhkuas daggers literary scorpions jambuas daggers scimitars selas spears pistols and muskets within anampur were two forts one called fatagar the other logar the guru ordered his men not to advance beyond the city but remain as much as possible on the defensive sher singh and nahar singh each commanding five hundred men were told off to guard logar the defence of fatagar was entrusted to ude singh who received from duni chand command of the reinforcements of the manja meanwhile the allied armies advanced and fell on anandpur like a flight of locusts ajit singh the guru's eldest son now grown up to manhood went to his father to offer him military service he was however too shy to speak in his father's presence and requested uday singh to speak for him the guru replied that it was the duty of all true sikhs to fight for their religion their country and a good cause and he was glad to see his son adopting their hereditary profession the guru conferred on him the command of a company of one hundred and advised him as he was still inexperienced in warfare to remain behind cover and await events Raja ajmer chand reminding his fellow chiefs that this was really the most important engagement with the guru advanced with his troops the hill chiefs opened fire with large guns on the guru's fortresses Raja kasari chand of jaswan with his troops attacked uday singh's outposts arrows and bullets discharged from both sides fell like rain in the indian months of sawan and badan the rangars and gujars who appear to have fought with much determination were now reduced to half their numbers and showed a disposition to retreat Raja ajmer chand went to jagatula their leader and remonstrated with him he called on him to avenge the sack and destruction by the sikhs of the rangars towns of nur and bajrur jagatula succeeded in rallying his men and they again began to fight with great valour uday singh on seeing this brought forth the guru's son and with a strong force led an attack on the enemy ajit singh displayed great heroism and address and the sikhs following his example chopped off the heads of the enemy as if they were watermelons the guru surveyed the battle from an eminence and continued to direct his arrows with fatal precision against the allied hosts several brave sikhs made a determined stand against the enemy and forced them to retreat on seeing this the allied chiefs held a brief council of war wherein it was decided to dispatch kesari chand to attack the right flank and jagatula the left flank of the guru's position while ajmer chand himself and his troops made a front attack on anandpur jagatula was soon shot in the chest by a bullet discharged from sahib singh's musket and fell lifeless to the earth man singh one of the bravest of the guru's sikhs arrived bearing the guru's standard and planted it on the spot as an indication to the enemy that the sikhs would not retreat a single pace or allow them to remove jaga tula's body raja guman chand now chief of kangra came and sought to uproot the guru's standard and hinder the sikhs from taking possession of the body of the fallen chief of the rangars upon this the allied armies rallied and then ensued terrific slaughter 
Guman Chand and his troops plied their arrows incessantly but failed to cause the Sikhs to retreat. The latter defended themselves until nightfall and retained possession of Jagatullah's body. The opposing armies then retired to their respective quarters for rest. The Guru complimented his son and Sahib Singh, the slayer of Jagatullah, on their successful valour. It is stated that the leaves of the sal tree were employed overnight to heal the injuries of the wounded. The hill chiefs were in great dismay at the result of the battle and held a council of war during the night. Raja Ajmer Chand apprehended from the resistance offered by the Sikhs to the removal of Jagatullah's body that it would be useless to prolong the contest. If they had the same ill fortune on the morrow, there would be little left of the hill armies. The Raja of Kangra professed himself ready to acquiesce in Raja Ajmer Chand's decision. The Raja of Mandi, too, was for peace and advised suing for the Guru's pardon, seeing that he occupied Guru Nanak's spiritual throne and there would be no indignity in appealing to him as suppliants the raja of handur however did not consider that any reason for effecting a reconciliation raja kasari chand of jaswan affected to despise the guru's power and promised to fight with more determination on the morrow and expel him from anandpur next morning when the hill armies proceeded to reinvest anandpur the sikhs offered valiant resistance the allied troops contented themselves with concentrating their attack on one particular part of the city the fighting continued with varying fortune until the afternoon when ajit singh prepared to renew the contest and requested his father to observe how he comported himself in it the guru counselled caution and forbade him to expose himself unnecessarily at the same time he sent thousands of sikhs to support him in what he declared was a war for the defence of their religion the allied armies rushed against them with the violence of a torrent issuing from the himalayas in the height of the rainy season whithersoever ajit singh discharged his arrows they were messengers of death when his horse was killed under him he fought on foot and inflicted great destruction on his opponents he communicated his martial enthusiasm to his sikh warriors with the result that the hill armies began to retreat raja kesari chand seeing this addressed them severe reproaches whereat they rallied and again began to ply their weapons at the same time the enemy now clearly saw that they could not overpower the brave sikhs but must trust to time and the starving of the garrison for the success of their enterprise the siege lasted for about two months with the usual incidents appertaining to that mode of warfare the sikhs at one time determined to remove the entrenchments of the enemy and put them all to the sword without firing a shot they accordingly made a night sortie in which several of the hill leaders were slain as the hill chiefs unsuccessfully prolonged the blockade raja kesari chand prepared to intoxicate an elephant and direct him against the city kesari chand compared the defences of the city to paper and sand which would fall to the ground at the touch of the elephant's trunk the raja of mandi again raised his voice in favour of peace and submission to superior force kesari chand however swore that if he did not take the fort by evening he was no true son of his parents all the future punishments attaching to great crimes against the hindu religion should be his if he failed in his enterprise he represented that in point of numbers the sikhs were not even as salt in the porridge of the hillmen when the guru heard of kesari chand's boasts he said that duni chand who had brought the reinforcement of manja troops was his elephant in comparison with whom kesari chand's elephant was as an ant duni chand however had no such confidence in his own strength and prowess and counselled peace with the hill chiefs he complained that the guru was violent and quarrelsome not mild and patient like his father he therefore advised the sikhs to fly from such a leader none of the guru's immediate followers would listen to such advice but duni chand succeeded in persuading the troops he had brought with him to promise to desert to dhir mal in kartarpur and adopt him as their guru 
the plan of escape proposed was to descend by scaling ladders when duni chand was in the act of descending his scaling ladder gave way and he fell heavily to the ground and broke his leg this interfered with his design of going to kartarpur to place himself and his troops under dhir mal's orders and he consequently thought it advisable to return to his own home in amritsar the next morning the guru after his devotions observed that no soldier of duni chand's contingent was present in reply to his inquiries his sikhs told him of the flight of duni chand and his followers during the night the guru calmly remarked he who hath run away through fear of death shall find death awaiting him at home the conduct of duni chand notwithstanding his efforts to conceal it became known in amritsar all the sikhs of that city were thus enabled to avoid intercourse with him and he became an object of social as well as religious detestation one night as he rose from his bed he was bitten by a cobra and died almost immediately his grandsons with his leading soldiers afterwards went to the guru to pray him to efface the stigma attached to the family a prayer which the guru graciously granted as proposed by raja kesari chand an elephant was intoxicated and prepared for the attack on anandpur all his body except the tip of his trunk was encased in steel a strong spear projected from his forehead for the purpose of assault thus arrayed and prepared for offence and defence he was directed towards the gate of the fort after him came the hill rajas with their armies they were overjoyed as they joined in the unwonted procession and made certain that on that very evening the fort would fall into their possession the guru asked vikatar singh one of the bravest and most powerful soldiers to become his elephant and he cheerfully consented the guru gave him a trusty lance and said as vikatar singh was prepared to resist the mad elephant so some sikh should now go to cut off kesari chand's head ude singh offered his services for the purpose and received the guru's blessing and a sword on this he dashed into kesari chand's ranks like a tiger into a herd of deer kesari chand's elephant was specially directed against the fort of logar on his way he killed some sikhs and so alarmed the sentries at the gate that they deserted their posts and fled within the city for protection vikatar singh found means of opening the gates and went forth to meet the furious animal he raised his lance and drove it through the elephant's head armour on this the animal turned round on the hill soldiers and killed several of them with the offensive weapons attached to his trunk some he trod under foot and others he impaled on his tusks so that he became a powerful ally of the sikhs the hillmen made great efforts to stop his career but in vain meanwhile ude singh continued to advance against kesari chand challenged him called him a great jackal and asked why he was fleeing from his fate ude singh vowed that he would take vengeance on him for all the sikhs slain kesari chand infuriated at his taunts discharged an arrow which lodged in ude singh's saddle-cloth ude singh on this dashed forward sword in hand and with one blow cut off kesari chand's head then posing the head on his spear he rode into the fort to exhibit it as a tangible proof of his victory upon this the sikhs rallied and cut off all the foot soldiers of the hill army within reach muhakam singh one of the guru's five beloved shore off the mad elephant's trunk with one blow of his sword the animal then hastened to the satluj to bring his pains and his unsuccessful career to an end by self-destruction what remained alive of the hill army now took to flight pursued by the bravest of the sikh warriors who slew them in numbers in this retreat the raja of handur was severely wounded by the brave sahib singh who thus added another to his long catalogue of triumphs on the moor the hill army rallied owing to the encouragement given it by guman chand the raja of kangra he disdained to retreat and called on ajmer chand to witness his prowess he said that death and life were the ordinary concomitants of warfare and bravely maintained that neither should be taken into consideration ajmer chand said thou art the pilot to take us across the sea of mourning 
we depend on thee to kill the guru and thus put an end to these protracted and unsatisfactory operations the raja of mandi for the third time counselled peace meantime the homes of the hill rajas resounded with female lamentation for their husbands slain kesari chand's ranis plucked out their hair for the loss of their brave spouse and heaped reproaches on ajmer chand as responsible for all this sanguinary and unavailing warfare on the following day guman chand directed the efforts of his troops against the city but the sikhs behind their embrasures and defences were fully prepared to withstand them the horse gu man chand rode was killed by a bullet from the musket of alim singh there was a sharp melee round gu man chand when he fell but his party succeeded in keeping the sikhs at bay and rescuing their chief the battle lasted with varying success until evening when guman chand as he was proceeding to his tent to take rest after the day's exertions was mortally wounded by a chance bullet all the hill chiefs now became disheartened and demoralized raja ajmer chand was the last to remain but he too left anandpur and marched home in the dead of night ajmer chand notwithstanding the disastrous defeat of the allied armies determined to allow no repose to the guru as early as possible he dispatched an envoy to wazir khan the emperor's viceroy in sarhind to complain that the guru would not suffer his majesty's unoffending subjects to abide in peace he prayed the viceroy to assist the hill chiefs in destroying the guru's power and expelling him from anandpur another envoy was dispatched to the viceroy at billy to make a similar complaint the two viceroys then made a joint representation to the emperor against the guru it happened that at that time some wandering mimes visited the emperor's camp he ordered them to imitate the sikhs and they accordingly did so though their performance was obviously a travesty the emperor could very clearly gather from it the love the sikhs bore one another in popular estimation and he concluded that they had become a formidable power which it would be expedient to crush the viceroy of dihli had enough to do to protect the capital during the emperor's absence in the distant dakhan so orders were issued to the viceroy of sarhind to proceed at once with his army to expel the guru from anandpur End of chapter 16section 17 of sikh religion volume 5 by max arthur macauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter 17 after the guru's victory over the hill chiefs his disciples rapidly increased and thousands of recruits were added to his army to enhance his style and dignity he ordered that his bodyguards should for the future be provided with arrows tipped with gold to the value of sixteen rupees each bai ram kaur came to visit the guru the guru's mother it is said had been expecting some holy man and was anxiously awaiting him the guru expressed the pleasure he felt to receive the representative of a family which ever since the days of baba nanak had been true and faithful to the guru and the sikh cause the guru baptized him and named him gurbaksh singh this man is principally remarkable for having it is said dictated to a scribe called sahib singh the work entitled sao saki some account of which has already been given one yoga singh came from peshwar to visit the guru and remained with him until the time for his marriage to a beautiful girl when he departed to his own country the guru unwilling to lose his companionship and wishing at the same time to make trial of his devotion sent a letter to be delivered him in the midst of the marriage ceremony it contained an order that whether yoga singh was standing or sitting sleeping or waking he should on receiving it at once return to the guru the messenger presented the letter when only two of the marriage circumambulations had been completed yoga singh at once stopped the marriage ceremony and forthwith proceeded to the guru 
on the way he plumed himself on his obedience and thus committed the sin of pride in further forgetfulness of the guru's teaching he on arriving at hashiapur thought he would visit a courtesan to drown in her company his regret for the interruption of his marriage whenever he presented himself to the woman a servant was found at her door to warn him away having waited until the early morning he at last bethought him that he was violating the commands of the guru and he consequently determined to proceed on his journey the guru smiled on seeing him when yoga singh told the sikhs the incidents of his journey they knew that he had been saved from sin by the miraculous interposition of the guru the guru about this time heard that a large imperial army was on its way to attack anandpur and assist the hill chiefs so he deemed it expedient to advance to meet them on open ground he accordingly went to nirmo a village over a mile distant from kiratpur raja ajmer chand and the raja of kangra said that now was their time to seize the guru he had no fort to protect him and no further means of withstanding them and it was not necessary to await the arrival of the imperial army both sides were prepared for battle the guru and his troops took up a post on an eminence and the hill chiefs also took up what seemed to them advantageous positions a fierce combat ensued in which the sikhs were ultimately victorious one afternoon as the guru sat in court the hill chiefs engaged a mohammedan gunner to kill him for adequate remuneration ajmer chand undertook in the event of the assassin's success to give him rupees five thousand and the proprietary rights of a village the other rajas too promised proportionate rewards the mohammedan assured them that all preparations for his design would be ready by the morrow next day as the guru sat in the same place he was warned by a sikh of the plot against his life and advised to take precautions the guru replied how long am i to remain in concealment whatsoever the creator hath decided shall take place during this conversation a cannon-ball from the enemy's camp took away the servant who was fanning him the guru took up his bow and arrow and shot the gunner while in the act of reloading with a second arrow the guru killed the mohammedan gunner's brother who also was serving the gun on seeing these two skilled artillerymen slain the hillmen took to flight the mohammedans were buried on the spot called siya tibi or black hill and a votive temple was erected by the sikhs to commemorate the guru's escape the army of wazir khan the viceroy of sarhind in due time proceeded against the guru the guru now found himself in a very dangerous position between the hill chiefs on the one hand and the imperial army on the other he resolved however to defend himself where he was and his sikhs resolved to stand faithfully and valiantly by him they discharged arrows with fatal effect on the imperial troops as they advanced so that corpse rolled over corpse wazir khan gave an order to his troops to make a sudden rush and seize the guru the guru was ably and successfully protected by his faithful son ajit singh and his other brave warriors they stayed the advance of the imperial troops and cut them down in rows as if they had lain down to sleep in their beds the carnage continued until night rendered it no longer possible for the adversaries to see one another after a council of war held during the night the crafty hill chiefs represented to wazir khan that the cause of enmity between the guru and themselves was that he had tried to forcibly convert them to his religion they also stated that the guru had offered to join them in making war on the emperor whom he proposed to kill and whose empire he promised to transfer to them continuing their falsehoods they further informed wazir khan that they had spurned all the guru's offers on account of their loyalty to the emperor 
next day the imperial army and the contingents of the hill chiefs made such a furious assault on the guru's forces that he felt obliged to give way for him to return to anandpur would have been injudicious under the circumstances and would only lead to its destruction so he decided on retiring to basali whose raja had frequently invited him to his capital then marched in the van ude singh alim singh daya singh and mahakam singh in command of two thousand men they were accompanied by the guru's son ajit singh sahib singh marched next with one thousand of the bravest of the sikhs the guru himself took command of the rear guard the guru's departure was the signal for an attack by the imperial army and a general melee ensued in which dust obscured the sky cries of kill him seize him allow not the guru to escape resounded wazir khan bit his thumb and said he had never before witnessed such desperate fighting though the sikhs were escaping they were destroying his army he urged the hill chiefs to support him but they were unable to render effectual help until the guru's army reached the satluj there was stubborn fighting in which the brave sahib singh was slain the guru then told his men to make a firm stand while his son ajit singh crossed over with the baggage the guru with his troops then crossed over taking with them sahib singh's body the hill chiefs were overjoyed at being as they thought delivered from the guru they made presents of elephants to wazir khan and departed to their homes the guru having succeeded in crossing the river proceeded to basali and took up his residence with its hospitable raja wazir khan did not avail himself of his opportunity to pursue the guru but returned to his viceroyalty of sarhind after resting himself and his troops in basali the guru amused himself with the chase as of yore he occasionally crossed over to the left bank of the satluj and made desultory attacks on ajmer chand's army one day during the chase the guru was met by an envoy of the raja of ba Baur. the raja followed close behind and pressed the guru to pay a visit to his capital the guru to the regret of the raja of basali accepted the invitation the raja of ba Baur had such faith in him and was so favourably impressed with the general repute of the excellence of his religion that he washed his feet and performed for him all the duties of hospitality the raja pressed him to remain with him for some time a request with which the guru complied a company of sikhs who had sought to make offerings to the guru represented to him that the rangars and gujars of kalmat had violently seized what they had intended for him they cried for justice in the name of the guru but the rangars and gujars heeded not their adjurations the guru found it necessary to punish these turbulent tribes who had never allowed him peace his troops disarmed them and captured and destroyed their fort the sikhs having now enjoyed sufficient rest began to feel time drag slowly their trusted leaders daya singh and uday singh represented to the guru that it was a disgrace to have evacuated anandpur the guru was not long in determining to return and ordered the drum to be beaten for the march the hill chiefs appear to have been unprepared for his return and offered no resistance the inhabitants of the city were delighted on seeing the guru again among them buildings were repaired and decorated and offerings of every description were made to the great spiritual and temporal leader it was one magnificent scene of rejoicing raja ajmer chand the guru's most persistent enemy finding him again firmly established in anandpur thought it expedient to sue for peace daya singh recommended the guru to return a favourable answer to ajmer chand's prayer the guru accordingly wrote to say he was willing to come to terms with ajmer chand but would punish him if he were again guilty of treachery ajmer chand was glad to have a promise of peace for a time even with the threat held out to him and he sent his family priest with presents and congratulations to the guru 
the other hill chiefs on hearing of ajmer chand's reconciliation with the guru followed his example and sent him tangible indications of their goodwill and friendly intentions End of chapter seventeen section eighteen of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter eighteen in a conversation regarding the fabulous bird called anal in hindi and huma in persian poetry some one remarked that arrows winged with the bird's feathers would reach a prodigious distance the guru remarked that as it was the peculiarity of the bird's feathers to carry arrows to its home in the sky so the repetition of one of the guru's hymns would take the soul to heaven he continued the guru who speaketh truth who serveth the congregation of saints and who hath confidence in the guru's hymns is my sikh and shall for ever abide in bliss several sikhs from the north of the punjab came to visit the guru and present their offerings a sikh residing in rotas in the present district of jalam thought that the most suitable offering he could make the guru was his daughter sahib devi he accordingly took her to him in a palki the guru in response to this offer said he had relinquished family life the girl's father on hearing this became much disappointed and distressed he pointed out that he had long since dedicated her to the guru that in consequence every one called her mother and now no one would wet her after her rejection on the other hand if she remained single great sin would in the estimation of pious persons attach to her parents he accordingly pressed the guru to reconsider his decision the guru then told him to ask her if she would consent to serve him she replied in the affirmative the guru upon this baptized her gave her the name sahib kaur and consigned her to his mother's apartments there she made a vow that she would not touch food until she had seen the guru the guru could not allow her to die of hunger and accordingly visited her one day as she was shampooing him he asked her if she had any request to make she replied that as her two co-wives had sons so she also desired a son to call her own the guru replied i will give thee a son who will abide for ever i will put the whole khalsa into thy lap the lady on hearing this was much pleased and prostrated herself before her master it is still not an uncommon thing for a sikh to say when asked regarding his parentage that his father is guru gobind singh and his mother sahib kaur such a sikh would also say that he was born in patna and resided in anandpur indeed sikhs are enjoined to give these answers at the time of baptism one jaga singh performed most deciduous service for the guru and was consequently much envied by his fellow-servants some said that several men had done similar service and gone away ungrateful and jaga singh was not superior to any of his predecessors others again said that he being a new servant was no doubt diligent but his zeal would soon evaporate the guru overhearing these remarks sent for a vessel of water a stone and some sweets he put the stone and sweets into the water after a short time he ordered them to be taken out the stone of course came out whole but the sweets had all dissolved the guru read his servants a moral lesson from what they had seen he said that those who served him well and heartily blended with him as the sweets had done with the water while those who served him for show and appearance had hearts like the stone which never dissolved he then ordered that no one should for the future molest or speak evil of his faithful servant jaga singh 
raja ajmer chand though outwardly professing peace determined to again expel the guru from anandpur he accordingly sent a brahman as an ambassador but really as a spy on the guru's proceedings the brahman on being introduced to the guru used very mild and plausible language the guru however soon discovered that he was a very dangerous person in no way to be trusted soft to the touch like a snake but filled with concealed poison the man duly set himself to the task of ferreting out the guru's secrets the guru well understood his designs but at the same time maintained a semblance of friendship towards him the brahman wrote to his master to describe the excellent and confidential relations that subsisted between him and the guru and at the same time suggested that some dexterous person should be sent to steal the guru's horses the brahman also kept his eye on the guru's treasury with the object of ascertaining how much it contained and how its contents could be abstracted in due time raja ajmer chand dispatched some of the most expert thieves he could find in his state and they succeeded in depriving the guru of two of his favourite chargers the brahman suggested to the guru to go to the approaching fair of rawalsar near mandi the other chiefs would attend and it would be a good opportunity of cementing friendly relations with them at the same time he told the guru's sikhs as an inducement that if they went there they should see stones swim the guru's mother his wives and his sons all pressed him to visit the fair he yielded to the wish of the majority and ordered all preparation to be made for his departure the brahman informed all the hill chiefs of the guru's intention to appear at the fair and suggested that they should be present also the guru prepared a magnificent reception for them and they were all charmed with his engaging manners the rajas entreated him to forget and forgive their former offences they were assured in reply that the guru would treat them as they deserved at his hands the guru received the wives of the rajas in a separate tent he gave them instructions suitable to their status and position and they were entranced with the interview the guru noticing their admiration told the eldest among them that it was time for their departure the ranis were it is said loath to move but the eldest lady convinced them of the propriety of terminating their visit one of them padmani daughter of the raja of chamba with her father's permission sent the guru a letter in the form of a riddle what is that which is complete what is its three-fourths what is duality what is departure what are the two houses for human beings they ate some and took the rest to sleep with them o oh, guru riddle me this the guru replied a god's body is complete a man's is only three quarters thereof people run after wealth men and women are but dust people wander in both worlds after eating and spending their wealth in this when the world is destroyed every one goeth to sleep this is the answer to thy riddle o child the princess was much pleased on receiving this answer and with her father's permission went again to visit the guru when she made her obeisance before him he patted her on the shoulder with his bow she said i am thy worshipper why hast thou not patted me with thy hand the guru replied he never touched any woman except his own wives with his hand as the guru was returning home from the fair he was met by the raja of mandi who besought him to pay a visit to his capital the guru readily accepted the invitation during his stay the guru promised the raja that mandi should for ever remain in his line 
while the guru was occupied with the hill chiefs the brahmans were counteracting his religious efforts sikhs who before their conversion had been brahmans and khatris now came in fewer numbers to visit him they did not wish that their sacrificial threads should be thrown away among the bushes or that they should have to part with their loin-clothes it was in vain the guru told them that sikhs should spring from every bush on which their sacrificial threads had been thrown he said that they who had no faith in him might or might not come as they chose the paltry fellows who wore threads the guru thought of no use to him his sikhs should become very powerful if they freed themselves from brahmanical prejudices and influences and adopted the sikh ritual when there were births marriages or deaths in their families the guru upon this prepared a general feast both for sikhs and brahmans but the latter refused to attend and reproached him with having taken away the distinguishing marks of the hindus when the sikhs were feasting he said that as the brahmans had forsaken him so he would forsake them and break off all relations with them to some of his own people who manifested symptoms of dissatisfaction he said that if they remained on good terms with the khalsa they should always be happy otherwise sorrow should be their portion he had given everything to the khalsa spiritual and temporal power enterprise glory self-devotion skill in arms and by these should they acquire empire his speech was heard by his first wife and when he went to his private apartments she inquired what he had left his family he replied that he had given to her children the stable empire of heaven his sikhs were one day discussing idolatry the guru when asked to give his opinion said all worship is valueless without love the worship of images is unreal the worship of god alone is real nothing can be obtained by image worship they who place images before them and worship them are fools let my sikhs ever meditate on the immortal god and worship none besides let them ever practise arms that they may be enabled to defend themselves against their enemies on another occasion the guru gave the following reply to questions put him by his sikhs he who ever thinketh of the future is accepted as the guru's disciple famine is bad and bad is cold bad is the love of a courtesan bad are debt and falsehood utter the truth my friends the guru further advised his sikhs not to employ an enemy as a doctor not to listen to astrologers to avoid greed and to consider wealth unreal as a dream winding up his discourse he said let my sikhs eschew evil adopt what is good and have confidence in me beshambar of ujjain had once fallen under the influence of the guru's teaching and made him an offering of one hundred rupees he now sent his son a vaishnav called har gopal with an offering of five times that amount the son on seeing the guru eat meat became disgusted the guru said in his presence that all relishes were pleasing to the mind a sikh replied that a relish was only pleasing to the tongue others also gave their opinions and when it came to har gopal's turn he said that the real relish was faith in sikhism the guru knowing that he was not uttering his real sentiments said thou enjoyest no such relish for thou hast no faith in the sikh religion when the guru addressed him further reproaches he fell at his feet and implored his pardon he then laid his father's present of five hundred rupees before the guru the guru in return gave him a steel bracelet to wear and promised that the love of god should abide in his family har gopal not at all satisfied or convinced by the guru's teaching or example took his departure on his way home he stopped at chamkaur where he met an earnest sikh named dayan singh he confided to him how he had wasted five hundred rupees in making a present to a guru who ate meat dayan singh said he would restore him the money 
if he in return gave him the steel bracelet and the love of god bestowed on him by the guru har gopal was delighted on receiving such an offer and took the money in exchange for what he believed to be the worthless gifts of the guru he traded with the money and made a large profit when he reached home he told his father bishambar all the events of the journey bishambar was much distressed at his want of faith in the guru and remonstrated with him har gopal continued his pecuniary speculations and in the end lost all his money he was then satisfied that this was the result of his want of faith in the guru and he prayed his father to take him again to the spiritual and temporal head of the sikhs the father was pleased to do so and set out with his wife and all his family on the way the party called on dhyan singh at chamkaur and induced him to accompany them on their journey bishambar on reaching the guru begged forgiveness for his unworthy son the guru baptized them all and thus addressed har gopal thou oughtest to have had confidence in my words he who believeth that the ten gurus are all the same is a sikh of mine look on the hymns of the granth as the embodiment of the true guru put faith in the guru and becoming a sikh perform thy worldly duties with humble words induct others into the faith and give thy daughter to a sikh let him who is a sikh according to the old rites marry his daughter to him who is a sikh according to the new rites if a sikh cannot find a husband according to the new rites for his daughter then let him give her to him who is a sikh according to the old rites but willing to receive sikh baptism let a sikh receive instruction from another sikh and not consider whether he is of high or low degree look on him as a good sikh who thinketh not of caste or lineage let a sikh be honest in his dealings and pray for him who affordeth him maintenance whoever of the rank of sikh committeth treachery shall find no place of rest love the name repeat it in thine innermost heart teach the name in the name is happiness the name is a generous companion he who liveth for his religion who eateth only to support his body who walketh in the guru's way and who is not enamoured of the world is my friend as when a traveller goeth to a foreign land and is ever hoping for the end of his journey so should man hope for his soul's final repose by doing good works and remaining estranged from the world listen to me my friend and be ever ready to leave this life thou and i shall depart this is not a new ordinance after this the father and son proceeded rejoicing to their home in the course of a short time their wealth increased and har gopal recovered all that he had lost dhyan singh told the guru that as he was ploughing in his field on the day after he had received the bracelet and god's love from har gopal his plough exposed a buried treasure of great value the guru congratulated him and called him a devout sikh who would always possess god's love and favour one day mata jito the guru's wife appeared before him and said thou bestowest on thy sikhs deliverance union with god and worldly blessings let me also be a partaker of thy gifts the guru told her to continually repeat waguru with fixed attention and she should obtain what her heart desired after some time she acquired by her devotion a knowledge of the future and went to the guru in great tribulation she said mercifully save thy children for i foresee thou art going to make them martyrs to thy cause the guru replied is it to reverse god's decree thou didst receive instruction from me i intended that thou shouldst abandon worldly love but it hath increased all the more i have already granted thy sons high rank in god's court wherefore anticipate not their fate jito understanding that the guru did not intend to save the lives of his children said she was going to abandon her body for she could not bear to behold their death the guru replied it is well thou mayest go thy children shall follow thee 
death is the law of all bodies some may perish four days before and some four days after but all must sooner or later pay the debt they owe upon this it is said jito permanently suspended her breath and her soul took flight to heaven one day the conversation turned on an expression used by guru har rai that the vessel which baba nanak had constructed for the salvation of the world had almost foundered guru gobind singh vowed that he would repair it for the deliverance of his sikhs on that occasion he gave the following instruction to his assembled sikhs i have established the khalsa for the advancement of true religion let not my sikhs live on religious offerings he who bound by greed obeyeth me not in this shall be born again as a hog religious offerings have the same dissolving effect on men's minds as borax on gold he then quoted the following lines from gur das as it is the custom of hindus to abstain from the flesh of kine as swine and interest are solemnly forbidden the mohammedans as it is sinful for a father-in-law to drink even water in his son-in-law's house as even a sweeper though hungry will not eat hare's flesh as a fly gaineth no advantage but dieth in the clasp of honey so is greed for sacred offerings which are like poison coated with sugar let those who are baptized according to my rites bear arms and live according to their means let them remain true to their sovereign in the battlefield and not turn their backs to the foe let them face and repel their enemies and they shall obtain both glory in this world and the hero's heaven in the next he who fleeth from the battlefield shall be dishonoured in this world and when he dieth shall be punished for his cowardice and nowhere shall he obtain a state of happiness let the members of the khalsa associate with one another and love one another irrespective of tribe or caste let them hearken to the guru's instruction and let their minds be thoroughly imbued with it it is said that as the guru was one day hunting he came on a field of tobacco he reined in his horse and gave expression to his hatred of the plant he maintained that it burned the chest induced nervousness palpitation bronchitis and other diseases and finally caused death he therefore counselled his sikhs to abstain from the destructive drug and thus concluded his discourse wine is bad bang destroyeth one generation but tobacco destroyeth all generations the custom of sale and barter of horses and other animals at religious fairs prevailed even in the time of the guru he went to a fair held in kirkitar on the occasion of a solar eclipse in order to purchase horses to replace those which had been stolen or killed in the previous warfare among other admirers madan nath a superior of yogis waited on him on seeing the guru he remarked that he had the external appearance of a lion but that he was inwardly a saint the guru explained that his external appearance had been assumed with the object of inspiring terror into the turks who had inflicted great misery and hardship on his country End of chapter eighteen section nineteen of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter nineteen two mohammedan generals syed beg and alif khan were on their way from lahore to dilly they were each in command of five thousand men raja ajmer chand having heard of them thought he would try to secure their assistance to attack the guru the generals on receiving a promise of one thousand rupees a day promised ajmer chand their assistance 
syed beg however on subsequently hearing favourable accounts of the guru and his sikhs changed his determination and withdrew from the muhammadan army the battle which ensued began with great fury between the gurus and alif khan's troops at a critical moment syed beg approached the sikhs and said that as they believed in the guru so did he and he would therefore fight on their side alif khan on seeing that syed beg had joined the sikhs concluded that he had no chance of victory and retired from the contest he was hotly pursued by the sikhs and syed beg on the return of the latter from the pursuit he alighted from his horse and went to offer his obeisance to the guru having broken with the emperor whose servant he had been he threw in his lot with the sikhs gave them all his wealth to assist them in their struggles with the muhammadans and remained with the guru as a trusty and powerful ally a brahman appeared one day in the guru's court and with a loud voice invoked his assistance against some pathans who had forcibly abducted his bride at basi near hashiarpur the guru directed his son ajit singh to go with one hundred horse fall suddenly on the parthans at night and restore the brahman his bride the expedition was carefully planned and courageously executed in the early morning ajit singh produced before the guru the brahman's bride and the offending pathans the latter received condign punishment raja ajmer chand again summoned his allies with the object of chastising the guru there came to him raja bup chand raja wazir singh and raja dev saran raja ajmer chan made a speech in which he warned his brother chiefs of the fate in store for them from the guru and advised them to join him in another expedition to crush him they all expressed themselves in favour of immediate measures and addressed the guru a joint letter to the effect that they had lived peaceably for some time but found he would not cease his aggression and they were therefore obliged to declare war against him the guru briefly replied my sikhs have only come into collision with those who wantonly annoyed them the khalsa are ever awaiting battle to fight and die is the duty of the brave come and see the power of the khalsa the hill chiefs on receiving this reply took the field without delay it is said that they marched against anandpur with ten thousand men syed beg had not been able to induce his large force to remain with him so the guru's available force at this time did not exceed eight hundred men in the former battles of anandpur the sikhs appear to have remained behind their battlements and embrasures on this occasion different tactics were adopted they met the enemy in the open field outside anandpur the sikhs fought with their usual courage and determination raja ajmer chand on witnessing their prowess and the carnage they caused retired from the battle in despair the other hill chiefs continued the fight but put themselves in the rear of their troops alim singh and ude singh displayed their usual valour on behalf of the guru they wished to charge the hill hosts but the guru restrained them and ordered them to use their muskets and arrows from where they stood they obeyed the guru and plied their offensive weapons with signal success the hill troops on seeing their own van stricken down retreated the guru surveyed the battle from a distance he was delighted as he saw the enemy fleeing in every direction the sikhs now flushed with victory forgot his orders and pursued the retreating hill troops 
the guru was displeased at the temerity of his men and mounting his horse rode back to anandpur the sikh force on finding the guru had left them lost heart retreated and were in turn pursued by the enemy on their return to anandpur they tried to obtain the guru's forgiveness but he refused to speak to them at last yielding to the entreaties of narang singh one of his foremost warriors he resolved to receive and pardon them he said the guru was the khalsa and the khalsa the guru and the old friendly and affectionate relations were renewed he then ordered his troops to return to the field and oppose the enemy he took up his own bow and effected the usual destruction in the hostile ranks this was the signal for the sikhs to second his efforts and fall on the hill army like tigers on deer then ensued fearful carnage upon which the hill troops again took flight their leaders tried to restrain them but in vain the battle was at an end and both sides departed to their homes raja ajmer chand however was not satisfied he proposed to his brother chiefs that they should again make war on the guru this time with the assistance of the imperial troops they accordingly sent an envoy to aurangzeb and prayed him to protect them against guru gobind singh they represented that they were ancient subjects of his majesty and would give him large tribute as the price of his assistance and protection meantime there were great rejoicings in the guru's camp and the wounded were carefully attended to bir singh madan singh a rajput chief and sham singh visited the guru sham singh pointed out to him that the muhammadans and hindus were very numerous and how could the sikhs who were so few contend against them much less hope to obtain empire the guru replied what god willeth shall take place when the army of the turks cometh my sikhs shall strike steel on steel the khalsa shall then awake and know the play of battle amid the clash of arms the khalsa shall be partners in present and future bliss tranquillity meditation virtue and divine knowledge then shall the english come and joined by the khalsa rule as well in the east as in the west the holy baba nanak shall bestow all wealth on them the english shall possess great power and by force of arms take possession of many principalities the combined armies of the english and sikhs shall be very powerful as long as they rule with united councils the empire of the english shall vastly increase and they shall in every way attain prosperity wherever they take their armies they shall conquer and bestow thrones on those who assist them then in every house shall be wealth in every house happiness in every house rejoicing in every house religion in every house learning and in every house a woman the english shall rule for a long time at the conclusion of the guru's apocalypse the sikhs respectfully bowed the guru was asked to describe the state of the baptized sikhs whereupon he gave alim singh as an example he was the guru said originally a brahman but on adopting the religion of arms he now shineth like indar he ever worshippeth the sword he never accepteth gifts or invitations to feasts i took away his sacrificial thread because if he retained it he would still be a brahman and subject to brahmanical superstitions 
the guru continued to instruct his sikhs he who weareth long hair without receiving baptism is a hypocritical and foolish sikh i will not show myself to him it is best to adopt one religion and not distract one's mind with others they who call themselves my sikhs and stray to other creeds are sinners let no sikh associate with much less offer presents to those who worship sarwar guga and similar peers or with the misguided men who by order of their wives visit male and female brahmans to have their fortunes told he who giveth alms to brahmans who slandereth the guru and his sikhs shall lay up for himself suffering put away from among you the hypocritical brahman who though he receive my baptism removeth his hair in the fashion of the hindus let not any sikh of mine worship hindu or mohammedan cemeteries in places of cremation or give alms to one who weareth a religious garb for ostentation i have forsworn such a person if any there be and let him who stupidly worshippeth false gods forswear me he who feedeth the traveller who giveth alms on the occasion of the guru's anniversaries and who hath faith in the guru shall hereafter go to the guru's abode let not my sikhs look at brahmans who reside at places of pilgrimage or at those who don religious garbs and strut foppishly let my sikhs abide apart and be ever full of thoughts of god he who giveth his daughter in marriage to a sikh and taketh no money for her is a sikh of mine and shall after his death reach mine abode let sikh men and women sit together and hold divine discourse let them worship god themselves and teach their children to do so my sikhs may receive a voluntary offering for reading the granth or for copying it but must not demand remuneration let the sikh priest who receiveth an offering of money feed the poor before he feedeth himself let not my sikhs be covetous they who disobey this order shall receive punishment from god i love neither religious garbs nor castes men's observance of the sikh tenets is dear to me but still dearer is their observance with sincerity let my sikh love not the world but pass his time as if he were to die to-day or to-morrow let him be ever true to his sovereign let him cherish his neighbour and seek after righteousness let him eat and worship at fixed times let him shake off sloth and sing the guru's hymns hear me o sikhs practise not selfishness assist men whether of high or low degree but contract not friendship with the evil false is he who maketh promises without intention of fulfilment let him who calleth himself a true sikh of mine accept baptism and do good acts so shall his previous sins all depart on his seeking the guru's protection let him renounce the service of demons and sprites and not worship stones or false gods the hypocrites who stop their noses under pretence of meditation and count their beads are very impure why do the fools into whose hearts god's love entereth not wander to places of pilgrimage on another occasion his sikhs requested the guru to give them further instruction that would aid them in their temporal affairs and ensure their deliverance from transmigration at that moment the guru was engaged in other affairs and he delegated daya singh to deliver the necessary instruction daya singh thus spoke act as follows and you shall be happy clothe and feed the sikhs as far as your means allow shampoo them 
and bathe them wash their clothes fan them when they perspire wipe their shoes wash their feet scour the dishes from which they have eaten draw them cool water from the well and cook their food with the utmost attention and cleanliness let them perform night and day these and other similar offices for the sikhs commit to memory the guru's hymns and repeat the true name on seeing any person involved in trouble take compassion on him and remove his sufferings to the best of your ability the exercise of mercy and compassion is very meritorious he who practiseth these virtues becometh the greatest of the great and the primal supreme being will be merciful unto him speak the truth this bringeth great comfort renounce falsehood which bringeth great misery in its train on seeing another's happiness be not envious thereof why attach sin to yourselves for no sufficient reason in the first place your jealousy will cause you annoyance and you shall gain nothing therefrom and in the second place god will be angry with you and say it is i who gave and yet this man is burning with envy there are also other evils attendant on this passion abandon covetousness practise contentment covet not another's wife another's wealth or another's children if you do you shall assuredly suffer my friends practise not oppression on those whom you know to be weaker than yourselves be not proud of the possession of learning beauty great intellect untold wealth or similar fleeting advantages above all deem the bountiful creator one alone if he who doeth good acts practise pride they shall be as futile as the bathing of an elephant indulge not in praise of yourselves or dispraise of others if you do it will be a great sin if ever you make a gift boast not of it but rather strive to conceal it speak civilly and satisfy everybody use not harsh language and annoy no one obtain wealth by honest means and share your meals with strangers wear not dirty clothes so shall your bodies be ever clean associate not with thieves adulterers highway robbers gamblers ingrates thugs deceivers or men of bad livelihood remember the sinner is worse than the sin for he is the cause thereof when you see an evil man avoid him at once like red-hot iron which cannot be held in the hand associate with the good for in such association vice is put to shame listen to the history of the lives of the gurus afterwards where there is discourse of god listen to it with rapt attention bathe in holy amritsar behold god's temple where the guru's words are ever repeated sit down therein respectfully and allow your minds to think of nothing but god ever look with devotion on where his light is resplendent whether you go there on the occasion of the guru's anniversaries or visit the place every six months or once a year if you live at a distance if he who deemeth himself a sikh behold not amritsar why did he take birth in the world unprofitable was his advent and he shall afterwards regret his negligence the guru kept fifty-two bards permanently in his employ and others occasionally visited him they wrote on all the nine subjects which in the opinion of orientals are suitable themes for poetry but the composition of eulogies on the guru occupied most of their attention the guru once had the curiosity to weigh their compositions they amounted to about two and a half hundred weight the guru included them in a compilation which he called vidyadhar 
he so valued the book that he ever kept it by him even when he went into battle but it was lost in one of his engagements some of the bard's compositions are preserved in the suraj parkash where they may be perused by the curious end of chapter nineteen section twenty of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Life of Guru Gobind Singh, Chapter Twenty. Owing to the repeated representations of the hill chiefs, the emperor sent a large army under Syed Khan to reduce the Guru to submission. The Guru received intelligence that the imperial army had arrived in Thanissar and would soon reach Anandpur on hearing this he mustered his troops and found they were only five hundred strong the rest of his army had dispersed to their homes nothing now remained for the guru but to make the best defence he could with his present force in a few days syed khan's troops appeared in sight singing a war hymn to stimulate their spirits maiman khan a faithful mussulman who had attached himself to the guru said that he was indebted to him for many favours and asked permission to show his prowess the guru gave him a bow and told him he would do well to kill even his own co-religionists on account of their misdeeds the brave and faithful syed beg also came forward to continue his services to the guru both mussulmans went like tigers into the battle and were followed by the sikhs the latter represented to the guru that it was futile to contend with such a large army as had now appeared the guru in reply encouraged them and they advanced boldly against the enemy the early part of the battle was signalized by a fierce single-handed combat between a hill chief and syed beg after they had repeatedly missed each other syed beg at last struck off the hill chief's head on seeing this din beg of the imperial army rushed at syed beg for whom he cherished a double hatred as the slayer of the hill chief and as a deserter from his sovereign and mortally wounded him syed beg died praising the guru then ensued a general engagement of both armies the sikhs performed prodigies of valour and the mussulmans are said to have fallen to the earth like minarets toppling from their heights maiman khan charged on horseback in every direction and committed great havoc among the imperial troops an unexpected circumstance now occurred syed khan the general of the imperial troops had long been a secret friend of the guru and when he heard that an expedition was to be sent against him contrived to be put in command of it so that he might at last be able to behold the great priest of the sikhs and do him signal service the guru knew what was passing in syed khan's mind and advanced ostensibly to challenge him saying if thou attack me not i will not attack thee syed khan on obtaining the wish of his heart to behold the guru said that he was the guru's servant and slave and that he would never fight against him the guru replied i am a poor man it is only rich men who have slaves to conquer in war is ever held honourable syed khan dismounted and fell at the guru's feet the guru conferred on him the true name and the supreme reward of salvation syed khan however did not actively assist the sikhs but turned aside from the battle as he was unable to restrain his troops or divert their energies to the guru's assistance they made a fierce onslaught on the guru's soldiers who began to retire overpowered as they were by a multitudinous host but at a critical moment the sikh war cry was raised upon which the sikhs rallied and presented a bold front to the enemy after syed khan's defection from the imperial cause ramzan khan took 
command and fought with great bravery against the sikhs the guru seeing this let fly an arrow at him which killed his horse the guru on closely observing the combat saw that there was no chance of retrieving his position so he decided to evacuate anandpur the muhammadans then captured the city and plundered the guru's property on obtaining this booty they proceeded in the direction of sarhind some sikhs not yet satisfied with warfare asked the guru's permission to pursue them the guru replied that as his sikhs were subservient to him so was he subservient to god he repeated on the occasion the third slok of the asa ki war by this he meant that it was god's will that he should be defeated and as all creation feared god so did he himself at all times the sikhs feeling their defeat again pressed their request the guru at last yielded and allowed them to pursue their enemies the latter were unprepared for attack and fell into great confusion on finding themselves pursued by the very men whom they already thought they had vanquished the turks who turned to oppose the sikhs were killed and only those who took to flight escaped the vengeance of the guru's pursuing army in addition to killing and dispersing the muhammadans the sikhs deprived them of all the booty they had captured at anandpur the remnant of the muhammadan army finally made their way to sarhind on this the guru returned and took possession of anandpur the emperor called on his fugitive troops to account for their cowardice they pleaded that they had been waylaid by the sikhs and taken at an unfair advantage this excuse seems to have been accepted for the emperor then turned their conversation in another direction and asked what sort of person the guru was and what forces he possessed a muhammadan soldier gave highly coloured accounts of the guru's beauty sanctity and prowess he was he said a young handsome man a living saint the father of his people and in war equal to one hundred thousand men the emperor was much displeased on hearing this panegyric of the guru and ordered that the panegyrist should be excommunicated the court quasi advised that the guru should be brought to the emperor's presence by some stratagem accordingly the emperor sent him the following message there is only one emperor thy religion and mine are the same come to see me by all means otherwise i shall be angry and go to thee if thou come thou shalt be treated as holy men are treated by monarchs i have obtained this sovereignty from god be well advised and thwart not my wishes to this the guru replied my brother the sovereign who hath made the emperor hath sent me into the world to do justice he hath commissioned thee also to do justice but thou hast forgotten his mandate and practisest hypocrisy wherefore how can i be on good terms with thee who pursuest the hindus with blind hatred thou recognizest not that the people belong to god and not to the emperor and yet thou seekest to destroy their religion when dispatching this reply to the emperor the guru conferred a robe of honour on his envoy the sikhs of the malwa and manja districts now thronged to the guru in great numbers and began to study the science of war under his tutelage raja ajmer chand was distressed on seeing the power and glory of the sikhs daily increase and prevailed on the other hill chiefs to join him in another mission to the emperor to make further complaints against the guru the emperor was at that time in the south of india and thither the raja proceeded in person to lay the petition of the allied chiefs before him it described the foundation of anandpur by guru teg bahadur whom the emperor had executed and the martial and troublesome proclivities of his son the present guru gobind singh it then proceeded to give the raja's own version of the guru's proceedings and how he had asked them to embrace his new religion and join them in waging war against the emperor 
aurangzeb fearing that the guru would become too powerful and also displeased at the state of unrest that prevailed in the panjab ordered all available troops under the viceroys of dihli sarhind and lahore to be dispatched against the guru the hill chiefs who complained should also assist in repressing the common enemy at the conclusion of the campaign the guru was to be captured and brought before the emperor it would appear from an interview which raja ajmer chand subsequently had with the dihli viceroy that the latter in view of the safety of the capital of the empire was not at the time in a position to dispatch any troops against the sikhs the guru was informed by a faithful sikh of the result of raja ajmer chand's mission to the emperor he harangued his troops on the duty of religious warfare against the muhammadans and on this subject he had much to say from the time of the persecution of guru arjan up to the present the emperors had seen open or covert foes of the gurus and their sikhs the guru affirmed that death on the battlefield was equal to the fruit of many years devotion and ensured honour and glory in the next world the time for the diwali fair was now approaching sikhs came in large numbers to make offerings the guru issued orders to absent sikhs to come with their arms and assist him the guru's orders were generally obeyed and warlike preparations began at anandpur the hill chiefs who arrayed themselves against the guru were ajmer chand of bilaspur guman chand of kangra bir singh of jaspal and the rajas of kulu kianthal mandi jammu nurpur chamba gular sringar bijarwal darali and dadwal they were joined by the rangars and the gujars and all formed a large and formidable host the imperial army however amounted to double their number wazir khan who had been put in supreme command by the emperor mustered his troops at sarhind for parade and inspection some faithful sikhs ever kept the guru informed of the movements of his enemies he read in darbar the last letter of information he had received and vowed to destroy his enemies and put an end to the sovereignty of the mughals the sikhs were delighted at the prospect of battle and congratulated themselves on their good fortune in being allowed to die for their guru and their faith several of them put on saffron coloured clothes in token of rejoicing and said we have only four days to live in this world why should we not endeavour to obtain the exalted dignity of martyrdom which will ensure salvation every variety of warlike weapon was served out to the guru's followers and no one was left unarmed the guru took the precaution of laying in supplies for the maintenance of the garrison in the event of a siege he addressed his troops consider the hill chiefs as well as the muhammadans your enemies fight bravely and they shall all flee away the guru then repeated the following quatrain of his own composition blessed is his life in this world who repeateth god's name with his mouth and meditateth war in his heart the body is fleeting and shall not abide for ever man embarking in the ship of fame shall cross the ocean of the world make this body a house of resignation light thine understanding as a lamp take the broom of divine knowledge into thy hand and sweep away the filth of timidity the chronicler judiciously remarks that the khalsa ought to be congratulated because though few in number they had confidence in themselves to fight for their religion and delighted by anticipation in the approaching conflict End of chapter twenty section twenty one of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter twenty one wazir khan's troops advanced from sarhind like a surging sea 
drums sounded and banners flew at the head of every regiment in similar formidable array came the troops of zabardas khan the viceroy of lahore the two viceroys joined their forces at ropar there they were met by the troops of the allied hindu rajas and all proceeded against the guru to anandpur the guru on seeing the enemy approach in a body ordered his artillerymen to light their fuses and discharge their cannon into the hostile army where thickest when fire was opened the enemy made a charge to seize the artillery but were quickly restrained by the fatal accuracy with which the guru's men served their guns meanwhile the sikh cavalry advanced and discharged their muskets at close quarters they were well supported by the infantry who manned the embrasures the allied army had no protection and consequently fell in heaps before the city the battle continued with terrific violence the sun was obscured by the smoke from the guru's garrison guns heroes were all stained with blood and cries of strike strike kill kill everywhere resounded riders lost control over their horses which fled in every direction and the battlefield presented a truly ghastly spectacle the guru sent for his two brave generals ude singh and daya singh encouraged them and gave them renewed orders the two chiefs courageously advanced with their troops and cut down the enemy as reapers a cornfield dust flew into the eyes of their opponents and rendered them powerless for action they had no power to withstand the forces now ranged on the guru's side and consequently fell in large numbers the two viceroys were astonished at the unwanted destruction of their armies they rallied their men but again the same evil fate attended them at last it was resolved to storm the fortress the mohammedan troops were told that the guru was only a fakir that he had no power to offer long resistance and must soon capitulate the carnage began anew many brave mohammedans were dispatched to wed the soul delighting nymphs of paradise the contest continued with the greatest obstinacy and horse and foot for the space of three hours were mingled in indiscriminate slaughter the mohammedans hazarded different opinions as to the cause of the success of their enemies some said that the guru was a miracle worker and that supernatural forces fought on his side others maintained that the guru's success was owing to the fact that his men were protected behind their ramparts while such conversation was being held the viceroys asked the hill chiefs to show them how they were to obtain victory if the same ill success attended them to the end the sikhs would never allow them to escape the hill chiefs suggested that they should then cease fighting and next day bring cannon to batter down the fort it is true the hill chief said the guru's army is a low rabble but very brave on a muster being taken it was found that nine hundred of the mohammedan troops lay dead on the field of battle after the first day's engagement next day the guru mounted his charger and put himself at the head of his troops the viceroys observed a warrior mounted on a sable steed with a gold embroidered saddle he carried a bow painted green and his crest set with jewels glittered on his turban they inquired of raja ajmer chand who it was and he answered that it was the guru every effort was now made to destroy him but the first fire of the enemy was aimed too high and took no effect 
the mohammedan gunners were then ordered to fire low and promised large rewards if they killed the guru they were equally unsuccessful when they fired low the allied armies finding their guns useless resolved to charge the guru and his sikhs the guru seeing this began to discharge his arrows with marvellous effect the fearful carnage of the preceding day was again renewed horses fell on horses and men on men the hindus and the mohammedans entered on mutual recriminations each sect blaming the other for its ill success upon this they combined and made a further effort to conquer but were so vigorously and successfully repulsed that they were obliged to suspend hostilities for that day also the viceroys and the hill chiefs took counsel at night and resolved on the morrow to encompass the city and cut off all external supplies so that the guru and his troops might be starved into submission while they were thus discussing they apprehended a night attack from the sikhs and accordingly kept vigil next morning a watch before day the guru and his sikhs were found at their devotions when divine service was finished the guru ordered his men to remain behind their embrasures and barricades and not be tempted to advance or come to close quarters with the enemy meantime the mohammedans and hindus contented themselves with watching the city gates and hindering all ingress or egress at the same time they remained at a safe distance from the missiles of the sikhs the allied forces made another assault on anandpur they espied the guru at a distance and again ordered their artillerymen to direct their cannon towards him the sikhs were much disconcerted by the enemy's fire and requested the guru to take up a less exposed position the guru replied that he wore the armour of the immortal god and consequently no weapon could harm him god was his protector and had stretched forth his hand to save him from all assaults of his enemies while the guru was thus speaking cannon-balls from the enemy hurtled in the air they were again aimed high and missed the sikhs when the artillerymen were ordered to lower the muzzles of their guns their fire fell short of the sikhs and struck the base of the eminence on which the city stood the allied armies discharged their cannon hundreds of times but whether they fired high or low their missiles failed to have the desired effect thus the day passed until night terminated the conflict on the morrow skirmishes were renewed on both sides and the sikhs inflicted severe chastisement on the enemy the guru called his son ajit singh and told him to hold that part of the city called gesgar and not venture forth he gave him further orders to kill any one who approached to remain on the alert at night and to keep his guns loaded the guru directed nahar singh and sher singh to hold the fort called logar for this purpose five hundred men were placed at their disposal alim singh with another detachment of five hundred men was ordered to hold the fort of agampur ude singh also received command of five hundred men to defend another part of the city daya singh was ordered to guard the northern ramparts the mohammedans and the hill chiefs had now completely invested the city and the guru's supplies were failing the enemy noticed that the singhs on guard went twice a day from their embrasures to pray and do homage to their guru the guru in turn kept an eye on the proceedings of the allied armies one day he saw the generals playing indian drafts raja ajmer chand and others were watching the game 
the guru taking up his bow discharged an arrow into their midst but without striking any one they examined the arrow and knew by its golden point that it had been discharged by the guru they admitted that only a miracle could have sent it such a distance the guru knew by his occult power what they were saying and wrote them the following letter o oh, viceroy that was not a miracle miracle is a name for the wrath of god i was merely practising archery the brave men who have obtained skill in it conceal not their accomplishments everything is in god's hands whether he desireth to make what is difficult easy or what is easy difficult the guru attached this letter to an arrow and then discharged it it lodged in a branch of a tree under which the allied generals were seated on perusing the guru's letter they were astonished that he could have divined what they were saying and it is said that they admitted his supernatural power and prayed to heaven to preserve them from his too unerring shafts and his unsurpassed knowledge of warfare on one occasion it was observed that the enemy had come very close to the city and far away from their defences sher singh accordingly suggested to nahar singh that it would be expedient to make a night attack and thus take them unawares when they should of necessity become an easy prey if the sikhs waited until morning the enemy would be far away and it would be impossible to reach them the night was dark and favoured the enterprise nahar singh did not at first approve of the suggestion but subsequently altered his mind the sikh troops were awakened at dead of night and arms served out to them having performed their ablutions they sallied forth two hours before daybreak sher singh commanded them to make one charge and then return they did great havoc among the mohammedans killing them in numbers and succeeded in returning to anandpur by daybreak the enemy on being aroused could not see whence destruction had overtaken them and began to turn their arms against one another father attacked son and son attacked father and with mutual reproaches there resulted internecine slaughter the mohammedan generals were greatly distressed on learning what had occurred they blamed ajmer chand for the disaster and asked how he could again show his face to the emperor he had told the emperor that the sikhs were very few and now whence had so many men sprung forth on a sudden the mohammedan generals threatened to leave ajmer chand and his people to the mercy of the sikhs but ajmer chand and Bup chand offered them large presents and thus prevailed on them to renew the conflict next day the allied forces advanced to take the citadel by storm the sikhs on seeing this put their two great guns called bagan tigris and by jai Naj, sound of victory in position the guns were then charged the fuses lighted and aim taken at the enemy where most thickly massed together the tents and standards of the mohammedans were first blown away their two generals on seeing this retreated as the guns committed further destruction both the mohammedan and the hill armies took to flight that evening the guru offered thanksgiving beat the drum of victory and put his cannon into a place of shelter the guru was informed that a man called kanaya used with absolute impartiality to draw water both for his sikhs and the enemy the guru asked him if it was so and he replied in the affirmative he quoted the guru's own instruction that one should look on all men with an equal eye the guru mused on his reply and dismissed him with the compliment that he was a holy man his followers called suwapanthis 
formed an orthodox and honourable subsect of sikhs who live by honest labour and accept no alms or offerings of any description the suapanthis are also called adanshahis from adanshah a rich banker who devoted his wealth and his leisure to the propagation of their doctrines when provisions were running short the sikhs made several night sorties and took supplies from the enemy's camp on such occasions they were often attacked but they generally contrived to return with scant loss when any one of their party was cut down they took his body and carried it into anandpur in one of these sorties a sikh fainted the muhammadans seized him cut off his hair made him eat their food and repeat their creed and finally circumcised him they then strange to say allowed him to escape probably because they thought they had accomplished a sufficiently pious work in forcibly converting him he informed the guru of what had happened to him and prayed to be received again into the sikh fold the guru inquired if he had cohabited with a muhammadan woman he replied in the negative the guru then ordered him to prepare sacred food and distribute it among the sikhs and his reconversion should be complete the guru explained that a sikh who was forcibly converted to islam was still a sikh but that a sikh who became a muhammadan from motives of sensuality should forfeit his happiness here and hereafter several of the inhabitants now deserted anandpur on account of the difficulty of maintaining themselves provisions became excessively dear a pound of flour selling for a rupee the guru's troops however remained to endure hunger and every form of hardship they had already decided to sacrifice their lives for him and they could not leave him in this extremity complaints were made to his mother by some of the malcontents but she only ventured to speak to him when her own private servants rebelled against their fate she said thy sikhs who were foremost in the fight are now dying of hunger and the enemy are at thy gates each of thy soldiers hath now but a quarter of a pound of corn daily how can men fight on such a pittance their patience is exhausted the guru replied having obtained the order of the immortal god my object is to increase and not diminish the numbers of my religion it is by enduring hunger and hardships my sikhs become strong and brave one day there was an alarm that the hillmen were advancing in force the guru having caused his great drum to be sounded proceeded to the spot whither the assault was directed bullets and arrows poured from both sides and the sikhs being now reduced in numbers had to retreat the turks and hillmen inflicted great damage on them as they did so and took from them a large quantity of booty the sikhs struggled but their efforts were ineffectual against overpowering numbers ude singh and others went to the guru and told him that the sikhs were defeated and their property plundered at this critical moment all his troops prayed to the guru for protection the guru said they ought to feel no pleasure in the possession of wealth which was not permanent and no sorrow at its departure until now the beleaguered garrison had been supplied with water from a hill stream this was discovered by raja ajmer chand and he cut off the supply when the guru was informed of this he said that satluj would for the future supply him with water and the enemy should gain no advantage from the stream they had diverted the guru promised that water should come in time and the name of the stream should be the himaiti nala or stream 
of assistance end of chapter twenty one section twenty two of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter twenty two as the siege was protracted the hardships of the troops and of the other inmates of anandpur painfully increased rations were now reduced to less than a quarter of a pound of corn daily and sometimes none at all were served out the sikhs occasionally made foraging expeditions at night and fought hard for small booty when this was exhausted they ground the bark of trees and converted it into bread they also lived on leaves and whatever fruit and flowers they could collect it is related that with notwithstanding their terrible sufferings they never lost heart or relaxed in the defence of their city the enemy heard of the sikhs forays and appointed several scouts to watch their operations one night as the sikhs sallied forth they were observed and information promptly given to the allied army no action however was taken until the sikhs on their return approached the city they were then attacked by both hindus and mohammedans in great numbers the sikhs threw down their bundles and determined not to die like jackals as long as there is breath in our bodies they said let us wield our swords and place ourselves beyond the fear of transmigration although they were faint with hunger yet each of them killed two or three of the enemy finally overpowered by superior numbers and unable to receive assistance from within the city they all perished fighting to the last the rajas now formed a plan to induce the guru again to leave anandpur they promised that in the event of his doing so their armies would withdraw and the guru might afterwards return whenever he pleased the guru heeded not this proposal it was repeated several times but the guru still refused to accept it the sikhs never heard of these overtures until one day in darbar raja ajmer chand's envoy produced his master's letter raja ajmer chand stated that it contained no deception but it was honestly intended it would he said be well if the guru and his troops evacuated the city as early as possible they might take all their property with them the sikhs who heard this proposal went to the guru's mother to urge it on her and she promised to use her influence with him she said my son this is a propitious offer take us with thee and leave anandpur i am thy mother and i ask thee to obey me and seek shelter elsewhere thus shalt thou restore life to thy starving sikhs my son fighting were perhaps well if we had wherewithal to maintain ourselves but now we are involved in poverty and hardships of every description if thou let the opportunity pass it will not return again the hillmen and the turks are prepared to swear that they will grant us safe conduct so it is well that we should depart moreover khwaja mardad hath now arrived from the emperor with a message that he hath vowed to capture thee or die in the effort all the rajas are on his side wherefore my son let us withdraw from anandpur there is nothing more precious or dearer than life the guru replied mother dear the hillmen are idolaters and false their intellect is like that of the stones they worship there is no reliance to be placed on their promises the turks are equally evil their very falsehood will destroy them all the khalsa shall extend and wreak vengeance on its enemies the guru was unable to convince his mother or his sikhs of the wisdom of the course he was following he then hit on a plan by which they should be convinced that the overtures made to him had been treacherously intended the guru sent for raja ajmer chand's brahman envoy and told him he would evacuate anandpur if the allied armies would first allow the removal of his property he asked for pack bullocks for the purpose 
these with the necessary sacks were readily supplied him the hindus swore on the salagram and the mohammedans on the koran that they would not deceive him or molest his servants departing with his property the guru then ordered his treasurer to collect all the old shoes worn-out clothes bones of dead animals broken utensils horse dung and similar offal that could be found in the anandpur bazaar and load the sacks therewith on each sack was to be placed a piece of brocade to make it appear that the contents were valuable to the bullock's horns were attached torches so that the excellence of the cloth with which the sacks were covered and also the departure of the bullocks might not escape the observation of the enemy it was arranged that the bullocks with their loads were to start in the dead of night naturally the brilliancy of the procession did not escape the enemy's notice and they rejoiced like a parched field on receiving rain six thousand of them were in ambush to plunder the supposed property of the guru the sikhs on discovering this discharged their cannon and caused great destruction among the serried ranks of the hindus and mohammedans the sacks were however all seized by the enemy and carefully guarded until morning as it was then too late to examine their contents it was only on the morrow the enemy discovered the guru's stratagem and painfully realized the fact that they had committed perjury for the sake of the sweepings of the anandpur market-place the guru availed himself of the incident to demonstrate his own forethought and the treachery of the enemy he told his troops that everything they had endured had been by the will of god and he quoted guru nanak happiness is a disease the remedy for which is unhappiness at last came an autograph letter from the emperor to the guru i have sworn on the koran not to harm thee if i do may i not find a place in god's court hereafter cease warfare and come to me if thou desire not to come hither then go whithersoever thou pleasest the emperor's envoy added on his own account o guru all who go to the emperor's court praise thee on that account the emperor feeleth certain that an interview with thee will add to his happiness he has sworn by muhammad and called god to witness that he will not harm thee the hill rajas have also sworn by the cow and called their idols to witness that they will allow thee safe conduct bear not in mind anything that hath occurred the attack on thine oxen was not prompted by any raja the attackers have been generally punished and the ringleaders are in prison no one now o true guru dareth do thee harm wherefore evacuate the fort at any rate for the present and come with me to the emperor thou mayest afterwards do what thou pleasest the guru on hearing this said you are all liars and therefore all your empire and your glory shall depart you all took oaths before this and then perjured yourselves your troops whose business it was to fight have become robbers and therefore you shall all be damned the sikhs went again to the guru's mother to complain of his refusal to listen to reason upon this she told him that if he did not leave anandpur he would be deserted by his sikhs and even by his family and he would be then left alone to the mercy of the hostile armies some sikhs also made a direct representation to him and pleaded that through hunger they were unable to endure any longer the fatigue of the siege and the brunt of war and if they were now in their weak and emaciated condition to make an effort to force their way through the enemy's ranks they would all be inevitably massacred they therefore advised capitulation the guru on hearing these representations said to his sikhs my brethren they who leave the garrison now will all be killed and i do not desire to be held responsible wherefore give me a statement in writing that you have totally renounced me and then you may act as you please but if on the other hand you wish to abide by my advice i will support you and the immortal god will extend his protecting arm over us all adopt whatever 
alternative you please on hearing this the sikhs and the guru's mother hesitated her son was dear to her but so was her own life she resolved however that she would not separate from him the sikhs too felt that having vowed never to leave the guru they could not abandon him or make a formal declaration that he was not their guru and they were not his sikhs when the turks and the rajas heard from the imperial envoy of the failure of his negotiations they decided to send the guru's mother an embassy with a request that she and her grandchildren should abandon the fort this was in the hope that when the guru found himself alone he would follow them the envoy first proceeded to the guru and endeavoured to persuade him to evacuate the guru replied that he could not rely on any promise made by the idolatrous rajas or the hypocritical mohammedans he then expatiated on the villainies and inherent turpitude of aurangzeb a man who had no regard for an oath and whose god was money as was apparent from his persecution of the king of golconda against whom his operations were now directed the envoy seeing there was no hope from the guru then proceeded to the guru's mother and employed all his arguments to convince her that it was expedient for the guru and his sikhs to leave anampur o lady save thyself and all thy family what will it avail thee to remain here and if thou depart what harm will it do thee the guru's sikhs are everywhere ready to receive thee and whithersoever thou decidest to go thou mayest abide in happiness this city will still be thy property but leave it now and end the quarrel hundreds of thousands are waiting to behold thee explain matters to thy son and persuade him to obey thee if not then prepare to go thyself and he will follow thee of his own accord if thou listen not to this advice great sufferings will result the guru's mother promised to use all her efforts to persuade her son and said she would place confidence in the oaths of the turks and the hill rajas the sikhs sore stricken with hunger supported the envoy's representation o true guru knowing us to be thine own grant us the gift of life if thou agree not to this let us retire to some forest where the turks cannot reach us here shut up in this fort many have died and many more will die no food can come to us from outside and we have now been fighting for a long time o great king how can we who are famished with hunger continue to do battle accept our advice oblige us not to renounce thee and expel us not from thy faith if thou adhere to thine own resolve we must part company for life is dear to every one and what will a dying man not do nay we pray thee to assist thy sect and save our lives the guru replied my brethren waver not i only desire your welfare you know not that these people are deceivers and design to do us evil if you hold out a little longer as you have done you shall have food to your heart's content i ask you to wait only three weeks when the sikhs refused to wait so long the guru asked them to wait at least for five days and the great god would send them succour the sikhs refused to wait even a single day and said it was impossible for them to do so in their dire distress the guru repeated his request and said that the enemy would then retire and they should all be happy if his sikhs were to leave now they would inevitably be killed as a child continued the guru on seeing fire trieth to grasp it while his parents restrain him so o oh dear khalsa you are rushing to your destruction while i am endeavouring to save you the sikhs replied o oh great king we cannot be in a worse plight outside the city than we are within we shall all die of hunger here and if we sally forth we may escape and kill some of the enemy we cannot remain with thee an instant longer 
these arguments were recommended for adoption by the guru's mother my son be not obstinate it is best to leave the fort and save thy people the turks and the rajas will give thee solemn oaths of safe conduct and what more can they do now is the time my son thou shalt not again have this opportunity if the enemy come and take the fort by storm what wilt thou do thy sikhs are dying of hunger and they will all soon be dead the guru replied o oh, mother dear thou knowest not the turks and the hill rajas i have already shown thee their deceit but yet thou art not satisfied thou desirest to save thy family but how will the enemy allow you all to pass thou thinkest what is good is evil and what is evil is good the guru then turning to the sikhs said my brethren they who desire to go may now renounce me and depart on hearing this the guru's mother was greatly distressed and rose and sat apart to give vent to her grief the sikhs went and sat around her the guru's wives then came forth and joined the sorrowing group the guru's mother wiping away her tears broke silence the guru deemeth it not proper to leave the fort o holy guru nanak dispel my sorrow assist us now and give my son right understanding that he may protect his people i have given him much advice but he heedeth it not even if the sikhs renounce him and depart he telleth them they shall all be killed what he saith is never uttered in vain and of this i have abundant proof yet if we remain in the nanpur the enemy will soon come and put us all to death the sikhs began to reflect we have spent all our lives in the guru's service how can we leave him now it is he who assisteth us both here and hereafter he asketh us to remain with him for five days more what will happen in five days we shall only lose our lives in vain we will certainly go forth it is better to fight and die than to starve we will not formally renounce the guru were we to do so we should incur great obloquy and the seed of sikhism would perish after much reflection and hesitation however the sikhs changed their minds and said it is better for us to break with him and write a document to the effect that he is no more our guru and we are no more his sikhs if we again meet him alive we shall induce him to pardon us the allied armies too hearing that the guru's mother was in favour of evacuating the fort lost no time in their negotiations they called a sayid or reputed descendant of ali the prophet's son-in-law and a brahman both of whom were to swear on behalf of the allied armies solemn oaths of safe conduct for the guru should he evacuate anandpur the likeness of a cow was made in flour a salagram and a knife were placed in front of it and these articles were sent to the guru with a letter to the effect that whoever meditated evil against him should be deemed a cow killer or the worst form of assassin all the hindu chiefs put their seals to this letter the syed took the emperor's letter and the koran on his head and accompanied by several mohammedan officers proceeded to the guru the guru refused to listen to them they then went to mata gujari and repeated their representations they asked her to leave anandpur in which case her son would assuredly follow she was however unable to prevail on him gulab rai and sham singh sham das grandsons of shiraj mal addressed the guru and advised him to obey his mother the guru still proved obdurate upon this his mother prepared to depart with her two youngest grandsons jajjar singh and fatah singh on seeing the guru's mother take her departure the sikhs began to waver in their allegiance to the guru paper pens and ink were produced for those who wished to write letters of renunciation and in the end only forty sikhs decided to remain with their religious chief and share his fortunes the guru told them that they too might desert him they refused and said that if they did so the service they had already performed for him would prove unavailing they would either remain within the fort or force their way out as the guru directed the guru then knew that the seed of his religion would germinate and flourish he kept the deeds of renunciation and also took from the envoys the documents they had brought he then dismissed them and requested to be left alone 
when the guru found himself alone he set fire to his tents and other inflammable articles what was non-inflammable he buried in the earth he now finally determined to leave anandpur and gave orders to his men that they were all to march at night and during the darkness proceed to the east as far as their strength would allow them when the guru's mother wives and two youngest children had set out the guru went to visit his father's shrine and entrusted it to one gurbaksh a holy udasi telling him that he should never suffer distress as long as he remained its custodian when the guru was ready to depart daya singh and ude singh walked in front of him the second batch of baptized sikhs on his left muhakam singh and sahib singh on his right his sons ajit singh and zorawar singh followed with bows and arrows then came by himat singh carrying ammunition and matchlocks gulab rai sham singh and other friends and relations of the guru accompanied him the rest of the guru's servants and camp followers about five hundred in all brought up the rear End of chapter twenty two section twenty three of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain the life of guru gobind singh chapter twenty three the guru marched by kiratpur and thence to nirmo while at nirmo he gave gulab rai and sham singh a letter to the raja of sir maur which contained a request that he would give them a village to abide in from nirmo the guru and his party proceeded to ropar when the allied troops attacked the rear guard under ajit singh ude singh asked and obtained permission to relieve him the enemy surrounded and killed the dauntless ude singh the hero of many a desperate battle the bravest of the guru's brave warriors believing that he was the guru himself the guru sat down on the margin of a stream called sarsa to await the issue of the conflict when ajit singh delayed coming the guru sent jawan singh to fetch him jawan singh was killed in the endeavour before arriving at ropar the guru met his mother and two youngest children and exhorted them to proceed quickly on their journey a sikh who resided in dihli also met the guru on the way and asked if he could perform any service for him the guru said that he might take his family to dihli the sikh said he had a relation in ropar who would keep the guru's family there for the present the guru's mother met a brahman a native of kheri near sarhind and discharged cook of the guru who offered to entertain her party and she decided to take her grandsons with her and accept his shelter and protection her daughters-in-law remained at ropar for the night and next day set out for dihli under the trusty sikh's protection the allied forces continued to harass the guru's retreat he left some of his men at ropar to arrest their progress and went himself with thirty-five chosen sikhs toward chamkaur on the way at a place called baru majara he received information that a fresh contingent of the imperial army was close at hand to capture him in no wise dismayed he continued his journey towards chamkaur on arriving near that town he took refuge in a garden and was joined by five of the sikhs he had left at ropar all the others had been slain the guru sent to a jat agriculturist to ask him for a place of rest the jat tried to put him off with excuses but the guru placed him under arrest for the moment he then took the jat's house and turned it into a miniature fort where he took shelter with his men the allied forces could find no trace of him and were much distressed at his disappearance but the troops marching from dihli discovered the guru's residence and proceeded thither the united forces now concentrated their attack on the guru and were joined by his ancient enemies the rangars and gujars the guru then addressed his men you would not listen to my advice to remain in anandpur 
when you took your departure you did not calculate that this time of peril would ever arrive you trusted to the oaths of mohammedans on the koran and of the hillmen on their gods and cows and this is the result there is no opportunity now of employing the traditional means of dealing with enemies we can only defend ourselves there are hundreds of thousands against us die not the death of jackals but fight bravely as you have hitherto done and avenge the deceit practised by those great sinners the more you strive the greater shall be your reward if you fall fighting you shall meet me as martyrs in heaven if you conquer you shall obtain sovereignty and in either case your lot shall be envied by mortals having thus addressed his sikhs the guru appointed eight men to guard each of the four walls of his extemporized fort katha singh and madan singh held the door he himself his two sons daya singh and sant singh the top story alim singh and man singh were appointed sentinels thus was made up the number of forty who accompanied the guru five sikhs went forth to contend with the enemy after fighting with great bravery they were killed then kazan singh dan singh and dayan singh went forth and after killing several of the enemy were killed themselves the brave mahakam singh following the example of his fellows went forth and fell pierced by scores of bullets while the guru was lauding muhakam singh's valour and saying that he should be emancipated himat singh who was one of the first sikhs baptized asked permission to go forth to repel the enemy when he was slain the second batch of five sikhs baptized by the guru went forth and sold their lives dearly ishar singh and deva singh were the next to contend with the mohammedans while these were alive and fought the enemy thought they were endowed with supernatural power daya singh and others prayed the guru to escape by some means and leave them to contend with the enemy if the guru were saved the seed of religion would remain six more of the guru's warriors muhar singh kirat singh anand singh lal singh kisar singh and amalak singh asked permission to go forth and try their strength with the turks the six brave warriors were all killed nahar khan one of the recently arrived imperial officers attempted to scale the little fort but was shot down by the guru gairat khan another officer of the new army then advanced and was also slain by the guru after this none of the mohammedan officers had the courage to attempt the fatal ascent they formed a plan however to rush and seize the guru in this they utterly failed for the guru shot them down in numbers and held at bay the multitudinous mohammedan host the guru's son ajit singh now asked permission to go forth and fight single-handed with the enemy he said he was the guru's sikh and son and it was incumbent on him to fight even under desperate circumstances the guru approved of this proposal ajit singh took with him five heroes namely alam singh jawahir singh dayan singh sukha singh and bir singh ajit singh performed prodigies of valour and mohammedans fell before him as shrubs before the wind his companions all fought bravely and desperately zabardas khan the lahore viceroy was greatly distressed on seeing so many of his men slain and called on his army to at once destroy the handful of sikhs who were causing such havoc in the imperial ranks when the swords of the sikhs were broken and their arrows spent they spitted the enemy with their spears ajit singh broke his spear on a mohammedan the enemy then made a fresh attack and fatally wounded him defenceless as he was he realized however that he had acted as befitted his race he fell and slept the sleep of peace on his gory bed the guru on his death said o god it is thou who sentest him and he hath died fighting for his faith the trust thou gavest hath been restored to thee the five sikhs who accompanied him were also slain zorawar singh the guru's second son on seeing his brother's fate could not restrain himself and asked his father's permission to go forth and fight as ajit singh had done and avenge his death the youth took five more sikhs with him and proceeded to commit havoc among the enemy the chronicler states that zorawar singh made his way through the mohammedan army as a crocodile through a stream 
the enemy dropped like rain in the month of sawan and badon until zorawar singh and his five companions fell overpowered by numbers his remaining sikhs seeing that all hope was at an end again advised the guru to effect his escape he agreed seated near him daya singh dharm singh man singh sangat singh and sant singh who alone remained of the army and proceeded to entrust the guruship to them he said i shall ever be among five sikhs wherever there are five sikhs of mine assembled they shall be priests of all priests wherever there is a sinner five sikhs can give him baptism and absolution great is the glory of five sikhs and whatever they do shall not be in vain they who give food and clothing to five sikhs shall obtain from them the fulfilment of their desires saying this the guru circumambulated them three times laid his plume and crest in front of them offered them his arms and cried out shri wa guru ji ka khalsa shri wa guru ji ki fata sant singh and sagat singh offered to remain in the fort while daya singh dharm singh and man singh determined to accompany the guru the guru gave his plume to sant singh clothed him in his armour and seated him in the upper room which he was about to vacate the guru and his three companions escaped during the night he told them if perchance they separated from him they were to go in the direction of a certain star which he indicated when the guru was escaping he bade his men stand firm he said he was going to awaken the enemy so that they might not say he had absconded the turkish sentries were immediately on the alert he discharged two arrows at them the arrows at first struck torches which they held in their hands and then passed through their bodies in the darkness which followed the extinction of the lamps the guru and his companions escaped but did not travel together he proceeded barefooted on his journey and on becoming tired sat down to rest on the margin of a lake in the machiwara forest between ropar and ludhiana sant singh and sangat singh who were left behind in the little fort inflicted great loss on the enemy the mohammedans however succeeded in scaling the building and believed they were going at last to capture the guru whose plume and arrow sant singh wore khwaja mardud gave orders that sant singh and sangat singh should be beheaded and their heads sent to regale the emperor's eyes the mohammedans were much disappointed to subsequently learn that sant singh was not the guru and that the guru had escaped they sent men to the known abodes of all fakirs in the country to search for him but in vain after this the armies dispersed zabardast khan who was wounded in the recent battle retired to his viceroyalty of lahore wazir khan departed for sarhind and khwaja mardud went with the remnant of his army to reinforce the emperor who was still campaigning in the south of india the guru's three sikhs followed the star he had pointed out to them and they all four met at the place now called bir guru in the machiwara forest his sikhs found him sleeping with a water-pot for his pillow they awakened him and told him that the mohammedan army would probably be on them by daybreak the guru said he could not save himself as his feet were blistered he told the sikhs that they might seek shelter in a neighbouring garden man singh took the guru on his back and proceeded thither the guru found there a sikh called gulaba who treated him and his faithful attendants with kindness and hospitality gulaba gave the guru shelter in a top story which he had recently built to his house the guru wanted meat the next day and a he goat was provided for him which he killed by shooting gulaba was alarmed lest some of the neighbouring brahmins and sayids might have heard the report of the gun as a matter of fact one brahmin did hear it and suspected the presence of the guru in the village he looked and saw the guru on the top story of gulaba's house it turned out however that the brahmin was friendly he had previously visited the guru in anandpur and enjoyed his hospitality he now in return put some sweets and a sacrificial thread of the hindus on a plate and sent them as an offering to the guru the offering of the sacrificial thread was a delicate hint to the guru that the brahmin would like to lead him back to the ancient religion of india the guru returned the sweets and the thread with a present of five gold muhars from himself gulaba consulted with his brother as to the disposal of the guru 
they feared for their own safety should it be further known that he was among them to the lava's house now came two mohammedans ghani khan and nabi khan who had previously known and visited the guru on hearing that the imperial troops were scouring the country in quest of him they determined to go and offer him their humble services the guru requested them to remain with him and they readily consented gulaba and his family spent an anxious night in the early morning he waited on the guru with a present of five gold mahars which he meant as a parting offering he represented the danger he had incurred in entertaining his guest and begged him to take compassion on him and arrange for his departure it happened that while the guru was in gulaba's house a sikh woman also came to visit him she had previously seen him and vowed that she would spin and weave cloth for him which she would keep until his arrival in her village the guru had the cloth dyed blue and a robe and sheet made from it in imitation of the dress of a mohammedan pilgrim he then departed from gulaba's village he was borne on a litter which ghani khan and nabi khan lifted in front and man singh and dharm singh in rear while daya singh waved a chari over him they informed all inquirers that they were escorting uch kapir the expression uch kapir meant either high priest as a general religious title or priest of uch a well-known mohammedan city in the southern part of the punjab the guru and his carriers on arriving at lal in the patiala state accidentally came on a detachment of the imperial army which had been searching for him the general suspected that the pilgrim was no other than the guru and determined to make trial of him by what he ate a sumptuous dinner was prepared for the party the guru told his sikhs that they might eat what the mussulman cooks had prepared and they did so after touching the food with their swords a friendly sayyid from nurpur near machiwara who was at the time an officer in the detachment stated that the guru was really uch kapir upon this the general gave an order for the guru's immediate release End of chapter twenty three